In Secula Seculorum Chapter 1 A Nice Night for Murder My lords, let us sport together a while, for the moon welcomes and the stars are out. The wine is at hand, and I do think me tis a nice night for murder. Amlaric Almond All In Act 1, Scene 2 of the play Nine Lords Errant by Narel Main Candle, playwright of Ath Catla, first performed in the year of the Blazing Hand. Part of me wants to be back here, smelling the harbor reek, Mert growled, and part of me doesn't want to set foot in water deep again, ever. The flickering glow of the gate that had brought them here was fading behind them but was still bright enough to show the fat and wheezing man the side of Elminster's face. The old sage was nodding in agreement. Going home is seldom as satisfying as one hopes, I've found, he said in his dryly half-whimsical, half-mournful voice. And it grows no easier as the centuries pass, and I do it more and more often. I dwelt in the deep for a time. Long, long ago. Before my time, Merck added, before Elminster could. Indeed. Yet it seems we are just in time for once. Look yonder. Merck didn't need the old archwizard's pointing forefinger to spot what had caught his friend's attention. He was already looking across the moonlit garden at his home. Perhaps former home for El had told him the lords of the city had given it over to Laryl Silverhand, and despite it not being theirs to gift to anyone, he somehow doubted she'd want to share the best bedchamber with the weather-beaten likes of him, and finding it as unchanged as if he'd last left it only hours back instead of more than a century ago. Except, that is for the tasteful addition of the six men in tight-fitting mottled gray leathers, complete with masks and hoods who'd just broken in. Assassins, he growled. What has the deep come to whilst I was slumbering? What sort of dolts are lords of the city now to let teams of frasted near-uniformed assassins operate freely inside the city walls? Why, in my time, Elminster growled teasingly, assassins knew their place, and it was well outside the city of splendors in lesser, meaner cities. Well, it was, Mert snapped, lurching forward. Come on, El. With my luck, they'll have orders to play at being arsonists, too. He led the way along the winding garden path, feeling to make sure his iron guard ring was on his finger. Assassins always were in such a harassed hurry to throw knives and darts and other sharp and nasty things at anyone who saw them, and the moonlight was just strong enough to make a brightly lit stage of the few strides of moss lawn between the garden plantings and the doors the hooded slayers had just picked, or unlocked to silently pass through. Moreover, he wheezed so heavily these days that he couldn't even stand quietly, let alone move about in anything approaching silence. Though as he stumbled out onto the moss, Elminster touched his elbow, and all the faint night sounds of the city went away. Cloaked in utter silence, they approached the nearest door. El stepped deftly around Mert, drew it open, and stepped inside, extending one arm like a bar to stop the old moneylender from passing him. Stepping out of the silence, Mert guessed. A moment later, El took firm hold of his elbow and drew him to one side, into the lee of a life-sized black stone statue of a heroically proportioned dancing lady Mert had purchased in Calumshan long ago because he admired her pose and utter lack of modesty. They stood behind her and her tall plinth as still as two watchful statues, while Mert's eyesight adjusted to the deeper darkness, and he realized they'd relocated themselves just in time. One of the six assassins had just thought to look back and make sure no guards or anyone else was moving to block their escape route. His gaze went right past them to the door, 
and then swept across the large open room ere returning to what was holding his five comrades wrapped, not to mention Mert himself. Floating in midair at about head level for a man taller than Mert was a sleeping woman, spread-eagled and horizontal and oblivious to all intruders. Her silver hair, the tresses long enough to reach to her ankles if she'd been standing upright, was spread out around her in a lazily restless cloud, almost a sphere of moving silver strands. And she glowed. Not brightly, but brighter than the moonlight here in this large and dark garden view room. It was Lairol Silverhand, and she wore only a light gown, a nightgown. Her bare feet were toward Mert and Elminster as she floated on her back, her tresses drifting around her. And if the assassins made any noise as they unclipped already cocked hand crossbows from Baldrick's, fitted quarrels to them, and fired at her, Elminster's conjured silence swallowed it. Mert's shout of warning came out as silence, but even as he barked it, those quarrels were slowing in midair, coming to a halt as Laryl's hair drifted and swirled unconcerned around them. Only one of the assassins was foolish enough to snatch out a dagger and throw it to try to do what his slender poisoned quarrel had failed to manage. Even as it turned end over end with increasing lassitude, to glide to a halt in midair, five of the hooded slayers had launched themselves into running charges, their own knives, blades painted black to avoid any flashes or gleams of reflected light, held firmly in their hands hastening to kill. Yet a running man, no matter how strong, swift, and agile, can make little headway if snatched off his feet and ensnared by hair as swift as a striking snake and as strong as a swooping dragon, hair that could strangle and suffocate with ease, but instead merely pinions and snaring wrists and ankles and tugging so powerfully that the five owners of those captured limbs were bent over backward in midair, curled up into helpless arcs like bent and straining longbows. The sixth assassin, the one who'd vainly thrown his dagger, hadn't joined in the charge, but he sprinted now. After pivoting on one foot with his first stride, so he hurled himself not at the floating woman, but back at the door he'd come in by. And it was Mert himself who had the great satisfaction of thrusting out one stout and rising leg at just the right moment to trip the running slayer into a face-first meeting with the door frame. Whereupon Mert sat on the man's nearest arm, hard and had the satisfaction of feeling a wrist and an elbow crunch under his considerable weight. He could hear nothing. Even the man's agonized shriek was utterly soundless. Until Lairol came upright in the air, smiling wryly, and snapped her fingers. Elminster's silence was gone in an instant, but by then the man under Mert was merely groaning. Mert felt him all over for weapons and plucked out everything he found and tossed it well away. After all, every last pointed or edged thing on an assassin's body might be poisoned. He glared at the man's hands, seeking sharpened fingernails, but thankfully that seemed a nasty little tactic forgotten in the century he'd been elsewhere, by this particular band of assassins at least. Well met. Lairol said dryly. You rushed to my rescue? How touching, yet hardly necessary. I was in reverie, not asleep. None of Mistra's daughters ever need to sleep. Reverie, Mert grunted. Communing with the weave, if you prefer, replenishing energies and spells and monitoring the defensive magic of the house. A good network, Mert. You must have hired the best so as to watch these dolts attempt their stealthy invasion. I did not expect ye'd need any assistance in besting them, El murmured. But maybe I can be of aid steadying ye as ye defy Mistress' recent commandment. Ah, uh, well, as to that, you may be right, Lerol agreed. Commandment? 
Mert asked, but the two chosen merely shook their heads and said nothing. The air around one ensnared and feebly struggling assassin started to glow, as if a window had opened to somehow spill moonlight into just that part of the room, and Laryl frowned, her eyes flaring blue-white for a brief moment. And then her face grew pained. She started to tremble, and there was suddenly a heavy dew of sweat all over her face. And then she sighed and looked down, the light died, and the trapped assassin went limp. Did you? He merely sleeps, El replied, moving to take hold of the slayer's body as Laryl's tresses withdrew from him and tug off some of the man's garments to bind his wrists behind his back and to his throat. I heard no incantation, Mert muttered as he knelt to help. Weave work, not spells, El replied, his attention on Laryl. She gasped in pain this time, and the Sage of Shadowdale came to his feet in a frowning instant, but she waved him away as the second assassin slumped to the floor and was released, and a glow kindled around a third. Even Mert could tell she was struggling by the time she finished with that man. She was breathing as heavily as he did these days after climbing a ladder or steep stairs, and she moved restlessly in the air, buying time before she called on the weave to assault the mind of the next man. She was shaking violently by the time she lowered him to the floor, shuddering and spasming, doubling over with her face twisted in pain. Mert shot Elminster a questioning look, but the old archwizard merely looked grave and turned casually to look back at the doors behind them to see if any other intruders were in sight. Laryl was writhing on the floor by the time she finished with her would-be slayers, twisting and groaning and drenched with sweat, her nightgown plastered to her. Mert had seen people fished out of the harbor who'd looked drier. L took her hand, but as far as Mert could tell, he was offering the reassurance of a friend to someone wounded or dying, not pouring any sort of healing magic into her. Can we do anything for her? Mert asked, almost exasperated. Change the mind of a goddess, Elminster murmured, if you've nothing else to do for the next century or so. At that moment, Laryl let out a long, shuddering sigh under him and went limp. Mert leaned forward anxiously, but she'd relaxed, not lapsed into insensibility. Well, the old archwizard asked her, as calmly as if she'd just finished examining an everyday and rather boring ledger entry. I could learn nothing from them. They're hired meat who've been disminded by priests of power. All that's left in their memories, aside from endless echoes of Waterdeep so they recall its layout, is mental images of me, defiled at the palace plans of this house, and that they were to come here and slay me. Laryl tried to rise then, but her strength gave way. El caught her head before it struck the floor, and then put his arms around her and gently lifted her to a sitting position. They're far from the first, she added calmly, patting his hand in thanks. Fresh gown, he asked. In a breath or two, Laryl told him. Just let me bide here. I'm still... I know, El murmured comfortingly. Well, I don't, Mert snapped. What just happened to you? El cast a swift look at the bound assassins all around them, as if to reassure himself that they were all still unconscious, and said quietly, These days we chosen touch the minds of others with magic only when the need is dire. Doing so ruins most minds, so Mistra has absolutely forbidden us from invading the minds of anyone who can wield the art. I kept going after the first man. Laryl put in, to try to learn all I could, and because there was no damage I could do, these mines were already ruined. In their greed, they traded a pile of coins for their selves, 
their memories, and everything that made them who they were. Mert frowned. Is that why the war wizards in Cormir don't cheerfully mind-ream everyone standing nearby these days? Elminster nodded. Really thorough and prolonged attempts to read minds with the art have always been risky for the prober and the owner of the mind. If ye aren't very careful, you do harm, Laryl offered, like a know-nothing warrior with a knife trying to help a wounded friend on the battlefield. The likelihood of ruining the mind you're trying to explore, particularly if it's awake and hostile, has soared over this last century, El said grimly. Laryl nodded. So if you can't call on the weave to steady you and provide some of the energy, ruination is now almost certain. And it has always tired and harmed the wizard trying to mind-read, El added. So Mistra made it hurt so dearly that a mage using spells without weave aid will collapse before they learn much of anything. We Chosen can keep going, so she forbade us to probe wizards and strongly cautioned us against mind-reading anyone else, adding the pain to keep us to that. Ah, said Mert, so as wizards are now rarer and more precious than ever, you're not to be driving any of them insane. More insane, Laryl joked, and promptly winced and clutched her head in fresh pain. We can still do it, but, Elminster began, You're all weaker now, aren't you? Mert asked, not hurling spells around like you once did, being less bold to challenge or take up fights. He let his words trail away as he saw the same bland expression settle across the faces of both Elminster and the Lady Silverhand, a look that he'd once long ago termed the did you say something, not that I'm listening or ever intend to answer you, expression? Not that it's any of my business, he added into the deepening silence. Then he asked brightly, How about that fresh gown? You haven't moved the robing rooms, have you? Ah, uh, such a diplomat, most senior lord of Waterdeep, Laryl replied with a smile the nearest left side, any of the three hanging there. Only three, he joked as he groaned his own way to his feet. Are you sure you're a woman? A witty diplomat, too, she replied serenely. And then she looked past Mert and her face changed. He whirled around. Elminster had already turned and taken two steps toward the door he and Mert had come in by. Someone had just knocked on it, and then tried it without waiting for a response and was now stepping through it. Even in the deepest, darkest Kelvin declaiming moments of her dream, Vajra had known she would end up here. It wasn't her favorite room in the tower. That would be the room up above she'd just left in her restlessness. Unable to sleep, again, though the night was yet young. The bedchamber with its round bed and its domed ceiling adorned with all the stars of Toral winking down at her was her preferred room. The bed that felt so empty when she lay in it all alone. But she was never going to bring any rough docker inside the walls of Blackstaff Tower, and they were the only men she both wanted and dared taste these days on the rare nights when the loneliness raged and she sought the docks in spell-spun disguise. Yet this lower room, the one she was in now, it was the room she felt the most at home in, and in which she did the most work. The round room was dominated by a central tabletop that displayed a magnificent building-by-building -building map of the city of Waterdeep. Her city now, for she was more bound to it than even its hidden lords, or the open lord in the palace. Even if that open lord was no longer the arrogant Neverember of Neverwinter, but rather the woman who'd called this tower home for so many years, 
Lerol of the Chosen, with her silver hair stirring about her shoulders and the little leaping silver flames in her eyes as she stared at you. Stared through you, leaving you feeling unworthy, weak, a charlatan in office, a slip of a lass bearing a title that belonged to the man who'd been hers, the Blackstaff, the great Kelvin. We can none of us best the dead, for they are not here making new mistakes for all to see. They are beyond that at last. Laryl had said that to her, and in a kindly voice, too, but that made it no less of a dismissal of her worth, a measuring of what little she'd done. Yet she was the black staff now. She would show Lady Laryl Silverhand and everyone else that she was worthy of the office. She would do right by Waterdeep. This bustling city where everyone else strove to do right by themselves and complained when the city of splendors didn't measure up in this small way or that, but lifted no finger to make it better. She, Vajra, would make a difference. Though if the wagging tongues in the street ever realized how alone and ignorant she was, they would hurl her down in an instant, like wolves pouncing on the weakest prey. She must work and prepare and work some more, mustering her magic in readiness, layer upon layer, prepared item upon prepared item, as well as her spells, so that no matter what happened, she could unleash a mighty response. So strong an answer to foes that no sane opponent would ever think a challenge worth it. That was the best way. Cow them all into not daring to work their misdeeds. And part of that work was clearly seeing the coming threats. She'd been slow to see the true rising strength of the cult of the dragon, had dismissed their secret chance to Tiamat as so much wishful reverence. She could not afford, Waterdeep could not afford more misjudgments like that one. Something was stirring among the giants now, and she hadn't the faintest idea what. That unknowing must change. There was trouble in the Underdark, too, a part of why some of its denizens were stealing back up into Skullport. But was it no more than the usual skirmishes between and among nearby drow cities and illithids, and all those who stood against them, or something bigger? And the watchful order was little help. Oh, Bojentra meant well, but she and faithful Glenmar were consumed with keeping increasingly fractious city mages like Kazmult or Lavalander, rising new masters of wizardry flush with the coins of nobles and those who wanted to become noble, and increasingly the demanding voices of those who paid them so well from becoming full-fledged tyrants. Begin with an easy step, she reminded herself. Gain it, stand upon it, and then take larger ones, resisting the temptation to seek out more easy steps and spend time treading them all so the harder, larger tasks can be avoided for as long as possible. That is the courtier's way. And if we all do as courtiers do, the world is doomed, and us with it. It was surprising how often she recalled the advice of Elminster these days, a mischievous, lecherous old goat she'd once judged him, and a fool besides. But it was surprising how much wisdom he seemed to have learned in these latter years. And she could begin to take one easy step here and now in this room. Padding barefoot on the smooth, warm stone, she circled the table swiftly so her night robe would swirl in her wake, Yes, such childish delights were her entertainment now, and looked along the roll of years picked out in gilt rings along the edge of the table. This was the year of the Scarlet Witch, and she was come late to this table. She should have been trying to learn just who the Scarlet Witch was, and what that being would do of importance last year, instead of waiting until now the unusually warm and balmy middle of Myrtle. 
What was that orc saying? Burn that bridge when we're standing on it? Yes, that was precisely what she was risking. She could well be trying to guide Waterdeep by seeing what lay ahead as it was already happening. Still, no matter when one leaps into battle, one needs arms and armor, so... The seers may have been mad or the gods may have whispered all sorts of nonsense to them and priests in their temples misconstrued it all ever since. But still... The name of every year can and should guide us, she said the old, old temple rude aloud. None of them are meaningless. So now. Her gaze strayed across the sprawling city map, and then she looked up to scan the great map of Faerun that curved around so much of the wall. Waterdeep was but a tiny dot in such a vast expanse of countryside, so the Scarlet Witch was so much more likely to arise or do whatever she was going to do out there, somewhere, rather than in the shadow of Mount Waterdeep. And she hadn't the faintest who or what the Scarlet Witch was, had heard nothing, beyond the empty speculations of others who read the roll of years and wondered aloud, and, of course, priests who twisted every single year name into something concerning their deity and their deity alone, priests who talked little about how distant almost every god seemed to have suddenly become, and at least here in Waterdeep were all, every last faith more cautious and less forceful in matters of local politics. The city had noticed that all the temples were suddenly far more reluctant to try to bring the dead back to life, no matter how much coin was offered for their altars. This city held temples full of priests who probably didn't have any better idea about the Scarlet Witch than she had. So, where to begin? Journeying across Faerun in some wild wandering search seemed pointless, not to mention irresponsible for someone whose office should mean vigilance here in Waterdeep, even if she dared to use a portal. Across the room, her remaining fragment of the black staff flared with a sudden rich blue radiance, a thrillingly beautiful glow that faded again as swiftly as it had come. Vajra stared at that precious black stick, jutting up so still and silent from the stand she'd fashioned for it. What had made it do that? Was it trying to tell her to use a portal, or shun them? Or had it flared for some other reason entirely? It went a more purple hue when someone was trying to use magic to force a way into the tower, but beyond that, she hadn't the foggiest. Almost before she thought about doing so, she'd crossed the room and caught up the black staff. Its shortened length was more of a rod or scepter for her than a staff, and the gems that had been so deeply embedded in it as to be nigh hidden down its smooth black length now stood proud up and down it, like so many glossy knobs on an old man's walking stick. As she took hold of it, some of those embedded stones winked at her, tiny lights playing in their depths in a brief welcoming pattern. It felt warm to the touch, as it almost always did, and when she closed her eyes and clutched it to her body, there came the usual sensation of sinking down into it, of drawing closer to a great sleeping mind in its depths which was why she so often slept embracing the fragment, learning what she could from the dream visions it sent her. She would do that now. She shrugged off her night robe, letting it sigh into a silken puddle on the floor behind her, clutched what was left of the black staff tightly against her, and headed for the stairs back up to bed. Not that she felt the slightest bit sleepy. Oh, Mr. Forfend, let it not be another of those nights. 
The slender, handsome man in skin-tight gray leathers perched on the roof edge as motionless as any sculpted stone gargoyle, watching would-be murderers at work. The stars were out and winking down as the cool of night settled on the harbor and the sea fog started to steal in. Soon its damp and moonlit haze would cloak the docks and the moored ships in thick wet shrouds no gaze could pierce. But for now the moon and stars still reigned, and Drake could see the assassins clearly as they scaled the wall that encircled Mert's mansion. It was still called that, Yonder darkly turreted and eccentric home nestled in the rising rock flank of Mount Waterdeep, though Mert the moneylender had not been seen in Waterdeep for more than a hundred years. The lords of the city had recently gifted it to the new open lord of Waterdeep, Lady Lairall Silverhand. And before this night was out, Lairall might taste the price of taking that title. No less than six assassins by Drake's count were stealthily seeking her life. No lights shone in the sleeping mansion. The spy sat still and watched the bringers of death sidle across the slender strip of garden, avoiding the stone bridge that linked the tallest turret to a path meandering over the shoulder of the soaring mountain. It took them surprisingly little time to breach the garden doors, and they did so more quietly than he'd expected. Well now, they just might succeed after all. Drake sat very still, save for the tips of the fingers of his right hand. They caressed an itch he was unaccustomed to. A tiny fresh brand burned into the side of his neck behind his right ear. A blood bond. It would mean his doom if he betrayed the worm who'd branded him. But he was richer now in just a ten day than he'd ever been in his life before. And the second promised payment had been on time, and not a gem less than promised. Twelve more such payments, and he'd be wealthier than some noble lords in this city. And for that, he'd do many dark deeds for many worms. Sleep was every whit as elusive as Vajra had feared it would be. The surviving fragment of the black staff was its head and upper shaft, about three feet long in all, as dead black as lightless velvet and usually as cold and malignant as a yawning tomb. Even so, she clutched it when abed, learning far more than any tutor of the art had ever shown her. And despite the unyielding authority of Kelvin that lingered in the staff as if he were still alive and staring disapprovingly at her out of it, the broken remnant of the black staff somehow reassured her more than any mentor had ever been able to. Right now she was lightly dozing, dimly aware of the stars in the ceiling above her as the staff vividly showed her several of the walking statues of Waterdeep one after another, as they stood in daylight over this past warming month, frozen just where they'd stopped their rampages after the spell plague. Though she heard his voice in her mind, not at all, she could almost hear Kelvin reminding her that awakening the stone behemoths to move again was something she could do by means of what was left of the staff. She could move them to better locations so rebuilding could occur in the places where they stood now, freeing them to be more swiftly ready to defend the city if an orc horde or more dragon attacks should come. A statue is awakened thus and is commanded like this and... Commanded. Furthering the causes that were right setting water deep to rights. Using the rightful power of the black staff, the unyielding dark strength that endures beyond death despite setbacks, regardless of... There were no eyes in the round, starry-domed bedchamber at the top of Blackstaff Tower to see what happened to her then, and no mirrors for her to see herself. 
Yet her eyes shot open as two royal blue flames, eerily lambent glows without eyeballs, uniform deep ovals of blue fire. And she sat bolt upright, face curiously expressionless, the black staff clutched to her breast. She rose from the bed, dressed in silent, deft efficiency, and strode out of Black Staff Tower, the fragment under her arm. As she stepped out into the night, it winked the same rich royal blue as her eyes, and they promptly lost their fire, leaving behind a dark-eyed, dusky-skinned woman who looked all around her in puzzled apprehension. Then she lifted her chin, squared her shoulders, and strode off through the moonlit streets with determined purpose, heading south around the castle spur of Mount Waterdeep. Sentries on its high battlements saw her, and wondered what urgent business took the Blackstaff out alone at this time of night. The more cynical among them murmured the same thought. They'd no doubt know soon enough. The someone who came through the door that had been Mertz and was now Laryl's was female. She was short and dusky-skinned and slender, her dark hair clipped close. Her eyes were large, dark, and grim, even before they saw the sprawled and bound bodies of the assassins. Elminster indicated her with a flourish. I have the honor to present he said gravely with as much dignity as any herald, Vadra Safar, the seventh black staff of Waterdeep. Well met, Laryl offered, and the rote greeting sounded genuine. What brings you to my door at this hour, lady of the staff? Vadra nodded a little uncertainly, took a deep breath, and said, Grim news. A lord of the city has just been found murdered. Avner Ravelmark. Ravelmark? And Gorlar last night. Two masked lords in as many nights. The Blackstaff nodded unhappily. The talk among the watch patrols I passed on the way here is that this is the former open lord's doing. Revenge for being deposed. Laryl reached out to Elminster for support, hauled herself upright by climbing the arm he offered, and gave Vadra a thoughtful frown. Earlier this evening I received a delegation, two guildmasters, Scropa of the furriers and wool weavers and ration staff of the innkeepers, and the matriarch of a senior noble house, Lady Braneth Lyra Estelmer, came to see me about Gorlar's death. They were concerned by talk they'd overheard, and what they themselves suspected, of involvement by agents of the deposed Lord Daggled Neverember. And? I gave them my opinion, which is this. So far as I can tell, to blame Neverember is an unsupported step too far. The man did leave agents behind to meddle in Waterdavian politics as well as mere supporters, and it seems he does not wish me well or that I have an easy tenure, but all I can learn of what those agents did yesterday suggests that he is not actively involved in Gorlar's killing. Vadra took a step closer, her eyes narrowing, and hefted the fragment of the black staff. You've not heard yet, I see. Heard what? Laryl asked. That last word soft, yet somehow at the same time as sharp as the crack of a whip. The black staff's head reared back as if she'd been slapped. Lady Estelmer, Vadra said flatly, has been attacked and her skull split. Her wits have suffered grievously and she's not expected to survive. Guildmaster Aldemar Scropa has been killed in an accident involving masonry falling on him from above, in a South Ward back street, brickwork that somehow fell outward a good dozen feet or more farther than should have been possible. And ration staff? Laryl asked sharply. Vanished. Not even his family knew until I came pounding on his door looking for him on my way here. 
He went to bed with his wife, slipped something into her evening broth to make her sleep. She's still drifting in and out, can't stay awake longer than it takes her to spout a few sentences, and then got dressed and slipped out the bedroom window, where someone was waiting for him with a knife. There's a trail of blood on the ground outside that just stops. They're all sighed then took two strides so she could bring both fists down on one of Mert's best polished tables as thunderously as any furious fighting man and muttered, Water deep. Bloody water deep. The worst of it is, I know I'm going to get used to things like this. I did, Mert growled. You're not helping, old wolf. Want me to hire some adventurers and go hunting missing guild masters? Not yet. You'd be serving as too tempting a scapegoat for whoever's murdering masked lords. Mert grinned and nodded appreciatively. Oh, you're going to be fine. Laryl rolled her eyes. I never liked ruling. I like wandering the wilds, breathing the fresh air and looking out over the landscape while prowling monsters stalk you and wait for the right moment to pounce, Elminster murmured. Laryl gave him a hard look. When you're a woman with silver hair and these, she gestured at her bosom, men stalk and pounce all the time. I got used to it quite a few centuries back. Then she turned to the Blackstaff. In the morning, will you contact as many of the masked lords as you can and have them meet me at the palace? They need to be warned, and I want to watch their faces as we talk, in case any of them seem just a bit too smirkingly complacent about the deaths so far. If they all head there and the Slayer is watching, we'll be identifying masked lords for him, Badger replied. They're all sighed. He... Or she already knows how to identify and slay masked lords, doesn't he? Vajra sighed as well, added a curse under her breath, nodded, and headed for the door. Should you be walking alone in Dock Ward by night, lady? Mert rumbled. I'm the Black Staff, she replied without turning or slowing. Not a defenseless maiden. When she opened the door, a strong smell of smoke came in out of the night. What Lairall had taken to be harbor fog drifting past the windows held the reek of wood smoke and tar and worse things. And then she saw the first flickering amber reflections on the highest rocks of the castle spur. Mert and Elminster were out the door in such a rush they sent Vadra staggering back out of the way. Laryl sprinted to join them as a crackling roar rose from behind her. It came from beyond the house, from the harbor. They all turned as the first wash of heat warmed their faces and found themselves looking into the leaping flames of the Nine Hells. Boardwalks and lashed-together ships stood like black sticks, silhouetted against orange-white flames that roared skyward in a crackling hurry to lick the stars. Mist shore was ablaze. Chapter 2 Waterdeep Watches Though it may seem as if all Waterdeep rushes and bustles about with eyes and minds only for their own business at hand, it profits everyone to always remember that part of their business is watching what is unfolding around them, without seeming to, in hopes of seizing on the next big thing, the next road to riches, even if only to sneer, Waterdeep always watches. Largreth, the Good Knight, in Chapter 5 of The Rise of Randrill, a chapbook adventure by Sandrith Yandrill of Neverwinter, published in the Year of the Striking Hawk. Darleth Drake hadn't survived a score of Water Davian summers by being unobservant or careless. He was looking for trip threads before he ascended the outside stair, and so, of course, he found them. 
her usual thin black threads, so many more daring little black gowns that would never be mended. Yet when he reached the door at the top of the stair after avoiding them all, it opened before he could reach for it. So they'd been watching for him out the lone window, too. Drake smiled, tucked himself to one side of the door, and waited. Come in, his employer said after several long moments of silence. She sounded irritated. We've waited long enough. Inevitably. Haste and a direct journey aren't wise if one hopes not to be followed, Drake replied, stepping into the darkness and sidestepping immediately along the inside wall so the man he knew would be nearby with weapon in hand could swing the door shut. Were you followed? That man, the guildmaster, asked sharply. Stout Cuthbarrel was sweating, his calmness a rather poor act, not like the two lithe, slender, and dangerously pretty young noblewomen in the room. A bare, rather dirty rented room with cracks in its yellowing plaster walls and nary a bench to sit on, not the surroundings customarily preferred by nobles, but perhaps they'd enjoyed lounging languidly against the walls. Not that they needed the practice. Drake shook his head. Lundreth's diversion worked. Mist Shore will be burning for days, and half of Dock Ward will be busy shifting cargoes away from the heat. That's what's riding their minds right now. Not the assassination of the open lord of Waterdeep? Zarela, the woman who was not his employer, did not sound in the least surprised. Interesting. Not, Drake confirmed. The black staff entered and soon departed again, with none of the hurry or upset she'd have shown if the Lady Silverhand was dead. Unless she was in on the killing, of course. Any idea who is? Drake shrugged. Many ideas, but... Mere guesses, all of them. And we're not in the guessing game. Thank you, Drake. That little quirk of Tasheen's mouth meant that his employer meant those words as a clear dismissal. So Drake bowed and went out. He headed back down the stairs without closing the door behind him so they could watch him go and make sure he was out of earshot. They'd take his vault over the railing halfway down as avoiding a tripwire not a move to the underside of the flight of steps so he could clamber right back up it unseen beneath the open treads. Someone, Cuthbert most likely, started to close the door again, but his employer said, Don't bother. It's time to be gone. I think we're all done with waiting. With all the flames and smoke, the city will be awake and gawking if they aren't already, said the woman who was not his employer. You mean we won't be trying for another tonight, Cuthbarrel grunted. That's fine by me. Tomorrow night at yours? At mine, Drake's employer confirmed. We'll have Hailing Horse next. They all moved as the guildmaster swung the door open, so Drake swung himself to the underside of the top stair landing and braced himself there. It wouldn't do to have any of the three see him while they were removing trip threads. Not that his employer would be all that surprised. Elminster peered down one more hallway. Polished marble floor, gleaming wood-paneled walls, arch-shaped wooden ceiling, and caught sight of yet another palace servant watching them. The forty-third he'd counted since their arrival through the back door, and he'd probably missed spotting a few. He turned back to Lairall and murmured, it seems they watch over you rather intently here. What are they afraid their open lord might do, I wonder? Lerol sighed. They mean well. They've been trained to leap. Before a lord of Waterdeep can get the word frog all the way out, I, Elminster commented. Never Ember must have been a proper terror. Lerol shrugged. From all I've heard, he was simply a no-nonsense, energetic, charge-ahead leader. Elminster smiled. Like I said. 
Laryl decided it was time to sigh again, but thankfully they'd reached the door she'd been heading for. In here, she told him, leading the way, we can be less formal and more private. Here was an office dominated by a large round wooden table that was itself dominated by huge stacks of parchments, some of which had overflowed onto the accompanying chairs. Two seats facing each other along the curve of the table were still unencumbered. Laryl gracefully lowered her long-legged six feet into one of them and indicated the other. Elminster sat down, tapped his empty and unlit pipe approvingly against the carved edge of the table and said gently, So, unburden thyself, lass. Repeated assassination attempts, sullen guildmasters, a sneering nobility, dastardly agents of the not-quite-vanished Neverember seemingly everywhere, some citizens pushing for war with Neverwinter so they can sell swords and helms and blankets and all, and the usual intransigence and feuding among the masked lords, with some of them angry with ye for not being content to be puppet or empty-headed figurehead, and the rest angry with ye for not fixing everything with the wave of your art-endowed hand. I economically summarized, Laryl said ruefully, but aside from the Neverember element, which I suspect is far more imagined and rumored than it is real, t'was ever thus. You mustered your summation so effortlessly because the open lord of Waterdeep always faces such challenges, yet the city faces real problems I must somehow get my fellow lords to enact good governance upon. There's a malady spreading in down shadow, though it hasn't yet risen to the notice of those whose tongues spread rumors in the streets. There have been several subsidences in the southern half of the city, buildings collapsing into their own cellars when said delvings were being enlarged, with men buried or crushed and guilds getting angry as blame is hurled about, not to mention fresh reports of dragons being seen in the skies, and giants standing on the slopes of Sar and Halimbrar spying on the city. Oh, yes, and men in strange helms riding giant vultures amid the clouds above Deserin Vale. Ah, well, Elminster teased, ye can't say Waterdeep isn't laying on entertainments for ye. Hard work, I fear not, Laryl replied. Diplomacy, I flatter myself I can handle. Yet as I get older and my art fades, I find myself increasingly irked by the small matters, the minor annoyances that once I laughed off or brushed aside. How can Waterdeep ever be a place of harmony and civic pride when hateful and foolish rumors daily rule the minds and tongues of far too many sensible citizens? Such as? Several energetic someones are forcefully and persistently putting it about the deep that some fell wizard, or the entire watchful order as a way of blackmailing everyone so as to make their own bid for ruling power, will animate the walking statues and send them striding through the city smashing the buildings of their foes, with their foes still inside them. Ye smell a campaign to spread this notion, as opposed to the usual overhearing and seizing upon and talking to others? I do and there are more frivolous mad-wit irritations, too. Laryl was getting annoyed, and her long, unbound silver hair was stirring, lifting from her shoulders to lash and swirl, the tresses questing in different directions. When her customarily twinkling emerald-green eyes met Elminster's, he saw that they were flaring silver. For instance, some bright spark is writing scathing commentary on my every utterance, and those of every guildmaster and loose-jawed noble in the deep, too. Under the name of Mistra Help Us, Volo, you'd think no one would want to borrow that particular name after its original bearer indulged in so much infamy, would you? Ah, but tis not borrowed, El informed her gently. Tis the same man. What? How by all the lost and hidden words of power did he survive beyond his due lifespan? Surely he mastered far too little art to... Mistra, El replied. If all we chosen were hunted down in the wake of her fall, 
she needed others to hold enough of herself so she could rise again. Others unexpected who would not be hunted down. So, though he knows it not, Volo became one of her unwitting champions. Laryl rolled her eyes. That scamp, he's almost as persistent an annoyance as Mert, or you. A twinkle arose in Elminster's eye. We try, he said gently and turned away to reclaim his pipe, which had chosen the last few moments of his inattention to drift slyly away. His own art was lessened of late, and he knew that all of the seven sisters had suffered more in this regard. None of them could mind scry at will any more, subtly or otherwise, and must needs resort to the brute force weave-powered scouring that wrecks minds as it reads them, and so was best used on the dying or dead before their brains were entirely cold. If Laryl now admitted to him that she was forgetting many spells, the details of casting them simply falling out of her head time after time so they were effectively lost to her. Well, she wouldn't be the first of the sisters to reveal as much to him. He was doing it too, drawing directly on the weave and by sheer effort of will seeking to bring about specific effects where spells failed. It worked, but was often imprecise and was very tiring. And while the seven tended to have fiercer passion than he did, high emotion was best suited to the brief mighty strike, not the long and bitter endurance. That was his own mastery. Have ye iron guard rings enough? he asked. Laryl's eyes were green again as she looked back at him. There was a lingering, deepening silence before she murmured, You know, don't you? That our art is failing, for all of us, he almost whispered, of course. There had been something approaching fear in Laryl's face, but at his words it fell away, leaving her looking thoughtful. She lifted her hand to show the plain ring on her longest finger. Another rides in my hair, and I have six more hidden about the palace. Silently, Elminster did back his left sleeve to reveal a bracer on his forearm. Instead of armor plate, its rigid leather inner and outer surfaces bore pouches, and out of one he drew a bone pierced at both ends to hold either end of a thong. Untying one end of that length of leather, he slid six identical plain metal rings off the bone and dropped them into her hand. You can never have too many. There are too few loyal folk in any city to leave even one unprotected. When ye discover their worth, thanks, Laryl said simply, and reached to her bodice to draw up a small purse on a fine chain into which the rings disappeared. You are far more a creature of the weave than the rest of us, El. Tell me, just how much can I or any wielder of the art hope to hide from you? Elminster shrugged. Just about everything. There's simply too much going on at all times. Too much overlapping chaos for me to watch and follow and anticipate. These days I'm more the man who glimpses an arrow hissing past out of thick smoke for an instant and tries to tell myself its fletching was this hue or that. Nay, Uncle Weirdbeard is no all-seeing spy still less all-knowing. Well, that's a relief. Your life would be so boring if ever. Laryl's large eyes were twinkling again. Elminster judged the time was right to ask her one of his own larger questions. So, lass, tell me, when the delegation of masked lords came to ye, what made ye accept the position of open lord? and later even visit other lords of the city and try to persuade them to support ye. Mistra, Laryl replied flatly, and when L opened his mouth to ask more, she leaned forward, put a firm fingertip to his forehead, and poured a memory into his mind. He was Laryl, standing barefoot somewhere in the vast and dimly moonlit forest, the trees very dark and what little light there was a deep blue. 
In the air before him floated those two gigantic long-lashed eyes, and Mistra's voice rolled into his head out of gentle depths. Now that the silver marches is no more, stability is needed in the Sword Coast North, and I have other tasks for Illustriel. It's your turn on a throne. On a throne? Laryl asked sharply, then bit back aside to ask, Where? In the Palace of Waterdeep. They'll turn to you soon enough. Except it is needful. Your presence will inhibit certain individuals who would otherwise push ahead with magic that will do much harm and court the very real possibility that public mood will turn against wizards with determination to exterminate, and wielders of the art will begin to fall. Laryl bowed her head. So be it, so long as you know that I may have to eliminate some of them myself. I trust you to do what is needful. You few, I can trust that far. And with that chilling sadness in the voice of the goddess they all served, Elminster was back in the cluttered little palace office with its heaps of parchment and many doors, blinking a little grimly at Laryl, who sat smiling wryly at him. Elminster, I need your help in this. Elminster smiled back. It's why I've come. It's why I've come. Laryl almost allowed herself to relax in relief. Her old, old friend and sometime mentor smiled at her, the pipe he seemingly never filled and lit these days thrust jauntily into one corner of his mouth. He looked amused, and as Laryl watched, he plucked out the pipe and leaned forward to say something more, probably a jest. And then his face changed, acquiring a distinct look of alarm, and he said, Excuse me, I must leave ye to attend to a more pressing matter. I'll return soon, I hope. And he rose, spun around in a whirl of his old robe, and was gone from the room, winking out of existence astride before he reached the closed door. Laryl sat suddenly alone in her office, shaking her head ruefully. Secrets, always secrets, she whispered at the empty air where he'd been. It's the part of being a chosen I've always hated the most. All the damned deceit. You only got a ceiling this high outside the mansions of high noses, that is, by punching up to take the height of two full floors. And they'd done that here, must have done, because there was more than enough room to put in a grand false ceiling, one side of which rested atop a false wall, built far enough out from the real wall to create a passage between them that his spread arms couldn't quite span. Glethro couldn't imagine why anyone would be madwit enough to spend all this coin on a false wall made to fall over, made to fall over, and bring the false ceiling he was finishing gilding right now down in ruin on the floor below. Flat on his back on the loftiest boards of the scaffold, Glethro looked over at that wall for the six hundredth or so time. Even the sniffiest, most jaded old noble would have to grant that it certainly looked grand enough. Even from up here you can't tell the support columns are cut right through, he marveled. You're not supposed to be able to, Glethro, Haymichael said gruffly from beside him. But then Haymichael said everything gruffly. The old man was quite possibly made of gruff. Gruff and bone and bile, a great wrinkled sack of boiling bile. The old sack glared at him. Now let's get done. If we so much as brush that wall while we're taking this scaffolding down. I know, I know. Glethro replied. It's going to take us most of the day to drop it from within, slow and careful and without the usual tossing down boards and all. I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. 
I just don't understand why a man rich enough to gut a building this size on this street wants a false wall and ceiling that can come crashing down if someone gives them a good push in the right spot. It don't make sense. Oh, he must have a good reason, all right, but I can't think... You're not being paid to think, Clathro. You're being paid to gild the last bit of that frasting plaster so we can get done and get this down and clear out of here. Hey, Michael, he's coming, Prethgar called up from the canvas-shrouded floor down below. And Soller's crew is with him, carrying the sign. Here's hoping they don't hammer it too hard, Hey, Michael grunted. No, it's made to slide into the frame. All beautiful gilt work. Van Tilver Investments, he's calling it. Glethro rolled his eyes. Van Tilver, that's not his name. Look, youngling, Haymichael snapped all too predictably. Speculate and point out the frasting obvious on your own time. And after, we're well away from here. They say this one hears and sees everything, and for what he's paying, he can put any faruking name he wants to over the door. Just get your gilding done. Clethro snapped back. I'm finished. So enough with the lectures, hey, Michael. And help me get the buckets down without any spills or crashes. I don't want to be crushed by falling wall and ceiling any more than you do. The castle gate was grand. Despite its name, you couldn't see the gates of Castle Waterdeep from its front door or even its loftiest windows. But then Jallister hadn't expected to. You named your inn whatever sounded nice and lured folk in. The castle gate was big and impressive and richly furnished, the best-appointed traveler's haven he'd ever set boot in. It was more than four times larger than the country inn he'd grown up in so far from here. But it was cold. Not cold as in bone-chilling, but impersonal. Too clean, too bright, too formal. And its staff were all of those things, too. Jallister was certain his legendary great-grandmother would have hated this place. Not that a city inn in Castle Ward in the great city of Waterdeep could properly be judged against the Old Skull Inn, a rustic crossroads way stop in Shadowdale half a world away, but Jallister Silvermane couldn't help it. What he'd give to be back in the Old Skull right now, lounging with feet up in front of the hearth fire. Though if he really was back in the old skull, he wouldn't be lounging with his feet up anywhere. He'd be hard at work scrubbing floors and plucking fowl and washing blankets, not to mention working the pump and carrying the gray water. Oh, gods, yes, carrying all the water. Still, that nigh-constant carrying had given him strong arms and shoulders and wrists like iron, and they were a large part of why he'd mastered the sword so well. He was quick, agile, and acrobatic, rather than burly and strong, yet he was good at keeping his balance, and... And by all the gods he sounded like a slaver crying the worth of someone he was trying to sell. Though the vending cant at the hiring fair they'd attended in Virgin's Square yestermorn had sounded not all that much different, to be honest... The steel shadows were growing desperate. Waterdeep was every bit as grand and sprawling as they said it was, crammed with folk from everywhere in the world and the exotic things they ate and did. But this city ate coins from your purse like a starving dog goes through a meat larder. It seemed half the novice adventuring bands in Faerun had entertained the same idea as the steel shadows of Shadowdale and at the same time, high to the city of splendors where coin was king to seek employment. Everyone there has money. Everyone is busily pursuing new ventures. Everyone has need of bodyguards and escorts for their wares, and... Well, all of those things were true, but it seemed that everyone already had their own pet band of adventurers on hire, too which meant that day after day passed and coins drained out of their purses at an alarming rate despite the relative bargain the castle gate offered. 
Even wine, albeit a weak and watered-down vintage, was included in the ten-day rate for a shared room, along with three meals daily and a cold bath every three evenings. Hot water was extra. Relative was the word to pounce on. You could feast like a king at the old skull for a month for less than a ten-day rate here. Still, if they found no situation, as casual non-guild hires seemed to be called in this city, in the next five or six days, they'd be forced to tramp out into the wilds with no more than a few coppers between them, to live wild on their wits and what they could catch. Nelvor and Ariskin had the finest clothes, so they were calling at the gates of the wealthy in the North Ward right now, hoping to find work, and Farrell and Gelthark were out visiting guild houses. As for Jalister Silvermane, well, he'd agreed to try the castle and the palace, but had met with refusals so firm, accomplished, and swift that he'd come back here drowned in discouragement to sit in the dining room and think. There was so much to see in the crowded streets of Waterdeep, and so many perils from rumbling wagons and handcarts and elbows out hurrying folks that he couldn't think out there. He needed a seat, and a little quiet, and not to have to watch for pickpockets every moment. He was young and willing and not hard on the eyes, though by no means as handsome as some he'd seen since arriving in the City of Splendors, and he'd not seen so much as an eyebrow belonging to nobility or the truly wealthy. But he wasn't big, and Meat Mountain sword swingers seemed cheap and legion hereabouts, and in Waterdeep being the great-grandson of Jael Silvermane meant nothing at all. So here he was, thankful for hot tea that tasted nothing at all like what he got at home, but good nonetheless, in a dining room that at this time of the day was patronized by water Davians who loved the stuff. Matrons mainly and portly couples whose shopping had made their feet hurt and were taking a break, middle-class water Davian citizens of the sort who can afford one or two servants to look after the children while they go out to dine of an evening. After one glance at Jalister, they'd ignored him and had been gossiping long enough now to have forgotten him. Their tongues were wagging freely, so he raised her cup, inhaled its aromatic steam, and listened in. He's Gulkin, you know, of Gulkin's fresh fish. Oh, that Gulkin, the one that had three mistresses until they all found out about each other. Yes, that Gulkin. He was rather drunk last night and was telling me about the giants coming to conquer us. The what? Oh, ho, you haven't heard? Giants have been seen everywhere in the Sword Coast backlands. Cloud castles and full-armored giants of all breeds striding along... Breeds? I don't think they're called that, dear. Well, types, then. How should I know the proper name for sort of giant? I grew up hearing stories about giants all being alive, bad, or dead, vastly preferable. Those are the two sorts of giants I know. Horeth, you're disgusting. Oh, that why you married me? Giants? What was this? Jalister had certainly never laid eyes on a giant of any sort, breed, on their way here. But then they'd kept to the great trade roads in the dusty creaking company of caravans, seventy wagons strong or more, and... It's all part of Neverember's revenge, you know. What? Deposed Lord Neverember? Well, he was certainly enraged enough. Didn't say much, but his eyes burned like fire, and he harassed well, gnashed his slarning teeth, he did. Or so they say. I wasn't there myself. We honest working folk have to show up at our situations and work, look you. Well, what of this revenge? What's he going to do? Show up in the dead of night and personally murder all of us in our beds? At, say, five killings a night, how many years would that take him? He'll be dead of old age before he's done emptying Doc Ward, he will. Not if he just makes war on us with all the higher swords he can muster. Armies of mercenaries, mind. Ah, uh, but we've got the walking statues. We can trample armies of mercenaries in an afternoon. If they ever move again, that is. 
They're saying all the magic went out of them back when the blue fire came. Are these the same experts on everything who know what Neverember's secretly planning? My cousin lives in Neverwinter, and she's seen plenty of crews being hired to work on the road, but no marching companies of mercenaries. I'm more worried about more dragon attacks, with Mistshore burning now and Field Ward already ashes, thanks to dragon attacks, remember? It'll be our homes the dragons come for next. Field Ward? They're not rebuilding it, you know. So where will the likes of us find rooms we can afford, hey? Same place we always did. Warehouses in South Ward that leak too much to be used to store wares any longer, and every rat-infested rickety dump in Dock Ward that can be divided into still smaller rooms and rented to us for a few more years before it rots away entirely and falls into the street. Well, aren't you the cheery one? I suppose you expected bright trumpetings to fail. Jallister leaned forward to hear better, at the same time trying not to look in the slightest bit interested. He'd overheard talk of this bright trumpeting's imports about a dozen times during his job hunts, mostly bitter talk from those who'd lost coin investing in it, some sort of new business that had opened with much fanfare a bare month back and already closed its doors. There was much muttering that it was a clever scheme by someone to take the savings of investors and then abscond, always intending it to fail. Well, of course I did. I ask you, what sort of fool I stand for nothing name is Bright Trumpetings? No wonder it went bust. Why couldn't the man behind it, they're saying he was local, not some sly outlander with a strange name, do what sensible upstanding Water Davians do and name his business after himself? Blount Holdings or Halamber Holdings or whatever. Well, perhaps he didn't think his name would impress. He's called Triskreth Lahunder. Lahunder? What kind of unfortunate has a name like that? A crooked swindler by the looks of it. That's what kind of unfortunate. Ah, have done. If we talk over businesses that failed in a hurry and took a lot of coins with them, we'll be sitting here a year from now. And by then, there will be a whole lot more of them. I'm more interested in what can touch us all. The results of burned investors getting even. Murders. Chapter 3 The Wagging Tongue is a Deadly Sword Trust not in tall towers, brimful vaults, and bright armored guards. You can have all these and wise alliances galore, too, and still fall to unchecked rumor. Never underestimate the wickedness of bored folk or the spiteful and those who feel slighted in some way. For the wagging tongue is a deadly sword that brings kings and emperors down with frightening speed. Meldraith Myrall, Sage of Selgaunt, from One Unwise Woman's Musings, published in the Year of the Haunting. Murders? The dining room of the castle gate was suddenly hushed and attentive. Well, don't you think Guildmaster Terelver Ration Staff of the innkeepers met his death in, uh, suspicious circumstances? Or the two masked lords? Ah, but that's not investors a hiring dirty deeds. No, that'll be Neverember settling his scores. There'll be lots more of that coming, I'm thinking. Good. The more rats go down, the more coins for the likes of us. Oh? You really think the deep will ever run short of rats? Well, you are simple. You're probably one of those who thinks starting wars is worth it. And what are your high-hidden lords doing about all of this? An outlander merchant visiting the city asked loudly and hastily, raising a warning hand to forestall the water Davian sitting next to him from making an angry retort to the last rebuke. All over the dining room, he was answered by shrugs. Does it matter? A stout, side-whiskered water Davian asked. Maskelin Blount was his name, Jallister recalled the owner of five sausage-and-savory pie shops, of which he was swellingly proud. 
They're good at prohibitions and prying little rules and taxing us, but as to the larger matters— But I thought you have a palace and an open lord sitting in it, so he— Sorry, she, now, could hear citizen concerns and complaints. Oh, she hears us all right. Lady Silverhand's a good listener. I'll give her that. And if it's something that a friend with coin to spare can't fix, she'll fix it herself. But as to moving the lords to decide this way or that— Blount's wave of dismissal was even more emphatic than his shaken head. Lady Lerall conveys our concerns, put in a tall paint-and-dye merchant. Keslant Wintertall, that was his name. Jallister was getting better at remembering names in the endless Water Davian parade and tacking them to faces. And they hear, and then go ahead and do whatever they were going to do anyway. There were snorts and wry chuckles at that, and much nodding, as another guest came into the dining room bringing the sharp reek of smoke with him. Heads turned, and tea was set down to sniff. Miss Shore? Miss Shore, the new arrival confirmed. Must be oils or some out of the sort burning. Flames higher than the masts now. All those hulks'll be burned down to the waterline by tomorrow, every last one of them. Some diners rose to go and look, as smoke started to waft into the castle gate. Only one man returned, and he looked impressed. Flames and smoke and all, he muttered. As bad as Field Ward. Missed Shore's history. Well, good riddance to that den of thieves and beggars, said a shopkeeper. Meldar Mayoramon of Mayoramon's Nets and Tassels, who was sitting close enough to Jallister for him to touch. The sounds of general agreement arose across the dining room. Must have been magic, a lone adventurer, an ugly red-nosed man, not one of the steel shadows, commented. I was there three days back, guarding a client, and everything was so damp they were kindling cooking fires on their own decks without fear of any blazes spreading. Well, someone set their fire good and proper, another water Davian grunted. Tellfeather, Jallister recalled, a seller and repairer of coaches. That was it. Erdrath Tellfeather. Barrels of oil is usually the way. If there hadn't been so much of that stored in Field Ward, there'd still be a Field Ward. I'm not so sure we need less cooking oil standing around in barrels, another diner said sourly. I'm thinking we need fewer marauding dragons. And arsonists, a scarred-faced man put in. We've an entire guild of them to take up the slack when the amateurs aren't at work. Oh, how'd you reckon that? Whenever a building burns, the carpenters, roofers, and plasterers get work putting in the new one, the scarred man explained. Every time. Stands to reason they help the old buildings go, hey? The old ones that only rise three tiers of windows above the streets or less. One after another, those places go, and tall new ones go up in their place. The hammering never stops. And the stonecutters and masons, too, someone else agreed. Those dire sisters were sharper than their father ever was. Got well on their way to owning half of Southward, they did. The unburnt half? Har, har, you're the witty one, aren't you? God, this smoke is starting to get up my nose. Think I'll be off to my favorite eatery before their fresh sunfin turns into smoked sunfin. Oh, witty one yourself. Don't trip on that clever tongue of yours now. Wouldn't dream of it, arsonist. After you, then, cooking oil amateur. Surrounded by glib tongues running wild, an older merchant sporting the half-cloak of a fashionably successful Tetherian said gloomily, I'm in water deep again, all right. There were hidden ways in the Palace of Waterdeep, an extensive network of passages that the general public never saw. They weren't secret, but they were well concealed within the thick walls, and served servants and long-time courtiers as highways so they could move about with relative ease, speed, and privacy. 
Laryl hadn't paid them all that much attention in her earlier time in Waterdeep, but she was getting to know them quite well now. Not so much because she needed to move about unseen, but because there were times she needed to be alone to think. Brief respites from the endless whirl of reading reports, signing things, and making small decisions brought to her in haste, always in pressing haste, by courtiers far too urbane to want to make any decisions themselves. She'd been thankful to find a neglected and forgotten little dead end, where an unsafe turret had been filled in with stone and mortar, leaving a cramped spiral stair ascending to a sudden stop in a rough-walled blind alcove where she could sit alone. She was sitting there now, the open lord of Waterdeep, hiding in her own palace. Just as she must hide from everyone that she was no longer an archmage mighty enough to spell duel half a dozen mighty arch wizards at once and effortlessly defeat them. Blood of Mistra, just one watchful order mage of middling mastery who struck the Laryl silver hand of today when she was unprepared might well prevail. There'd been another two attempts to get into Mert's mansion since the half-dozen assassins, so she was safer here. Especially when going into reveries with the Weave, so she could confer with Dove and Silune, who now served Mistra as messengers, spectral ghosts who were little more than whispers in the Weave much of the time, but they could rise up out of altars dedicated to Mistra and impress clergy and praying wizards alike if need be. All of Mistress born chosen, the seven, wear out their distinctive silver-haired bodies over time. Centuries, but eventually the crumbling began in earnest. Then they must take the new ones from others as Elminster did, an ethical choice none of them preferred, or return to the weave and await Mistra mothering a new body for them, or put more and more of their energies into maintaining either their magic or their bodies. She'd chosen the latter herself, so her art was now slowly fading. Dove, on the other hand, had ached to join her husband Florin in the weave, and so had decided to end her mortal life, going down fighting to defend Myth Draner. So if she dared leave awareness of the world around her behind, as she was now so lessened she could not maintain it when she merged with the weave, Laryl could confer with Dove and Silone and even Florin and call on their memories and knowledge. She could use the weave to reach out to the full-bodied living, too. Illustriel and Storm, and for that matter, Amaroon and her man Arklath Delcastle. Yet they were every bit as busy as she was, and her every attempt might distract them from foes at a vital moment so it might well become a deadly moment. Storm and Rune were in rural eastern Cormier right now with Mistress Blessing. The Gentarum had a habit of murdering those wielders of art who couldn't or wouldn't join them, and knowing that the Gentarum had reoccupied Gentle Keep, Storm wanted to strengthen those who'd stand against the Gents in the Moon Sea region without starting yet another war. So she was working to rebuild the trust, prosperity, and cohesion between commoners and nobles in eastern Cormier, and establish firm ties of support and friendship between Cormier and the elves in Semberholm, led by the Coronal. It was all in the hope that elves and Cormirian humans could mutually benefit, grow in strength together, and prevent gentle keep from seizing control of Sembia which was rebuilding as Sembians who'd fled all the warfare returned, bringing their wealth with them to take advantage of the chaos and power vacuum to become influential power players at home. If Sembia and Cormir could be closer and more friendly, Gentle Keep or anyone else, Storm was certain some Shadowvar had survived and would now be lurking and awaiting any good chance to gain power, and Sembia, with its wealth but current chaos, would be a perfect place to do so, could be prevented from easily exploiting their traditional feud to work mischief in either land. Storm found it desirable to share what she was up to, but Mistra, 
herself more distant even from her daughters these days, wanted most of her chosen to keep secrets, even from each other. Wherefore, Lerwal knew very little of Illustrial's current mission, and only knew Storm's suspicions about Elminster's main concern, which had something to do with dealing with a powerful mage whose mind was not whole. I only hope tis someone other than me, Laryl murmured to herself as she rose to depart her private little place. Obviously I left my wits under the bed this morning, possibly in the chamber pot. She was four turns down the spiral stair passing the second landing that offered a pair of doors when she heard a curious sound. A deep and repetitive rumbling coming through one of those doors from a room that should be hosting no sounds at all. And what did that say for how secure she or anyone else was here in the palace? Hmm. These tower rooms were among the few in the palace that could be locked, and this particular pair of them not only were locked, they were two of four small disused rooms that the palace seneschal had, or so he'd informed her and she'd had as yet no cause whatsoever not to trust the tall grave tail in Tellfeather, given her the only keys to. She hadn't yet had time nor need to make use of either of this upper pair of rooms, so they should be empty. Her gear was stored in the pair on the floor below. She hastened on down the stair to the lower pair of rooms, caught up the right key from her girdle, and opened the one she was using for storing magic. Specifically, one of the few suits of her own storm armor Laryl had left. She'd made it to go on as easily and quietly as any tailored-to-fit cloth robe, and that served her well, considering the tight confines of the room and the need to fetch enchanted daggers by reaching over a rack of vials. Metal vials, true, but any fall can cause a stopper to leak, and most of the vials held layer and the ultimate painkiller, each vial worth about a year's pay to a guild apprentice in this city or about half a year's takings for most shopkeepers. After a moment of thought, she took an enchanted ring from a small coffer and slid it onto its usual finger. A ring of the ram, nothing to bring down palace ceilings, but a way of smiting a foe that needn't be fatal. Yes, a prudent choice. Thus suitably armed and armored, and feeling more contented than she had in days, though she'd seldom worn armor somehow when clad thus, she felt herself again. Laryl ascended the stair again to investigate. Cautiously, she tried the handle ring of the door in as near silence as she could manage. It turned freely, unlocked. She thrust it wide into the room one of her magical daggers raised to hurl and found herself facing an empty and rather dusty room. Yet the noise, much louder now, persisted. This close and clear, it sounded like snoring. It was coming from the solid stone wall of the room to her right. Well now, a secret door or panel she hadn't known about? How many more of those did this palace hold? Cautiously, not hurrying, she examined the wall. The latch, if it had one, would most likely be here. No, or down low, right by the floor level, here, where... Yes. Stone shifted, almost inaudibly. So, well used, and recently and the apparently solid stone swung open like a door. Laryl found herself staring down into a shallow but long-across closet, hung with decaying robes and half-cloaks that had been in style more than a century ago, and tangled up fast asleep on its floor atop their discarded clothes, Mert the moneylender and a lady friend who, judging by the motto tattooed prominently on her bared hip, was a proudly independent dock ward professional. By her face, unfamiliar to Laryl, but a turncoin who evidently displayed her ample self to clients in rather stylish silk and leather, 
Mert was doing the snoring, of course, as they lay sleeping cheek to cheek. Wrapped around each other, they looked obliviously content and disheveled. Laryl felt a grin rising to her face. With a soundless sigh and a rueful shake of her head, she shut the door on them both and headed back down the stair to find Tellfeather, whose expression betrayed nothing when she gave him the location of her find and ordered crisply, Have Mert report to me at dawn tomorrow. I care not if he's dressed or fully awake. Tell him he can have morning feast with me, and there'll be strong drink, or neither eat nor drink within these walls at all on the morrow. She turned away, briefly contemplating leaving the storm armor on, and then shrugged and headed back up to the turret stair, unbuckling as she went. If some assassin's blade was going to find her, it was going to find her. Even enchanted armor of her own design was hot and cumbersome, and she'd rather wear silk and leather. If it was good enough for a dock-front turn coin, it was good enough for her. It was late, deep in what the servants liked to refer to as the wee hours, and Tasheen had just seen Cuthbarrel and Raylan Tauver safely out of her family mansion by way of the haunted door. It had taken her some expensive hired magic over three summers to scare the servants into shunning that dark and damp little back stair and doorway, but it had been worth it. These days they all kept well away from that part of the Sea Shield Hall. Tasheen suspected some of them knew she regularly made use of the disused and crumbling northwestern tower for late-night meetings with her co-conspirators, but frankly she didn't care. Scores of nobles met regularly with guildmasters and wealthy investors and wanted those meetings kept quiet, and if any Malshimber servant was ever bold enough to ask or to say anything about the company she kept at all, She'd icily inquire if they wanted her to be able to find coin enough to keep them employed in the years ahead, when this house would be hers alone. Tashin walked her ancestral home in darkness most nights now, used to the dimness and not wanting to attract attention to her presence in either the tower or the handy upper floor passage that linked it so directly to the row of bedchambers that included her own. That passage had large windows overlooking much of the walled grounds, so a light carried along it would readily catch eyes all over the eastern half of the three tall and sprawling buildings that made up the water Davian seat of the Melshimbers, and she had no desire to have her father frowningly striding around snapping hard questions at servants, trying to find out who'd been carrying a lantern along it in the middle of the night especially since she had good reason to know he was up and about at such hours doing things he'd rather all the rest of Mel Shimber House knew nothing about, and her mother with him. No, Lord Harland Mel Shimber in a real temper was something to be avoided. She'd provoked him often enough to know that all too well. Hopefully she was wiser these days. That thought was dashed away forever by what she saw as she passed one of those high passage windows. Flickering candlelight down in the moonlit grounds, right at the back, as if someone was holding up a multi-branched candelabra to serve as a lantern. Tasheen stopped and stared. Who would be... Thieves weren't fool-headed enough to... A moment later, the bearer of that candelabra came out into the full moonlight to stop at the fountain and wash. It was her father, and right behind him, joining him now and plunging her arms up to the elbows in the fountain's chest-high splash basin, was her mother. They must have come from the tree-cloaked private Melshimber Chapel in the overgrown northwesternmost corner of the walled mansion grounds, which meant... They were now washing off sacrificial blood after a rite. The cult they hosted must have been worshipping. Venerating Asmodeus, Lord of the Nine Hells. Tashin looked down from her dark window at her parents, shaking water from their fingers and laughing together, and felt scorn. Weaklings and degenerates like so many of their generation, 
From her spies, she knew other highborn had their own hidden altars to the lord of Nessus. Oh, it was high time for fresh blood to lead the city, not these decadent old fools who'd strayed so far and sunk so low. Earn your own fate. Don't court it from a dark lord, she hissed, though there was no one but herself in the passage to hear, and then slipped away down the passage to seek her bed. Unseen and unheard, the vengeful wind of the future. Doing her bit to scour water deep of its blemishes and reform it for a stronger, prouder, better era ahead. In the close and familiar darkness of her own bedchamber, Tasheen set all her usual precautions. The suit of armor set to topple on intruders coming through the door by means of a high tripwire, one thin black thread whose rigging she was proud of, for it had been her first success done all on her own. The multiple low trip wires she had added later, all of which pulled boxes of old daggers and maces down on the heads of anyone triggering them, off the high shelves she'd had installed that ran around the inside of the room's walls. And finally, the last set of trip threads that were strung among the pulled-shut draperies of her grand and fluffily feminine four-poster. They triggered the loaded crossbow set up on its tripod on her pillow. There. Done. In the sadly fallen water deep of today, one couldn't be too careful. Tasheen stripped off her clothes where she stood, joined them on the floor, and rolled under the four-poster, where the bed she slept in these last few months awaited her, a thin mattress with the sleeping fur for warmth. It was a hard bed, but she'd grown quite used to it. Out of habit and by feel in the darkness, she checked the contents of the slender coffer slipped inside her pillowcase beneath the goose feather pillow, a handful of steel vials, larand, and healing potions. All there. Nothing had been disturbed. Good. She yawned once, and if she yawned a second time, never remembered doing so, already lost in her swift plunge into oblivion down through a whirling flurry of waiting dreams. Reforming Waterdeep was exhausting work. All done, sir, Hey, Michael said quickly, his gruff voice sounding comically young and feminine when he was fawning. Standing beside him, Glethro kept his eyes on the floor and his face as expressionless as he could. All of our stuff is out and cleaned up. Very good the owner of the building with the false wall and ceiling they'd just finished painting replied in his distinctive voice. It was very deep, and his words unfolded at a plodding, deliberate pace. Come and look at the sign. I'm very pleased with it. Outside in the street, the usual night chill and darkness were held at bay by the lanterns other workers in the crew were holding. Lights that were now raised so the painters and plasterers could clearly see what they were supposed to be admiring over the door. A soft, lustrously glowing silver finish with boldly flowing gilt letters standing proud from it that proclaimed to the world, Fantilver Investments. What it really proclaimed to the world, Glethro thought privately, was, Look how much coin I can waste on a sign like this. I'm rich, look you, rich. Very nice, Hey Michael said eagerly, almost sounding as if he meant it. Handsome indeed, Sayer. It is, their deep-voiced employer agreed. And by way of thanks, I'd like you all to join me next door in Haskolt's Horn. I've laid on a feast, and there's Elverquist. Elverquist? The stuff elves go mad for? Glethro gasped, startled into speech. <laughs> Indeed, the deep-voiced man chuckled. Any of you ever had any? The likes of us can't afford Elverquist, Sayer, Hal Michael replied, shaking his head. So it'll be a rare honor, it will. Thank ye, sir. You're a lord of a client. The building owner chuckled even more heartily. <laughs> Am I? Well, well, that's good to hear. 
It was darker than the inside of a blind woman's womb, and this worn old callishite carpet was as rough as a scrubbing brush under her bare feet. And Thralra never wanted to have to wield a scrubbing brush again. It was high time they replaced it, the entire runner, all down this upstairs passage. Barkeld had refused thrice because he was so tight, coin. But before all the watching gods, they had money enough for a frasted passageway runner. After all, he was a masked lord of Waterdeep. Surely he could... In the darkness, Thralra tripped over something, recovered her balance only after a few frantic running steps that twisted her knee and fetched her up against the nearest passage wall with a curse, then swung around in anger to unhood her night lantern and see whatever she'd fallen over. The maids were getting so... The lantern light spilled down and showed what she'd tripped over, and Thralra discovered in a shocked and breathless instant that she didn't need to breathe to start screaming. She knew that hand, that arm, and the rest of the sprawled body it was attached to, too, though his head was missing, and long, dark fingers of blood were spreading across the floor, well on the way to making the ruination of the detested carpet complete. Markeld Hailing Horse, she sobbed. What have they done to you? Then she started screaming again. Servants were coming from all directions now, running hard, other lanterns flaring out. Markeld, Thrail repeated, as she fell to her knees beside what was left of her husband. What have you done to your head? But somehow, through the shattering depths of her grief, she knew the missing part of Barkeld would be nowhere to be found. And a cruel saying of the streets rose into her mind as loudly and persistently as if all the coarsely laughing dockhands in the world were shouting it lustily at her in sneering unison. The precious hidden lords of our city lose their heads over every trifle they do. It was dark in the alley, in this cold and relatively quiet time just before dawn, but there was just enough light to see how menacing the tall, burly, bald man with the broken nose and scars and missing ear looked. His customary street name, Shrike Gulk, fitted those looks. He looked menacing even when he was snoring peacefully in his sleep. He wasn't sleeping right now. Instead, he was growling, That's the last of them, under his breath, as he shoved a dangling foot back under an old, much-patched sail that had been draped over a cart to serve as a tarpaulin. The foot slipped back into view again, so the one-eared man took firm hold of the leg and shoved hard until the entire heap under the sail shifted. Idiot ceiling carpenters, stubborn even in death. He gave the lumpy shrouded mass a glare that must have impressed the heap, for it stayed right where it was, the foot failing to reappear. Shrike Gulk watched it rather suspiciously for a moment longer, then turned away with a little bark of satisfaction. Thank you, Shrike Gulk, came a deep and plodding voice out of the deeper darkness behind him. Now get them all down into Undermountain before morning. I don't want anyone getting curious and discovering this many poisoned citizens. Not when they all dined in the same place with the same grateful employer. There'll be enough watch interest when Haskolt and all his staff are discovered missing. As the saying so eloquently puts it, the wagging tongue is a deadly sword. Aye, none of them had ever tasted Elverquist. None, nor Rimfan, for that matter. A very effective poison, Shrike Gulk agreed. Well then, we're off, with every last drop of all the drinkables we've found in there, too. Good. Make sure the lads know it's all poisoned so they don't sample, and that the poison is something that'll have decayed into uselessness by morning, leaving just spoiled drink, so it's really not worth stealing for their own nasty purposes. 
You think of everything, Sayer. That's why I'm still alive, Shrike Gulk. Chapter 4 Castles in the Air I down another tankard, let it warm me well, drink weaving its usual memory-flooding spell, and taking me to fancies bright beyond compare, where I am lord of all, ruling castles in the air. From the ballad Down Another Tankard by the minstrel Cardella Havrith, published in the Year of Lost Ships. What by all the kisses of the love goddess is that? Dundermer was drunk enough to weave and stumble as they walked along the worn and uneven cobbles of Ship Street in search of a tavern that hadn't just run out of Scoggin Sour, but there was nothing at all wrong with his eyesight. The man beside him, who was carefully not calling himself Volo save when putting Quill to parchment, peered up along Dundemer's non-too-steady arm. In this dark and chilly tail end of night, there were fewer lanterns ablaze on the docks than usual. The mist shore blaze had freed scores of hulks to drift underwater, imperiling ships both moored and underway, so loading was only going on at the southernmost docks. Yet there were still plenty of stars on this relatively cloudless night, and over the great dark shoulder of Mount Waterdeep, something was blotting them out. Something big. A cloud as dark and solid as a flagstone, and atop it, a castle. Stern, thick towers, both square and round. A real fortress, not a pretty thing of soaring turrets and pennants. Dark and lightless, silent and foreboding, and moving. Drifting slowly, very slowly, landwards. A shout from down the street marked someone else's noticing it. Doc Ward was awake at all hours, and there were others walking rather than busily loading and unloading. Volo cast a quick glance down the street to make sure danger wasn't nigh, or a watch patrol. Watch guards were apt to be full of awkward questions they wanted prompt answers to then looked up at the castle in the sky again. A cloud castle, just like in the tales. Well now, said Dundermer to no one at all. Well now. And the stonemason started walking again. Thirst is a strong goad for a habitual drinker. Volo fell into step with him. Dundermer had coin enough to pay for tankards for them both, was pleasant enough company and when sufficiently slaked, tended to let fall all sorts of interesting gossip that a man with a talent for a quip or a little invention could spin into truly salacious broadsheet fodder. The apparition in the sky was causing a stir. Yon'll be the work of the lady, the man who'd shouted was busily telling some friends who'd spilled out of a tavern at his shout. Our new open lord! Stands to reason she'll start using magic on us from a fortress above our heads, or wants her own luxury digs up in the air where she don't have to pay taxes. Where do the chamber pots empty? That's what I want to know, one of those friends said suspiciously, squinting up at the castle. That, Volo muttered under his breath, is the least I want to know. Even when she could find sleep, Vajra had recently acquired a nasty habit of coming suddenly awake, alert and breathing hard, and bewildered as to why. This time, sitting bolt upright in the gloom, she felt a pulse of magical warmth from the black staff under her hand. Something had goaded it into wakefulness of a sort. Snatching it out from under the bed linens, she padded quickly down the stairs to the room below turned to the large and intricate map of the sewers that adorned one arc of its wall, and tapped it with the staff. Kelbin's old but solidly reliable magic obediently awakened, showing her the usual view of Dock Ward from on high. It was always wisest to look for trouble in Dock Ward first. There were plenty of folk on the streets, of course, but a lot of them were standing in little knots and clusters staring up at something, at the same something, 
over that way. It was Mr. Forfend, a cloud castle. Vajra hurried down the stairs. There were robes and boots by the doors she could snatch on ere stepping outside to point the staff at the apparition and make sure it wasn't merely someone's elaborate illusion. Somehow, still two floors above getting outside, she already knew it wasn't. Things were just never that easy these days. Laryl sat and scratched. Those buckles had left itches behind. She hadn't been wearing armor all that often lately, and her usually sleek hide was reminding her of that. She sipped more wyvern scale tea, deep green and spicy and just the way she liked it, almost an echo of the turtle soup Luce liked so much, and a wonderful soother when trying to call up memories and sort out thoughts. There was something one of the hidden lords had said to another across the Lord Smoot more than a ten-day back while she'd been talking with another lord, something not meant for her ears that she'd nonetheless heard and told herself to remember for later. Well, it was later now, specifically one of the few moments she'd get that wouldn't have courtiers and servants awake and bustling in to interrupt her every few breaths. So if she was going to recall things and really think about them, Tolver, it had been Tolver, that fat toad of a man, capable, no doubt, shrewd in ways useful to the city, yet still a toad. He'd been talking to Gwelt. Usual place? No, below. It'll take time, always does, to hide it all over Miss Chore. So whatever it was, smuggling of some sort probably to evade palace taxes or guild control and prices of something in bulk, it was probably ashes now. Which meant, if she knew men like Tolver at all, and she'd outlived so many, that he'd want to talk to Gwelt. Nay, need to talk to Gwelt. She was probably too late, but... Laryl stood up dug into the tiny pouch on her sash for the wisp of bat fur she'd need, murmured the incantation, gingerly touched the fur to both eyeballs, and let her arcane eye move out and away. Sinking into the weave, she guided it faster than she'd otherwise have been able to. Tolver lived not far from the palace, up the street of Bells. There, the house wherein a light had just gone out in a high window. So was he settling down to snore, or... Before her little flying eye had time to rise to that window, a rear door opened and a stout man in a night cloak strode out, threaded his way through the garden and through his garden gate. Bodyguards rose from dozing in garden seats to take up stations in front and behind their employer. The trio headed briskly south. Doc Ward? And just what sort of legitimate business would a hidden lord of the city, whose public coins came as rents from castle and north ward premises, have at this hour? In such haste, too. The three men turned down Snail Street, so yes, Dock Ward. Laryl drew her eye in closer and dropped it down to hip level just behind the rear guard. Just as Tolver stepped abruptly into a dark doorway between two shop fronts, an entrance that led to dwellings on the floors above those shops, these were probably buildings he owned, and there'd be a steep stair inside that door. There was, but as the rear guard stepped through the door and locked it behind him, the foreguard did something to those steps, and four of them swung up and out like a door to reveal a dark opening, downwards onto a lightless landing. The bodyguard felt around in that darkness, drew out a stout storm lantern, lit it with ease, and handed it to Tolver, who stepped past him without a word and descended, not waiting for the two guards to follow and close the hatch. Laryl took a long, slow sip of tea, closed her eyes to concentrate on what her distant ocular was seeing, and followed the Lord with the lantern. Down, down into fresh mystery. 
The castle was real, all right. And huge. It loomed up ahead of her, dark and silent. Vajra willed the Blackstaff to drink in magic in case hostile lightning or some sort of unseen warding awaited her, but she flew on and nothing came. She slowed, drifting up to the arch-topped front door. It stood open, vast and dark, and opening so high that a walking statue could have strolled through without ducking its head. Holding up the staff in case death awaited, Vajra went in. Into soft and deepening silence, in a chamber that was vast, and opened into larger, darker ones on either side. All around her soared walls of moisture-beaded stone, of a smoky and somehow roiling hue, like storm clouds that rose to lofty vaultings she could barely see overhead. Well met, Vajra called as calmly as she could. Her raised voice didn't roll away from her nor echo. It was swallowed up as if the air were made of velvet. She descended to the floor, gigantic flagstones of irregular shape, yet as smooth as unpolished marble. She grounded the black staff, and it flashed to indicate powerful magic in what it touched, but struck with scarcely a sound, and no echo at all. She rose again to hover, looking around. On all sides, huge, dark spaces, the thick air sharp with a scent she knew. The same iron tang she'd smelled before in the wake of lightning strikes. Was it growing stronger, building to something, or just seeming stronger now that she'd identified it? She was being watched. She could feel it. She spun around in the air with all the flashing speed she could muster and found herself gazing only at mist, a little drifting mist. Of course, cloud giants could become mist. Know you, she announced boldly, that this city stands not unguarded. She turned in the air as she said that, half expecting something to come racing at her out of the darkness, even if it was only a spear. A giant's spear might be half as long as Augarin's tower stood tall, mind you, and thick enough to tear her in half rather than make a hole through her. Who are you? A voice came to her out of the distant darkness around a corner. It was soft but deep, so deep it shook her teeth. More curious than sharp, thank Mistra and all the gods for small things. Vajra swallowed and headed for where the voice seemed to have come from. Around that corner was another huge dark room, a deep void of dark emptiness and more eddying mists, a lot of mist, like receding columns of smoke. And beyond the mists, something more. As if her scrutiny had been a signal, a wan radiance kindled in the air around that something, revealing it to be a huge... Sculpture, if sculpture was the right word. She was looking at an intricate assembly of gold coins the size of dinner plates, strung on fine wires to form spiraling intertwined strands in a great air-filling column of curly cues. Vajra peered all around. Lots of mist, but no giants showed themselves. I am the Black Staff, she answered the empty air, the Lady Mage of Waterdeep, guardian of the City of Splendors. And she hefted the fragment of the Black Staff and made it glow. Interestingly, it chose to glow with a black radiance and throbbed with an energy she'd never felt before. Somewhere in the darkness she heard an indrawn breath. The staff had made someone apprehensive. So, she called, why are you here? Why does any merchant come to Waterdeep? Calmer than she was and a shade short of insolence. You've come here to trade? Vajra demanded. Only to trade? There came no reply. Vajra tried again several times, but got only silence so she flew back to the high entry hall inside the open door 
and backed into the doorway itself. Your intrusion, she announced sternly, is neither welcome nor lawful. As guardian of Waterdeep, I say you must depart or be destroyed. Then she whirled around and flew away, swift and dodging back and forth as she descended in case anything pursued her. Nothing did. Rounding the dark shoulder of Mount Waterdeep seething, she sought the palace to report to Laryl. Tolver and his lantern descended alone, leaving his bodyguards behind. Laryl kept her eye close to the stone ceiling, which grew colder and damper and more noisome with the lord's every step. The cellar at the bottom of the steps was dank, reeking of mildew and littered with spongy rotten old boards and splinters, the litter of crates torn apart a decade ago. The walls were of stone black with mold, interspersed with wood that was already mostly mold. Tolver laid a hand on a nailed crosspiece, turned it, and the door it had been holding shut groaned open to reveal light and a handsome man. Laryl recognized Amisker Gwelt by his sly smile, even before she saw the rest of him, sitting on a rickety chair with a half-clad woman in his lap. The woman scrambled up in an instant and was gone out the other door, leaving Gwelt barely time to slap her behind as she departed. Tolver frowned. You let some low-coin lass know our meeting place? This is where she lives when we're not meeting here, Tolver. Don't you even know your own tenants? Tolver shrugged. I know their coins, that's enough. Gwelt shook his head. Not wise, friend, not in Waterdeep. Here, details matter. I prosper well enough. I was thinking of survival, not prosperity, Gwelt replied. As in, we masked lords keeping hold of our own lives a little longer. Tolver shrugged again. We all die, it's just a matter of when. Yes, when, as in now, or has it escaped you that three of us have been murdered in as many days? Three? Two I know of, but some woman was running down the street screaming as I walked here. Hailing Horse has been found with his head hacked off. Ye gods! I thought it was never ember getting even, but he and Hailing Horse were laugh tankards together. So who... That's why I wanted to meet with you. Try this thought. Perhaps it's the Lady Laryl killing off lords, hmm? She gets installed in the palace and we start to die, one after another. So, what shall we do? Ah, there you have me. We could flee the city, but that just puts our peril off for a time. Or we could hole up in the best fortresses we can devise here in the deep and conduct our business through our subordinates, but... But, Tolver agreed glumly, if we retreat from the daily cut and thrust of mercantile dealings, we'll lose much. Is the risk that great? It was Gwelt's turn to shrug. I'm not living like a rat when I've gotten used to prowling like a lion. And I suspect that'll hold true for most of us. Our greed will win out overall, as it usually does. Oh, there'll be a few fearfuls, but most of us will be damned if we'll let some mysterious killer drive us behind walls to cower. Her spell ended abruptly, leaving Laryl reeling and blinking at spell smoke. What had done that? Neither of those two lords mastered any art, and... The black staff shone darkly in front of her eyes. She looked up to meet the eyes of the woman who held it. Vajra was excited. No, angry. Where were you? the black staff demanded. Off being a lord, Laryl told her. I don't just sit sipping tea on a throne day and night, you know. What news? You didn't notice the castle floating in the air just outside the harbor? Vajra was incredulous. The giants wouldn't even show themselves or answer my questions. I need you to come with me and rouse the watchful order so we can have a strike force ready before daybreak. What? 
Laryl shot up from the table, upsetting her tea but catching the mug before it could hit the table. Did they attack you? No, but then we do not rush to make war on them. At dawn, you can call on the order to discuss defending the deep against any attack, when it comes. We will not start a war in the air above the city without provocation. But, Vajra, Laryl said firmly, do you hear me? No rush to attack. I forbid you from doing any such thing. The black staff's eyes caught fire. But, but we can blast them, and should, to deter anyone else from feeling they can just show up above us unannounced and to show the deep how strongly we safeguard them. How firm your rule is. It's not my rule, Laryl snapped, really angry now, and we should not just blast them. I am not the tyrant of Waterdeep, and won't try to be. My role is to keep the fractious citizenry of the Deep working and living together, not to be their tyrant and scare them all into chanting my causes and standing to attention when I stride into rooms. She started to pace, but quelled herself in mid-step to whirl around and tell Vadra severely, and if there's one thing I've learned as my centuries have unfolded, it's that hurling down towers with spells just because you can creates problems. It doesn't solve them. You may reduce one arrogant foe to a stain on a wall, but he will have a family or allies or both, and somehow you will almost always have made things worse, not better. Life is not as neat and simple as a big decisive battle that ends a chapbook followed by everything sliding into a tidy resolution. Vajra started to pace and throw her arms about. So you're just going to leave our city undefended until the giants fly into the heart of it and start raiding and smashing like the dragons did? A giant, Laryl snarled, is not a dragon. Did you bother to find out why they were here? They gave me only a question about merchants by way of answer, said Vajra stiffly, and would say no more. I informed them that this city was not undefended, that their intrusion was neither welcome nor lawful, and that they must depart or be attacked. They turned to mist and refused to speak to me or confront me, so I rushed back here. Then I advise you to rush to Blackstaff Tower and seek calm, Laryl said heavily, while I go and see the giants myself. If I call for help or return not by high sun, come running. But until then, please do not muster the watch or the order or anyone else. Gather a few friends among the order and discuss possible battle plans if you must. But don't raise the alarm and ready everyone for war. Vajra looked back at her unhappily. What? Laryl asked more gently. You disagree with me, yes? It's not that, Vajra whispered. It's... I don't have any friends in the order, if you must know. And she whirled around and strode out of the room, the door banging in her wake. Laryl sighed, muttered, Color me unsurprised, under her breath, and ran to where palace magic was cast. She'd need a rod of absorption and wings of flying, at least. The slow and patient rhythm of dripping water echoed strangely in this lightless backwater of the sewers, punctuating the harsh and hissing words of Undercommon. The Xanathar, like most beholders, had an unpleasantly fluid voice, like a human's oily with phlegm, and the Mind Flayer's speaking stone lent the Sothul's silently thought replies a distinctive snide nasal whistling drone. His plot lacks subtlety, the beholder observed. Perhaps he believes himself unassailable. From what I've heard come from his lips, I agree, the illithid thought. So we let him proceed unhindered? We do. His bumblings will alarm the city and distract watch and palace attention from my awakening of Skullport and from the Gentarum, as they make the last and necessarily unsubtle moves to establish their dominance over certain nobles and guilds. 
The Lady Silver Hand can hardly ignore a string of murders among her fellow lords, the Mind Flayer cautioned. Of course not, Sathul, but Cassandra is so politically powerful that he just may be untouchable. If his wizardly allies can stand up to Leraw, we may see some impressive carnage among the ranks of the lords before he's stopped. Hired mages withstand a chosen of Mistra. Does Water Deep truly harbor arch wizards stronger than one of the seven? That I've never noticed. It has long been my secret belief, the large and crookedly smiling beholder replied, that most of the so-called chosen, including Leral, are bluffers rather than truly mighty spell hurlers. I hope you're right. So, the Xanathar said dryly, do I. I can advance your causes best if I understand you fully, the Illithid ventured cautiously. The Gentarum won't be the Gentarum if they don't lash out at you, and probably sooner rather than later. An assessment with which I concur, the Eye Tyrant replied. Yet I seek to encourage the Gentarum for now. My own success over the longer term currently depends, I believe, on what humans like to call fading into the background. In my case, behind a new layer of public enemies in Waterdeep, Cassander and his fledgling organization, and behind them the Gentarum. Our zealous new open lord can occupy herself making war on them. By helping the Gentarum now, I'll learn who is a Gent agent and what they're all up to. And if they grow too strong to tolerate Cassander, or you? Their skirmishes with Leral will weaken them and keep her busy so she doesn't continue to work her way through my agents. So when the inevitable clashes come between my operatives and the Gents, the Gentarum will be much weaker than they would be otherwise. So you would most want me to assist in this how, exactly? Bring the bodies of Cassander's victims to me, every last smear of them, blood and all. Whenever that's not possible, all traces are to be burned or washed away beyond finding. Taking to a little necromancy? No, preventing it. The slain lords must disappear forever so they cannot return from the dead. Neither the gents nor Leral may be above bringing back those who will be their puppets. Bring them to where I can... The beholder rose and turned with alarming speed. A ray shot out from one of its eye stalks at what its bulk had hitherto been hiding. A cage with a naked and cowering man inside it. In a mere sighing moment, the cage and its contents were a slumping pile of gray dust. Serve them thus. That palace courtier was foolish enough to betray me to the Gentarum. That lesson is not lost on me, Sathul made his speaking stone say calmly. Of course not, the Xanathar smiled. For now, you and Belvara encourage and aid Cassander, who is showing signs of being capable and not merely malicious, and let us see what a toll he can take before he meets his doom, while my agents lie low and enjoy the entertainment. I should begin, Leral said calmly, by apologizing for the aggressiveness of the guardian mage who visited you earlier. I am not here for a fight. I'm here because my duty as open lord of Waterdeep compels me to seek reassurance as to the reasons for your presence. Six wary columns of mist had surrounded her, and the largest now coalesced into a muscular man like Leviathan, barefoot and in robes, his hair and tufted eyebrows as silver as her own. He was empty-handed and did not look angry. 
Burled am I, master of this castle, he said gravely. We know of you, chosen of Mistra, and we court no dispute with you or with your city. Let me show you why we are here, for words are often empty and almost as often disbelieved. The columns of mist led the way through an open archway, ushering her to precede him like any high house door jack. The cloud giant followed. He conducted her through a room and around a corner into a large chamber where what looked like Burl's family, a giantess, a younger giant, and two young giantesses, were all hard at work. What looked like long-barreled telescopes sloped down and out through ports in the walls. As Laryl watched, one of the young giantesses drew one back to make an adjustment to a metal frame around its maw. It emitted a thin beam of light. In the center of the room was a table that would have had room enough for a small dockward city block to stand on it, and the other giants were riding down what the open lord could tell were triangulating measurements, and then carefully drawing features on a vast map in the making that underlay the parchments littered across the table. She peered hard while trying not to seem to be doing so. The precise location and extent of Mount Waterdeep and the shape of the nearby shoreline seemed to be their chief interest, not the buildings and streets of the city. At least yet, Burled was watching her closely. You're seeking something, Laryl said. What? You have your secrets of state and we have ours, the giant replied gravely. We obey the commands of King Skyvald and are here at his behest. Laryl faced him and said quietly, As open lord of Waterdeep, I defend Waterdeep. I must know what you seek. We seek who, not what. Princess Eerie, the daughter of King Skyvald. So we would be most grateful, open Lord Laryl Silverhand, if you would tell us. Are there any storm giantesses, or beings who might well be disguised storm giantesses, free or captive, in your city? Not that I've noticed, and I see, or others see for me, many things. Our gratitude would deepen, lady, if you did pass on to us even a hint of such a sighting if one should come to your ears ere we depart. I can and shall do that, Laryl declared. So, as we're being candid, when might that departure be? When our maps are done. Less than a ten day, we shall freely furnish you with the copy of our completed map of your city. Such a thing might be valuable to anyone planning to attack Waterdeep, Laryl observed softly. Were we planning an assault, we would have struck swift and hard upon our arrival, not given Waterdeep's defenders time to muster. Nor have we need of sly trickery, when by force of arms we could prevail. So rest assured we shall not attack nor knowingly aid anyone planning hostilities. Our maps are not sold, nor are they given or bartered to those not of our kind. Reports have come to me of a giant crude ship seen ramming and sinking merchant cogs off Mintarn, Laryl said, even more softly, so you will understand my wariness regarding map-making. Any good ruler is wary of many things, yet I assure you no cloud giant would be sailing a ship upon the waves when we can keep to the air. Had that ship sails rhymed with frost? I take your point. Burled extended a long and heavily muscled arm in the direction of the harbor. We've seen recurring building fires along the northern shore of your inner harbor. Perhaps in lieu of docking fees, we could help with that. How so? Weather magic, precisely applied. Laryl regarded him thoughtfully. 
The permanently moored ships, mist shore, are done burning. Most burned to the water line, and the underwater hulks will have to be cleared away before they start drifting about the harbor below the waves and become real hazards to shipping. But a good soaking rain on the dock ward adjoining where Mist Shore was wouldn't come amiss. Several roofs have smoldered and then flared up, and more may well follow. Just a day's worth, then, the cloud giant offered. Laryl gave him a smile. Be welcome, then. She sliced her own palm with the small fingernail of her other hand that she always kept clipped to a sharp point, and as a drop of blood welled up, she extended that hand for the traditional forearm clasp of trusting giants. Burled smiled back at her and did the same. His grasp was firm. Chapter 5 Lording it over a city of vipers. I'd rather brave the fiercest storms, shipwreck, fire, treachery, and serpents of the sea than be a fancy-booted ruler ashore, lording it over a city of vipers, foul, stinking, and false. Declaration of the Pirate Wise Knight, reported in Black Blades at Sunset, Ten Years a Pirate, by Vardrella Blood Maiden Blaudel. Published in the Year of the Wrathful Eye. If anything, the slightest hint of giants or disguised giants, a giantess in particular, and she may be disguised or a captive or both, reaches your ears, I want you to inform me at once, Lerol instructed the two senior courtiers. They nodded, bowed, and smoothly withdrew parting as they went to avoid bumping into a rotund and far less dapper figure. Merry morning, Feast Lair, it greeted her cheerfully, lurching into the room. Laryl gave him a grin. Well, some people in this palace this morning had no shame. Sleep well, she teased, passing him the platter of crispy fried boar thin slice to stop him just upending it onto the waiting plate in front of him. Mert chuckled. I had the best pillows. If only some inquisitive person hadn't come along and opened the closet door and let a cold draft in. He gave her a meaningful look and upended the contents of the thin slice platter onto his plate. You prefer the morning feast of rampant champions, I see, she remarked tartly, handing him the platter of soft-steamed goose-egg golden eyes to see what he'd do with it. He calmly upended it atop his steaming heap of boar, then peered around the table. There a sudden shortage of ale in this city? Not that I've noticed, Laryl told him dryly, pulling the bell pull that would bring a servant. A manservant, thank the gods. Fetch the Lord Mert whatever drinkables he wants, she said gently, a mere moment later. Mist on the harbor, the man must have been hovering just outside the doorway. To eavesdrop, most likely. Your darkest ale, five tall tankards of it, and full, mind, and then clear off, so me and the Lady Silverhand can be private. Mert then added a leer and the words, If you take my meaning. Laryl kept her face carefully expressionless and hoped she wasn't blushing in the slightest as the servant shot her a startled glance. With a firm look she directed him toward the cellar, then turned her attention to the senior lord of Waterdeep. Playing the boor all too well he might be this morning, but she had invited him. So he growled across the table as he borrowed the soup ladle to scoop up four golden eyes at once. You probably figured out by now that Elminster gave me orders to stick close to you, to rush to your aid if need be, and play the swaggering bodyguard when you had need of such, and be your fetch and carry scut to keep you from poking your own nose into real danger, down back alleys in Dock Ward, for instance. I think you need the likes of me like you need extra toes, but 
Any ruler can use extra feet and hands and eyes to handle all the claptrap, even if it's just to toss half the paperwork sent your way into the nearest fire. So, Laurel, throw me out if you've a mind to, but you'd be wiser to put me to use. I can pen a mean thrust your dagger up your own letter, and I'm pretty good at harassing folk, like, say, anyone who tries to stalk you. Laurel opened her mouth to reply and then paused, fascinated, to watch Mert tilt the ladle and slide all four golden eyes into his mouth at once. For one horrible moment, she thought he was going to tilt his head back and let the round half-fried eggs slide right down his gullet hole, but instead he forced them out into his cheeks, bit down, and acquired a dreamy look of bliss. That faded as he thrust out his hand for a tall tankard of ale to rinse his mouth and throat out and discovered there wasn't one. The servant hadn't returned with any ale yet. He swallowed with an effort, plunged a hand into the deepest pile of thin slice on his platter, plucked up dripping roast boar into a ball, shoved it into his mouth and started to chew, saying through it, Laryl winced as grease sprayed everywhere. There is a shortage of air in the deep, must be. Or that lazy haunch has gotten lost on his way back from the nearest keg. I dare say, Laryl agreed. A tragedy, to be sure. And Mert, throwing you anywhere was very far from my mind. I need you to be my bodyguard and envoy and harasser of those I want harassed. So I thank you, and you are welcome here in the palace. And your mansion remains, so far as I am concerned, your own. You'll find I didn't do much more than bathe a time or two and hang up all of those clothes you saw. And by all means, take rooms here. But really, if you must bring ladies to share a bed with you, make it a bed and not a closet floor. Have a care for their backs. And yours, for that matter. Ah, uh, I, I'll do that. We were rather tipsy and in some haste when the, uh, mood overtook us both at the same opportune moment, if you take my meaning. I do, Laryl assured him fondly, and you didn't break any furniture or upset any of the guards or servants, so I've no complaints. She found her way out again, I trust? Mert nodded was a little upset with me for costing her what she might have made for the rest of the night, but she was asleep before me, needed it badly, the poor lass. He scooped up six golden eyes at once this time, and again Laryl paused to watch in utter fascination. Would nothing choke the man? Mert caught her watching, gave her a broad and golden grin, and informed her, I have been known to dive into... Vats of food, here in the palace kitchens back in Pier Girin's day, and just eat what I could reach. Cut out the middle jack, so to speak. He caught up a good fistful of glistening with grease thin slice and waved it at her like a king wagging a disapproving scepter and added, But enough about me. Surely my sins are old news to you by now. If I'm to help you in even the most paltry way, I should know what you're up to just now. The meaningful crises of your lordship, as opposed to all the signing and diplomatic empty tongue-wagging and saluting and waving. So spill. Laryl gave him a real smile, then paused as the servant bustled in with the requested five tall tankards and a chilled tall flask of Sandretha for her. She thanked the man soundlessly for remembering her preferences from two mornings earlier, and then saluted Mert with her first glass of the pale blue wine. I shall. The latest little crisis that's landed in my lap came literally out of the blue yester eve. Just the other side of Mount Waterdeep, a cloud giant's castle has appeared, hovering due west of Harbor Watch Tower about two bowshots out to sea. So now we have fearful sailors refusing to sail past it, which means we have angry shippers and ship owners demanding the watchful order see off the giant. Oh, hi, Mert said dryly, or as dryly as anyone could say anything around a ball of wadded-up thin slice as large as his fist. 
We both know how well the watchful order likes to be told what to do, by open lords as much as angry just plain citizens. Tis obviously time to re-found the Griffin cavalry. What with raiding dragons flying down into the deep, and now this. Beryl was unable to keep the twinkle entirely out of her eyes as she pounced. That, she said crisply, is a great idea. Mert, I'm so glad you volunteered to refound the Griffin cavalry. You're perfectly suited to ride roughshod over all who'll... She got that far before Mert's increasingly thunderous protests of, No, no, oh, no, oh, no, a thousand times, no, drowned her out. She regarded him with the sweet smile on her face as he reeled in his seat, visibly dismayed, and then consoled himself by running his ladle the length of his platter and dredging up a dripping heap of mingled thin slice and golden eyes, shoving it all into his mouth in one titanic mess, then snatching up and downing an entire tall tankard in one long pull that sluiced his mouthful down inside. Shall I ask the servants to fetch in a larger trough? she inquired gently. But Mert was on his second tall tankard and waving away her words with one pudgy hand. When he came up for air at last, gasping, it was to launch himself into a swift flurry of speech. Nay, lady, not me. I'm not the man you seek. Better you make a noble and guildmaster work together on this refounding to show the rest it can be done and to get them used to talking with each other rather than about each other. But in the meantime, use the need to refound the Griffins as a delaying tactic in dealing with your fulminating sailors and shippers until you can find a good opportunity to talk with the Cloud Giant. Laryl nodded. Agreed. You have done this before, haven't you? Mert made a flourish of both hands in mimicry of a deep courtier's bow and caught up another tall tankard to drain it. However, Laryl added, and he chuckled. <laughs> now, why did I just know there was going to be a however? However, Laryl went on, reaching for her wine, Refounding the Griffins is going to take some time, and we have needs that must be met right now. Perhaps I need to hire some adventurers, covertly, of course. Mert snorted. Covert? Like that lot who showed up at the mansion for you the other night? He reached for another tall tankard. But I, of course you do. So I'll go out and take a good look at who we might wind up with if we go hiring. If things get worse, we may not be able to afford to be all that choosy, Laryl warned. Oh, you say, Mert retorted. Why don't we refound Force Gray or the Gray Hands or whatever they're best called while we're at it? Laryl lofted an eyebrow. Easily said, but less easily done. Folk that powerful are a weapon that can turn on the wielder swiftly indeed, if they aren't unshakably loyal. That loyalty will take much time to forge. Mert set down his drink, face somber, and said quietly, Lady, there was a part of me that very much wanted to refuse when Elminster bade me come here with him. He said I would be needed, but my water deep is the deep of a century ago. Part of me wanted to cling to that, to hold to my memory so I could pretend my Asper was still alive. All the shopkeepers I traded jests with, my old rivals, and... He waved a hand as if to sweep many memories away, and then said more briskly, Yet I found I couldn't stay away. I had to be back here again, to smell the salt air and the smoke of thousands of chimneys, to be home. No matter how much home has changed while my back was turned. So here I am. I was no diplomat back in the old days, and I'm certainly not one now in a city that's forgotten me or knows me only from wild old tales of my worst misbehavior. What I know about the deep is more than a hundred years out of date, but... I was waiting for that but, Laryl told him softly. But some things, 
where alleys run, old feuds and rivalries, the skeletons in certain closets don't change all that much. The back rooms, the alleys, the corners where shady work is talked over. They're my world, where one glimpse of you approaching will shut mouths and make men drift back into the shadows. So I hear things. Just in the brief time I was, uh, foraging. Laryl supplied helpfully. Foraging, Mert agreed with a grin. I learned some things. The gents are growing more numerous in the city these last few seasons, skulking so the watch won't notice, but there are more and more of them, and they're settling in, buying businesses, becoming landlords, taking their places. That I've noticed myself, Laryl agreed. Deeds and contracts and purchase agreements may be less exciting than dark alleys and dark back rooms, but they hold their own revelations. Mert nodded. I've confirmed something that was a suspicion of mine a century back, too. The Xanathar. The Xanathar, our resident beholder crime lord, not very far beneath the city. Busy in Skullport right now, I believe, Laryl responded. What of the Xanathar? I know now for certain that the Xanathar is a post or title taken by one eye tyrant after another, not a lone and long-lived beholder. We chosen have known as much for centuries, Laryl said gently. Hallister found having such a distraction very useful in... Two men burst into the room striding fast and snapped to attention even before Mert could snatch up a morning feast knife to hurl. It was Seneschal Talon Tellfeather of the palace, and right behind him a grim and grizzled watch officer in full armor that bore the insignia of a guard sword. Lady, I apologize for the interruption, Tellfeather said smoothly, but this is Hawkguard of the watch with news he informs me cannot wait. Then proceed, Laryl urged, giving the guard sword her full attention. Lady, the veteran said gravely, I beg leave to report to you that another lord of the city has been murdered. Bark held Hailing Horse at his home last night, beheaded, and the head carried off. No one saw his slayers, and we have as yet no idea who they were. Thus far, the watchful order's best efforts have yielded nothing. But they are still at their castings. I came straight here to inform you. The news is spreading fast, and the people are in an uproar. Three hidden lords down now. Laryl murmured. I fear, Hawkguard added grimly, that the city is on the verge of erupting into a tumult of killings and response killings. Laryl nodded. So, she said quietly, am I. Your nose? What's wrong with your nose? Plenty, some say, and I've broken this hawk beak a time or three, but tis the one I was born with, Elminster replied, reaching out to catch Morden Canaan's wrist. The Archwizard of Earth stared back at him, wild-eyed, then blurted out, Such brightness! Twas blinding! Blinding! I scarce— He broke off into barking like a dog, then a swift and frantic panting as Elminster wrestled him back against the nearest wall and held him there. This should be over soon. Morden Canaan still flared up into ravings often, but they were less and less frequent and lasted for ever shorter periods. Thank Mistra. She watches us, Morden Canaan roared suddenly, right into El's face as he erupted into a fierce struggle to be free of El's grip. As gleeful as the dead king lording it over his city of vipers as they glide through the jaws and empty eye sockets of countless skulls. She watches us, I tell you. So you do. El agreed calmly, holding the raving wizard against the wall with some difficulty. The man was strong, which usually means it's time for some more tea. Tea? Morden Canaan erupted with a string of swift profanity in which profound dislike of tea in any form was prominent, and that colorfully suggested several energetic ways in which tea could be forcibly introduced inside various tender and private areas of Elminster's anatomy, and how many dragons and slithering monsters and many-headed slimy creepy things he could enlist to help him apply tea to Elminster's most sensitive internal areas. 
And then he went silent, in mid-word, and stared at nothing, his lower jaw flapping loosely and then hanging limply, his tongue falling down to keep it company. Elminster held the burly archmage of earth against the wall for long enough to catch his own breath, and then led the oblivious and staring Morden Canaan across the room to a high-backed padded bed and sat him on it. Storm Silverhand was curled up on the other end of that bed and had been frowningly watching the wizard's eruption. When Morden Canaan's distant gaze moved across her, he refocused, blinked, and said to her, But, but you're a woman. Storm followed his gaze down to her ample breasts and then raised her eyes to meet his and said mildly, Why, so I am. That explains a lot of things. Morden Canaan looked bewildered. I, uh, it does? Elminster rolled his eyes at Storm from behind Morden Canaan, and she replied with a gentle, Sorry, not helping, am I? El shook his head. Daren't use the weave to try to heal, he murmured, pointing at Morden Canaan's head, but he's doing it himself. He helped settle the Wizard of Earth into position, propped up against a small mountain of pillows, and said soothingly, I've found an interesting book I'd like your opinion on, old friend. Here, have a look. From under the bed he drew forth a large, shining, heavy tome, opened it to the first page, and put it into seated wizard's hands. Morden Canaan leaned forward eagerly, eyes lighting up like lanterns, and moved his fingers along the lines of writing and symbols without quite touching them. What is that, L? Storm murmured in Elminster's ear. Metal pages and an alloy I don't recognize, and I've seen more than my share of metals down the centuries. L put the tip of one finger delicately into her nearest ear and through that link thought, an old Netherese tome. Many of the spells are flawed. Twas bound away with Telemont's childhood things. If this is the sort of magic he learned, that explains much. Storm shook her head rather grimly and thought back, and if Morden Canaan learns the wrong spell from it and starts blasting things, what then? I doubt he will, El thought. But if he does, I'll just have to stop him. Oh, what if he starts his blasting with you? Ah, lass, ye say the most helpful things, El replied fondly. By way of reply, Storm pointed silently. He turned to see what she was pointing at, and beheld Morden Canaan, the Thultanthan tome set aside, down on the floor, peering under the bed in the spot where El had hidden the book. The Wizard of Earth seemed to be trying to see if there were any more books under there. Elminster looked back at Storm and gave her a shrug and a rueful grin, and Storm flung her arms around him and kissed him. Her mouth was as warm and sweet as ever, and El lost himself in her for a few blissful moments before she gently disengaged herself and said warningly, I must get back to my work. You be careful now. Neither Toril nor I need yonder archmage to be happy, but we both need you for our happiness, even if most of Toril doesn't know it. What? Elminster protested. Start being careful after all these centuries? Blass, I don't know how. In reply, Storm turned back to face him, a bare stride before she entered the glowing gate she'd just made visible with a wave of her hand and demonstrated that she knew at least one of the looter hand gestures currently in vogue in the streets, taverns, and clubs of Waterdeep, and could perform it with a deft and insolent flourish. The Lord's Moot was one of the most impressive rooms in the palace. It lacked the soaring ceilings of the main central rooms of state, but was large enough to have quite a roomy open space all around its central wooden table an oval expanse of gleamingly polished wood that could seat twenty-nine. Laryl had no idea if Waterdeep had ever had that many lords at any one time, but she knew a full roster count of masked lords these days was twenty. 
No more than sixteen ever customarily assembled in public fully masked, so most of the populace of Waterdeep knew there were only sixteen hidden lords. Like every open lord, she was supposed to know who they all truly were behind their masks, and the sixteen lords who'd attended her induction had shown her a roster list of all twenty. She was fairly sure that list had been honest and complete, but only fairly. Most lords of Waterdeep knew each other's identities, but there were and had always been a few who loved their privacy. That handful kept their selves secret to all but the open lord and perhaps one or two of their fellow lords. Right now, most of the identical seats around the table were empty. It was clear that one seat flanked by empty spaces immediately on either side of it rather than chairs was intended for her. Nine lords had already taken seats across from it, faces hidden behind their identical impassive masks, which were not really masks at all, but full metal war helms with impressive outthrust two-tiered armored collars and mere arrays of holes to see, hear, and breathe through. Enchantments on those masks turned back many spells and altered the voices of all wearers into slightly buzzing, echoing low tones. Yet despite the mask's enchantments, she thought she knew most of the nine who faced her now by their gestures, their gaits as they'd walked in, and the way they held themselves. That lean, tallish one on the right was Landarman Vosker, a wealthy ship fleet owner and investor in properties up and down the Sword Coast. The stouter one beside Vosker was Gruthgar Hrimrol, a retired shipwright very active as a landlord in the deep. Next to Hrimrol was a broad-shouldered mountain of a man, Belganter Halehand, a retired swordsmith who owned several gnome and halfling iron smelting and casting businesses in Secumber that shipped to Waterdeep nigh daily. Next along the Ark of Lords, moving steadily left, was the sardonic purring Osber Malankar, a fabulously wealthy wine seller and investor from Sembia, whose family had relocated to Waterdeep when the troubles with Netheril had started. Next to him was Lamech Hirlerpost, a loud, dominant, take-charge sort who'd inherited his mother's importation business that had grown very profitable specializing in connecting guilds with the right bulk raw ingredients or components at lower prices than competitors could offer. Then came Kasalra Maremther, the only female lord among these nine, a shrewd woman of few words who'd grown very rich making and selling ointments and filters in beautiful blown glass vials that caravan merchants crisscrossing the heartlands couldn't get enough of. Of all twenty lords, Lairall reflected, only five were women, and of the twenty, only four weren't purebred human. All were wealthy, narrow representation narrow thinking. On the end, beside Maremther sat deep-voiced Brathen Kazander, who was something profitable in discreet investments and as a city landlord in the northerly wards of the city. Slow and deliberate of speech, but not of thought, he at least seemed relaxed, unlike Vosker and Hirlarpost, who leaned forward over the table like two hounds straining at the leash in their eagerness. Well now, let the tethers slip and the fun begin. My fellow lords, Lerol greeted the hidden lords facing her across the table. You requested this meeting and I am happy to host it, but in the interests of expediency, would ask you to begin by unfolding to me why you wished to meet. What urgency compels this break with routine? There were no servants in the room or in any of the antechambers adjoining the lord's moot. Her nine visitors had been most insistent about that. Palace servants or courtiers would come when respective bell poles summoned them, but failing that, Lairol was alone with her fellow lords in this magnificent room. The walls of the lord's moot were pierced by many magnificent closed doors, and between them the paneling was adorned with large framed enchanted to glow magnificently detailed maps of each ward of the city. The floor, unlike the polished marble of the audience chambers or the smooth flagstones of the grand entrance hall, 
was of well-oiled, smooth, polished wooden planks. The room smelled of that oil, and more faintly of a sharper, nuttier oil that had been used far longer ago on the table. Laryl breathed in that smell and kept herself calm as Lord Hearler Post shot to his feet and thundered, Lady Silverhand, word of rank villainy has come to our ears. Shoddy workmanship that endangers us all. Some who charge coin to do work in this city are, it seems, quite willing to sacrifice the lives and safety of honest, upstanding citizens just to make a few nibs faster and with less effort. And then there's the matter of this giant's castle hovering almost over us. That could be home to an army that could descend upon us with fire and sword and fell magic at any time, yet nothing has been done about it. My lord, Laryl said gently, please sit and let us have calm. The castle is home to a peaceful family of cloud giants whom I have met. They have come to Waterdeep to trade, so we should welcome them and let them go about their business unhindered, as we do almost all other merchants. Our demonstrated tolerance is our prosperity. That old maxim, Vosker muttered. You received assurances? I did, Laryl replied. They do not plan to be here long, a ten-day at most. Now as for your concern about workmanship, I have, as you know, personal memories of an earlier water deep so I can say with certainty that it has long been locally fashionable to think of noble lords and ladies and the guildmasters of this city too, not to mention rising wealthy entrepreneurs and those workers not part of guilds, as self-serving decadent villains whose ruthlessness is only exceeded by their vices and their greed. In short, proudly unscrupulous crooks and murderers, well, as with almost any collection of sentients, a handful of them are those things, but the great majority of them genuinely love their city and want to do what's best for it. I just wish there was wider agreement on what is best for it, not to mention better judgment all around. She might as well have tried to douse flames by smiling at them. Healer Post sputtered as he sat and kept right on roaring until other lords interrupted him to have their own rants. Laryl kept her face looking gravely earnest and interested as she listened in silence, taking her measure of the nine. She could feel the uneasy undercurrent of fear. These nine lords were beginning to get scared by the murders, but that was not why they'd interrupted her routine morning signing of contracts and examination of the city accounts. Not that she minded. A bell ago, she'd been mired in the usual approval of expenditures and murmuring, Ship Street again? What sort of slapdash job did they do last time? Those cobbles aren't laid on prunes or icing, nor yet wheels of overripe cheese. Or shouldn't be. No, they'd shown up and insisted on this emergency meeting and vote to get her to issue an immediate edict. The murder of Hailing Horse hadn't been the only overnight excitement. There'd been a subsidence, a collapse in Castle Ward that had taken down three shops, and all the folk restocking and cleaning them and living above them, down into the depths, into down shadow. A sinkhole likely caused by cellar expansions, more than a month of digging with carts rumbling up and down ramps to haul away the stones and dirt to the cellarers and plasterers guild yard at a business next door. Armor Verascalin's fine wines and spirits. All this tunneling under the city, Hearler Post thundered, wagging a finger like a disapproving tutor, has to stop. All? Laryl asked mildly. Well, all without palace permission. A special lord's writ, that is. Signed and issued by you, and only if you like what's planned. Oh, and all work to be done by the cellarers and plasterers. We need proper guild work and accountability. Why, this Verascalin was using a band of half-orcs he found hiring out their swords in Scornubel. And some citizens say they're certain some of these half-orcs were digging alongside orcs. Pure-blooded and fully armed, too, by the by, orcs. Laryl carefully did not let her gaze stray to the sheaf of reports in front of her, and the one she'd already decided to say nothing about. 
Sometimes keeping secrets was the lesser evil when spreading panic could work so much more havoc. People were being found dead in Down Shadow, alive and hale one day. Then they just didn't awaken to greet the next, dead with not a mark on them, save that their tongues had shriveled and gone black, some sort of unknown plague, or perhaps a fell gift from one of the lurking evils that wanted Skullport strong once more, and without inquisitive Water Davian near neighbors. Bloody Waterdeep, city of vipers above and below. Laryl made herself nod blandly into the teeth of Post's fury. I find myself unopposed, she announced. Let us apply ourselves to wording this edict and a sample writ, my lords. Behind masks, breaths were let out in relief all around the table. At least their new choice of open lord was as plain spoken as she was decisive. No more, I shall have to ponder the matter, and then doing things behind their backs as never Ember had. Too much the tyrant, that one, and not enough the spokesperson. Everyone cut their quills afresh, Laryl ordered, reaching for the stand in front of her. Somehow at these meetings it always came down to that. Chapter 6 Bad for Business I know not what the younger folk are thinking these days with their defiance of elders, new ideas, and ever louder scorn. It is all so bad for business. Do they not understand that thriving business feathers their nests and fills their bellies? Or are they all stone mad and want to see the end of the world? From A Seat That Draws Blood, Ten Years a Guildmaster by Jalerno Kloskerm Runder, Guildmaster Emeritus of the Stationers Guild, published in the Year of the Cauldron. You're late, Tashin. It took no genius to deduce that her two co-conspirators were troubled. She'd rented this upper room in North Ward for daytime get-togethers because it was handy to several eateries known for serving good high sun feasts so there'd be nothing suspicious about any of them being seen in the vicinity. The one who'd just greeted her so coldly was a slender flame-haired woman in a very expensive gown, worn with an overgown of lace and cutouts. She'd be strikingly beautiful if it wasn't for the permanent sneer on her face. It seemed she'd been striding back and forth restlessly, showing off the curves of her long legs to the other conspirator who was currently filling the best chair in the room. He was an older man, heavy of feature, his chin and cheeks blue with stubble, and was still wheezing from the climb of the stairs. Half the city knew his unlovely face. He was Roy Sark Cuthbarrel. Guildmaster of the Splendid Order of Armorers, Locksmiths, and Finesmiths, and his face held worry, not just irritation. Well, I didn't think you'd butcher quite so many hidden lords so quickly, he grunted. We don't want to start an uproar, bad for business. Ah, this must be met head on. I disagree, Tashin told him coolly. Thanks to my, uh, heritage, I, more than both of you, know how this city cleaves to tradition, to the ways things have always been, new wares and fashions all the time, yes, but amid their passing welter, we cling ever more tightly to what we know. Do you want all the cheap outland armor and locks to go on flooding into water deep from every last dwarf hold across the north that's now finding their feet and wanting coin? No, Cuthbarrel admitted. Well, then sit tight and endure a month or so of tumult and wild gossip, wherein you'll know the truth where all the wandering city doesn't, and we can change things. This Laryl is new, still finding her way. She can be pushed, so long as we don't show her the hand that's shoving her. She transferred her gaze and attention to the sneering woman, who promptly jerked her head in the direction of the connecting door Tashin had come through, wrinkled her nose, and asked, What's that stink? Aromatic oils being heated. We three are supposed to be the first clients of Sharassa's house, where your skin is loved, remember? 
We're not actually going through with the oiling and scraping, are we? No, just rub a little of the oil on the backs of your hands before we leave. I'll go last and quench the brazier. Yes, we wouldn't want another mist, sure. Especially as the word from the palace is that they're not rebuilding, just like Field Ward. Whatever can a lass invest in these days? Business, Cuthbarrel told her. Guild business. The fire-haired woman waved a dismissive hand. That always seems to enrich the guilds, never me. If you trouble to acquaint yourself with what the guilds of this city... I have, she cut him off. And what I've learned has made me watch most of the guilds very closely, but not risk one copper on what they're up to. She regarded the guildmaster with some distaste. Don't ever make the mistake, Cuth, of thinking me an empty head. Yes, I play with my father's coin, but I make more than I lose. By shiploads, it's why he lets me play. Neither Tashin nor Cuthbarrel was given to superlatives. In a city of shopkeepers interested in selling you everything, one heard so many of them tossed about so freely and emptily. But the wealth of the Railentovers had rightly been described in the broadsheets of Time or Sixty as glitteringly stupendous. And as Zarela was the only daughter of Anne Drambert and Melotha Railentover, she had been wealthier than the Melshimbers or any six guilds since birth and had probably spent, scores of times over, more than Tasheen and Cuthbarrel put together would be able to spend in their entire lives. The only thing Railentover wealth hadn't been able to do, yet, was buy a noble title, as open Lord Neverember had very firmly closed that door. And if this old and now new again Lairall wanted to keep her throne and her head, it would not soon be opened again. The city would not be served well by letting more willful, spoiled rich brats into the nobility and all the privileges thereof. That was a very large part of the depths it had sunk into these latter days. That and magic going wild and the gods spurring wars over half of Faerun. But in Waterdeep, as elsewhere, the battles at hand should be faced and fought first. Tashin said nothing of such thoughts. Lowborn never liked to be reminded they weren't good enough to be noble. Instead, she said crisply, Waterdeep must be cleansed. We are mired in old ways, old thinking, and the same old corruption everywhere. We are still agreed on this, yes? We are, Cuthbarrel growled, and shot a look at Zarela that was a clear challenge. Of course we are, the sneering heiress agreed. The nobles and the guilds must provide strong leadership and be seen to do so, and things must change. Too long have we drifted, with citizens busy at short-sighted self-enrichment and trusting that someone else will lead the city, and never ember showed us what happens when the open lord believes himself emperor and wants to weld water deep to other places and leech it of its wealth to build himself his empire. Hired navies indeed— how can a port defend itself when a foe can outbid us for control of our own navy? Because it's not ours? So we continue with the plan, Tashin pressed. We continue with the plan, the guildmaster agreed. Can the murders be done in a way that points fingers at the other hidden lords as behind it all, so it seems like internal housekeeping, and the populace won't be pleased if the watcher sent out to harass us all? Leave a masked lord's mask at the murder scenes, Tashin replied. Seems less than subtle. Cuthbarrel and Zarela shrugged in perfect unison. When dealing with the shopkeepers and laborers, subtle is not far from useless, Zarela commented. We've taken the masks of two of our victims thus far, Tashin said dubiously but I wonder if they bear enchantments that might show who last handled them. So, tie them into sacks and hire half a dozen street beggars to pass them around a room to each other, Cuthbarrel suggested. Zarela was regarding Tashin narrowly. We? We. You killed those men yourself? Wise nobles trust no underlings, Tashin replied flatly 
and involve as few of them as possible in anything they do. It's why we have so many servants, so none become indispensable or begin to think they have the right to do something about their ambitions. One must keep a lid on sedition at all costs, Zarela murmured, her tone just mocking enough for Tashin to give her a sharp glare. That evoked a shrug, and the only daughter of the Raylan Tavers rising and asking, So, where is this oil I need to put on my hands? Tashin led them through the door, and then, after a brief lave in oils, on through another door, so they would both depart the upper floor by another way than they'd come up. The door securely bolted in their wake. She hooded the small brazier to quench it, got out the heavy leather gauntlets, and lidded the hot oil to let it cool slowly. It was poisoned, of course. A weak and slow-acting lizard folk poison that caused human internal organs to slow until lassitude becomes a sleep from which there was no awakening. She didn't want Cuthbarrel or Zarela dead yet. Not while they were still useful. Eventually, the watch would close in on whoever was murdering so many masked lords of Waterdeep, and there would have to be scapegoats. Guilty suicides found with their confessional notes. She was looking forward to writing Zarela's in the woman's own sneering blood. Jallister was excited despite himself. He'd been quivering inwardly since the moment he'd stepped over the white marble threshold out of the deepening dusk, and the doorjack had saluted him, turned smartly, and grandly introduced him to the room. Jollister Silvermane, Gentle Sayer Adventurer. It did sound grand, put like that. And everyone at the castle gate had said nobles were busily hiring adventurers right now, so this could be his road to riches, or enough steady coin to keep his guts filled, at least. And even if it wasn't, tonight was free food, free drink, and an evening's entertainment. House Nandar was hosting a revel, their fourth or fifth of the season, apparently, and adventurers, good-looking female ones in droves by the looks of things, had been invited as entertainment for the attending nobles. Nandar Towers was huge, filling an entire city block of North Ward. Its ground floor seemed to lack passages, just huge chamber after huge chamber, all of them tall and echoing cold, soaring marble. But up here on the upper floors, it was pleasant enough. Everywhere there were ferns in hanging baskets and thick carpets and paintings of splendid scenes rather than gloomy old staring ancestors. Jallister had overheard one jutting Spike's mustachioed noble chuckle to another that the elder Nandars looked so frightful. Their portraits were kept hidden in the loftiest under Eve's rooms for the servants to shudder at. He'd overheard a lot of chuckling so far this evening, and a lot of rather ardent flowery verbiage, too. Some of the lady adventurers were stunning, not to mention barely dressed, and had certainly attracted their shares of persistent aging nobles. He'd just slipped hastily away from being too close an audience for the clumsy seductions of one wart-studded and ginger-whiskered old boar, and was threading his way through an elegant maze of pillars and statuettes on plinths when he overheard voices ahead that brought him to a hasty halt, followed by a swift sidestep into the shadowy lee of a handy life-sized marble statue of a stern and no doubt long-dead Nandar warrior. There was a tapestry beside it, and he took refuge behind it, discovering in doing so that he could now see the two speakers framed between pillars. They're saying Elminster's been seen in the deep these last few days. It was a scraggle-bearded young lordling, Lord Relivar Agundar, whose name Jallister happened to know because he'd been right behind Jallister arriving at the revel. The noblewoman Lord Agundar was talking to turned half away from him to wave one hand airily, and Jallister recognized her in an instant by her shoulder. It had to be Lady Brandalira Talamost, 
Unless, that is, there was more than one wrinkled old noblewoman at this revel wearing a gown of open-weave mauve silk studded with eyeball-sized cabochon amethysts at every cross-junction of silken strands. But that can't be, Agundar persisted, unless he's thousands of years old. He just might be, the noblewoman purred. But he doesn't act it. Oh, no. Agundar stared at her in clear astonishment. Do you mean to say, have you? His face changed. That's disgusting. Is it really? Have a care with those judgments, Lord Agundar. A few of us noble ladies possess just enough wits to make judgments, too. The young nobleman flushed. I didn't mean, uh, that is, what I meant was, he must have been with hundreds of women— Unless he's not one man, but a succession of them, using the same name and disguise. Now that's an arousing notion. But no, I've met him on various occasions all my life. Tis the same man, or at least he remembers me and takes up conversations where we left off. Decades earlier in some cases. But why? Forgive me, Lady Talamost, I mean no impertinence, but just why is this Elminster so popular with women? I understand the danger, the allure of a powerful wizard, but... Lady Talamost turned to look straight into the young nobleman's eyes. Because he's so honest with us, and kind and comforting. She backed a few steps away, and then turned and departed, striding past the alcove where Jallister stood frozen like a statue behind the tapestry, then paused to add over her shoulder, You might want to try being those things sometime. Lord Agundar sputtered inarticulate rage, and Lady Talamos started walking again, adding, He's also so lonely that we feel it. It's nice to be wanted. Fascinated, Jallister watched Agundar's face as he frowned after Lady Talamost, then shook his head and hurried off in the other direction, snarling, I need another drink. Jallister discovered he'd been holding his breath and let it all out in a long, gushy sigh, only to freeze again on the brink of stepping out from behind the tapestry when he heard not only a familiar voice, but familiar words. They came from an old nobleman he'd encountered several times earlier in the mansion. The man seemed to be everywhere. Not Ginger Whiskers, but someone larger and louder. A lord, of course, who was now swaggering this way, along the same route Jallister had used to reach this alcove with a shapely young woman on his arm. Lord Dresdark Cormalis in full spate, trying out the very same conversational gambits Jallister had overheard him using on other attractive women before. A shambling, squat, round bear of a man in magnificent dark silks, balding, monocle, and huge waxed mustache, and a crashing boar whose salient feature was a jutting jaw bigger than all the rest of him. By the harbor mists, lass, but outlanders come to the deep with some odd notions. Did you know some wild heads are actually trying to found a temple of Ilastray here? They want to buy up buildings, level them, and plant trees, sculpting some little hills and all, just to have a little clearing they can dance in, Mother Buck Bear. Did you ever hear the like? They'll be wanting conjured rivers and little waterfalls and duck ponds to fish in next. Thankfully, Cormalis and his companion of the moment strode on by. That was what they'd been wanting, hey? For his part, Jallister just wanted to sip some badly needed wine in some dim corner or other of Nandar Towers. He stepped out from behind the tapestry cautiously, and then fled back behind it again with his heart suddenly pounding as a much quieter male voice very close by said almost in his ear, In here, this should be private enough. A moment later, Jallister was holding his breath behind the tapestry and staring around its edge at two younger and more handsome men than Cormalis. Both were expensively dressed and bearing large goblets of wine and little hand wheels of some golden-hued cheese that was pungent enough that he could smell it from here. 
The slightly shorter man took his first bite as he backed almost into Jalister, but luckily his elbow grazed the tapestry and he felt it and instinctively stepped away as he murmured, Good stuff. I've never tasted such before, but good, good. Genuine high moon smoke arrived. The other man, someone called Landerman Vosker, who'd been introduced behind Jalister right after Lord Agundar, replied, Doesn't stint, Elagal Nander. I'll say that for him. Fancy spending good coin feeding outlander adventurers just to bend our ears with tales of monster slaying and fighting all over Faerun. I'd say, the shorter man replied in dry tones, that he was more interested in providing dashing fresh faces to dally with jaded nobles. Faces, Bosker echoing meaningfully, and added a rather dirty chuckle. The other man chuckled too. So, Omen Dran, Bosker said briskly, raising his goblet in salute, I came here to take my measure of these adventurers and see if I liked the looks of any of them. I'm speaking seriously now, to hire them to protect me. He lowered his voice and thrust his head forward until Jalister was certain he'd be seen and added, Seeing as someone in this city certainly seems to want hidden lords to greet early graves, so, fellow wearer of the mask, are you here to hire yourself some bodyguards too? Omen Dran took a calm sip of his wine. You think it's come to that? Well, I'm not waiting until they come for me. It's what? Three of us so far? How many blaring warhorns of warning do you need, man? Dran shrugged. More than three, evidently, he murmured, raised his goblet in salute, and strolled away. Vosker stared after him, then drained his own wine in one long pull, shook his head, and hastened back the way he'd come. Back toward the din of chatter in more brightly lit chambers, Jalister let out his long-held breath again in a great gasp and had just about regained his poise enough to dare to step out from behind the tapestry once more when the alcove was again invaded, swift and pantingly this time, bustling into the farthest dim back corner right beside him. Young, strong, and ardent they were, richly dressed, nobles both, and already busy kissing and caressing. Hurry, Narvel, the woman urged between gasps. My Elander's getting jealous and watchful. Oh, I can be very quick, the man growled, tearing at her gown. As cloth of gold tore, she tugged just as vigorously, bearing Narvel's shoulder and sinking her teeth into it. Narvel growled like a lustful wolf and buried his head against the woman's chest. Now, thought Jalister, this is my chance and as he darted out from behind the tapestry, ducking low to slip past, he was so close that he couldn't help but notice what dangled from the tip of the woman's nearest exposed breast. A tiny black and red pendant clearly displaying the three triangles of Asmodeus. Well now, decadent, these nobles of Waterdeep. Oh, <laughs> Andreth Tolver's eyes widened with delight at the bared breasts offered to him, and his hands shot out. Ah! Oh, Tashin groaned in feigned delight, submitting to his fondling. In apparent surrender, she bent her knees and collapsed against him, rubbing and purring, taking care to make enough noise that the masked lord wouldn't hear Darleth take the last two steps up behind him and get a firm and careful grip on Tolver's stout golden neck chain, a twisted ornamental rope of wrought gold that would hopefully prove strong enough for long enough. And if it didn't, Darleth's garrote already hung from his wrist, its dark waxed length ready. The chain tightened, Tolver's eyes went wide with surprise and dismay, and Tashin left off purring and clamped firm hands over the man's nose and mouth to stifle any outcry. Then she devoted herself to keeping her fingers there even as he tried to bite them and his hands tightened in her soft flesh in desperate claws, hauling her down as Darleth rode him to the floor ruthlessly, 
knee to the back of Tolver's neck, and the chain pulled so tight it vanished between folds of purpling flesh. Masked Lord Andreth Tolver struggled for another frenzied instant, then kicked and writhed all over like a landed fish flopping on the docks, and went limp, his eyes staring fixedly at nothing at all. When they let go of him, he lay still except for his mouth. It fell open limply, and a trickle of blood ran out. Tasheen, her chest smarting from his dying clutch, oh, but she'd have bruises tomorrow, drew the slender dagger from inside her left boot, sliced open the dead man's ruffle-bedecked shirt, tore open his belt, and on his bare and hairy belly carved the symbol of Asmodeus. For it was high time the tongues of Waterdeep wagged about the foul deity so many of their nobles worshipped, and the sort of dark things that were done in that fell lord's name. She wiped her blade clean on Talver's shirt, resheathed it, then rose, pulled the overlapping folds of her bodice back into place, retightened the sash that would keep them there, and followed Darleth who was already strolling unconcernedly away as if he hadn't noticed so much as a shadow of the dead man lying on the floor right behind him. He slowed and offered her his arm, and she took it, and they strode on in easy union, in two steps becoming just one more affectionate couple strolling the shadowed upper floors of Nander Towers as the revel wound down, walking without the slightest haste to the back stair that had brought them here. If for some reason it was blocked, Tasheen vaguely recalled two other back routes down from this floor, and she knew that Darleth, who'd spent hours studying the plans of the rebuilt Nandar Villa that the mysterious man who'd hired Tasheen had given her, had memorized no less than four ways in precise detail. Yet the stair was dark and deserted and there was no tumult or outcry behind them as they strolled out the back doors of Nandar Towers onto Brondar's Way, where the street lanterns shone on an empty block, and the noise of the revel was faint behind them. They slipped away west, through almost deserted streets, seeing nary a watch patrol, and walked unhurriedly on into Sea Ward. It seemed they'd done it murdered the masked Lord Andreth Tolver, and as the broadsheets liked to put it, gotten clean away. Jallister slowed in his hurrying way through the splendors of Nander Towers, stared, and then stopped dead. Oh, he definitely needed wine now, but not enough to get one step closer to the dead man on the floor the very recently slain man who had something freshly sliced into his belly from which glistening blood was still spreading out around him. This dead man looked noble, or at least rich and important, whereas he, Jallister, was an outlander and an adventurer, and being halfway handsome wouldn't keep him from being blamed for murder. He turned and fled, trying not to run. There'd been an ascending stair back here somewhere not all that far. The floors above looked down on this one through an open central well. Gods and walking statues, but this place was big, and he'd get safely up there and find a place he could look down on the body from, and from that safer distance watch what happened when it was found. On that upper floor he came across a serving table set with several decanters and many goblets, and through a half-open door behind it heard the bubblingly delighted giggles of... He peered. Yes, the maidservant who was supposed to be dispensing this wine, half buried under... None other than Ginger Whiskers, who wuffed when he was busily trying to cover someone all over with kisses Jallister found himself discovering with a shudder, so he helped himself to the largest decanter, then shrugged and took it with him along with his brimful goblet, strolling with as much idle lack of concern as he could feign to the right spot along the rail. When he looked oh so casually down, he was just in time to see men crowding around the corpse, balding and overweight men in magnificent clothing who had to be nobles. Asmodeus, that is, 
one exclaimed, peering at the bleeding carving on the corpse's hairy stomach. Who is he, do you know? That's Tolver, Andreth Tolver. Used to deal in exotic beasts, and had his own smokehouse for boar halfway to Amphail, back before he started buying up buildings and fancying himself someone important. Some say he's one of the hidden lords, but I don't believe it myself. I mean, look at that clout. And those boots. Lords of the city, even commoners have some taste, don't they? Dashed rude of these lowlifes coming to our revel to settle their sordid little scores. Well, we're not having a scandal. Not on good old Elagall's head. Bad for business, what? This body must simply disappear right away. Well, but how? I'm not carrying it. I mean, I didn't even know the man. And I'll get blood all over this all for soon and ill modder's sake. Yon carpet will do. Grab it, Forstall. We'll roll him up in it and just carry him out of here and tell anyone who sees us that we're in the middle of a prank and we'll explain it all later. Look, it's plenty long enough to hide him, even if he has his arms together over his head. It'll jut out long at both ends by a good measure. Ha! <laughs> man of action you are, Lestris. Good man. This'll be fun. Wait a bit, wait a bit. What will we tell them about the prank when the body is found? It's not going to be found. It's going straight into the sewers. When they were rebuilding their villa into this mansion, they kept the old sewer shaft. You can drop horses down it. And you'd know this how exactly? Ha! I'll tell you that after you come up with a tale to tell of our prank. A good one, mind. Now, help me roll him and pluck out that ridiculous scarf he's wearing. We'll need it to mop the blood off the floor and then roll in with him. Jallister drew back from the railing just in case one of the puffingly excited nobles should happen to look up. He would if he were down there right now rolling that body into a large, expensive, and presumably Nandar-treasured carpet. Interesting. This was the third time he'd heard of villas being rebuilt into larger, grander mansions. It seemed that over the last few decades these grand castles had increasingly become year-round residences rather than mere summer-tide homes. Perhaps the wealthy who'd bought up titles had something to do with that. They were here and wanted to lord it here and never go anywhere else. Hmm, interesting place, this city of splendors. Murders and high prices and all. He liked it. Jallister risked another peek over the railing, in time to see that the nobles had bundled the dead man into the carpet and were now carrying it off. Off and down a short flight of white marble steps, and turning to their right, about to pass out of his view. He decided he wanted to see and hear more, and hastened back to the stair that had brought him here. It was some time before he caught up to the carpet-laden nobles, but they obviously knew their way down through the Nandar mansion, floor after floor, heading for what was probably a servant's cellar where they could access the chute that dropped the Nandar dung into the sewers. They encountered a door, and one of them looked back, and Jallister only escaped discovery by looking bored and striding across a passage rather than continuing along it in their wake. Finding himself in another unlit alcove full of furniture and paintings that reconnected with that passage via an archway, he hastened through it. And almost ran into the nobles. It seemed the door was binding in its frame, and they were having to haul hard on it to get it open. Don't think they use this end of the house much, one commented. Not since Amalra married and moved south to Am or Tethir or wherever she went. Some barbaric and hot excuse for a city. I forget which one it was. That got it, another grunted as the door juttered open with a groan. Someone in downshadow will find the body, another noble hissed. Haven't you heard? They're dying down in downshadow like flies caught in a downpour, abandoning the place in droves. And having buildings crash down on their heads isn't helping, another muttered as another door squealed open and a certain smell became evident. Jallister risked the briefest of peaks, and was in time to see the nobles tip the rolled carpet over a waist-high half-wall into darkness, and then lean to listen for a splash below. Jallister looked for another carpet to hide behind, 
but settled for a doorway he could duck through into an unlit servery. My, but we live in interesting times, Forstall commented. Bloody water deep. Always has been, always has been. So there isn't anywhere else in all the world I'd rather be, Lestris said almost merrily. And then came the splash, and the nobles turned away, sighing in relief. Long way down, that. Ugh, good thing, considering. Anyone get blood on them? If you did, Lestris offered, find an Asmodeus kisser and they'll lick it off for you. They do that in their rituals. And you know this how? Well, one can't help but hear a lot of things whilst trying to get into certain ladies' beds, was the reply. I'll bet, came a dry response. I'll just bet. Chapter 7 All Wizards Are Crazy Looking back over the last three centuries of Sword Coast history, it is simply bewildering why wizards aren't ruling everywhere. They have the power, despite all the resentment and ready swords of those who do not. Yet time and again they make mistakes or do wildly foolish things, and either lose grip on thrones or miss seizing them in the first place. And in the end, I can find only one possible reason. All wizards are crazy. From Tathero's Short Sword Coast Chronicle by Aldrith Tathero Scribe for Hire of Athcatla Published in the Year of the Rune Lord's Triumphant Tashin fought to steady her breath. She doubted Antler would be impressed by a fearful and panting agent. She'd parted from Darleth at their agreed-upon place, but once out of his sight, had needed to sprint like a thief to have time to dodge through her usual two club cellars to make sure he wasn't following her. To arrive at this meeting disheveled and huffing would be bad, but to arrive with a tail would mean both their deaths. So here she was, a little breathless but not late at least, on the blue jack side of the upright sewer grating in the near-pitch darkness and reek she was getting used to. Tolver is dead, she murmured through the grating without greeting or preamble. Good, came the familiar deep slow voice from the sewer side of the rusty old lattice. So continue with the lords I've selected, and only the lords I've selected, in order. If you must butcher a guildmaster or adventurer or watch captain or anyone else to keep the palace off your tracks, do it. But when it comes to the lords, let's have no freelancing. I have my reasons for a precise sequence of deaths. You have to steer the surviving lords into selecting the right individuals to replenish their ranks. Tashin was bold enough to reply. Precisely, and I have only enough mind stones to protect one candidate lord at a time. As Lady Silverhand is a chosen, whatever that means these days, and may have ways of mind scrying we are unaware of. Does she name new masked lords? She proclaims them. Only a hidden lord of Waterdeep can nominate replacements to their ranks and we vote on every candidate in secret before they even know they're being considered. The open lord only participates in such votes to break ties. Not that such an occasion has ever happened in my time. The watchful order doesn't spy on your proceedings. They are forbidden to, and I very much doubt that in the time of the Black Staff— Kelvin the Inflexible, who forbade them so publicly, and all the independent mages of the city too, any of them dared to. Twice. Kelvin has been gone from the deep a long time, Tashin ventured quietly. And Lerol, this Lerol, is but his shadow, Antler agreed. Yet Neverember had some sort of magic item that created a backlash and almost slew the Blackstaff Vajra the one time she tried to read what he was up to. I doubt any of the weak-kneed and pettish ditherers who populate the Order now 
would dare to scry the hidden lords to know if they're conspiring with prospective future hidden lords or guild masters or anyone else to choose particular new lords or indeed to decide anything at all. Have you any preferences as to the rate of demises? Tashin asked carefully. As I follow the list? No. The swifter the deaths follow, the more alarm will spread. But a slower rate will give the watch more time to prepare and the surviving lords to guard themselves. I do not want them to have time to sequester themselves behind fortress walls and vote and debate by magical means through the Order's assistance. That will mean, in time, that the Order rules this city, not any lord or lords at all. And the faster you strike, the faster my other agents can snatch away the bodies before someone can get them to a temple and try to bring them back from death to report what they saw of their slayers and resume their seats as lords. Now go and eliminate lords for me. I hear and obey. Tashin gave the expected response and turned and walked away, never once having sought to look through the grating. Antler was never pleased when his orders were tested. She went back the way she'd come, through the damp tunnel that was lit only by the faintly phosphorescent Murvram, the claret-hued moss that grew wild on old stone almost everywhere beneath the deep. Up into the cellars of the Blue Jack and around a tumbled pile of spongy rotten old furniture that stank of mold, and at first glance to anyone entering into the cellar from above filled the back of this room, entirely hiding the tunnel she'd just used. Only the boldest inquisitive intruder would get this far, because they'd have to come through the low-ceilinged cellar room and pass the moldering body of an outlander with a smashed-in head, a long-ago tavern brawl victim, not to mention an iron cage periodically replenished with meat scraps that attracted rats. Rats that didn't bother to flee or squeal when she walked through them now. They just gave Tasheen dirty looks, and one of them tried to run up her ankle, so she scraped it off with her other foot, tromped on it hard, and strode on. Up to the loose wall panel at the back of the ladies' jakes, then out and up the narrow dark stair into the tap room, as crowded and noisy as usual, where she took three steps and was out the back door into Tail Alley, a loop of narrow and muddy cartway off Cat Alley that smelled, as it always did, of rotting fish and mildew. A few stars could be seen overhead through the clinging yet still light city mist as she came out into Castle Ward. She walked north with her heart low and cold within her. The man who was calling himself Antler probably had just the two mind stones, one protecting him personally and the other to protect candidates for the Lord's. She'd known enough not to even obliquely ask or try to find out who he would put forward to be the newest hidden lords of Waterdeep. If she ever came to know too much too soon, he'd ruthlessly eliminate her. Despite his promise the first time they'd met, that once a dozen masked lords of his choosing were in place, she'd be the thirteenth. Ha, she whispered, the jest's on me, isn't it? For the first time, Tasheen Malshimber admitted to herself what she'd begun to suspect days ago, that she wouldn't live long enough to ever wear the mask. In the darkness, Laral padded barefoot from door to door of the little room one more time, just to be sure. Locked, all of them, and the heavy desk dragged over against the one secret panel she couldn't secure. Dealing with her fellow lords was tiring. Most of the nine she'd dealt with tonight were nasty, pushy people, and she'd had far too many centuries of dealing with far, far too many of those, and she wanted a break from their little hostilities, some time to rest and banish her weariness and sink into the weave and be comforted. She barely felt her feet leave the floor. Her hair was already unfolding through the air around her, the silver tresses like so many pleased serpents curling into aimlessly drifting lassitude. Deeper, deeper the weave becoming visible around her, 
as the familiar pulsing, rippling blue-white glow suffusing everything, a glow that suddenly whirled up bright and strong where it shouldn't have, startling her and jolting her out of her gathering reverie into blinking, barely ready alarm. Feet thudding back down onto the floor, Laryl snatched up the most combat-useful of the magic items she'd divested herself of to ride the weave, and steeled herself to meet whatever trouble was arriving so unexpectedly, even now spinning its own gait out of nothing at all, an oval that grew and grew as it advanced out of nowhere into the far corner of the room. Silver hair suddenly swirled out of that blue-white whirling oval, darting to meet and mingle with her own, and she found herself looking into the large, dancing, silver-blue eyes of... Storm! Well met, Lair. Storm embraced and kissed her affectionately, warm and strong and sleekly muscled, smelling of forest loam and green growing things and fresh outdoor breezes. Her lips tasted of apple tea. Ah, sister, Laryl said delightedly, I am happy to see you. And she meant it, but meant every bit as much the foreboding and suspicion in what she asked in her next breath. And what brings you here to me in the dark heart of night? Well, tis certainly not the decor, Storm said lightly, whirling them both to the chairs Laryl had shoved to the walls, even as she plucked those seats forth and together with her tresses. There are nicer rooms in this big cold pile of a palace, you know. Yes, but none handy to my offices that I can make secure when I commune with the weave, Laryl explained as they sat down side by side. Storm plucked two apples out of her bodice and offered her sister one. Laryl bit into it delightedly. It occurred to me, Storm explained, that you might be feeling a little lonely, abandoned even, and our L is usually more reliable than that. So I feel you're owed an explanation for his abrupt and extended absences. I'm hoping the one we both serve will soon realize her new habit of keeping secrets is folly. But in the meantime... Around a mouthful of sweet and juicy Shadowdale apple, Laryl replied. In the meantime, you're going to tell me what L is up to. Indeed. Know then that Elminster is busy looking after a mind-burned mage we've both heard of, Morden Canaan of Earth and nursing him back to what you might call mental health. Morden Kanan is doing most of the healing himself, but has to be protected from himself whenever it all gets to be too much and he flares up wild again. Illustrial and I have been using the weave to try to help restore his mind, but the man was left barking insane, and the work is exhausting and quite difficult, as we weren't familiar with the personal intricacies of his deep and powerful mind before he got so damaged and must be very careful not to change him into a different person as we seek to mend him. And L is shielding you and protecting Morden Canaan, and everyone from Morden Canaan at the same time. He might have told me, Laryl said dryly. Storm shrugged. Mistra did not deem it needful that you know. Now she does. Laryl knew the smile that rose to her lips, then was rather grim. So our lady has become as paranoid as most mortals? Evidently. Storm's voice was decidedly dry. Someone still merrily murdering masked lords of Waterdeep? Yes, merrily indeed. Well, enjoy the entertainment. Can't say as I've ever wanted to tarry in this city over long. Something about corruption so rife its reek overwhelms the stenches of death and greed. Don't slam any gates on your way out, Laryl replied. I like it here. If you ever need a hide hold or just a break, Storm said softly, you know the way to my kitchen. And a strand of her hair caressed Laryl's cheek fondly as she strode away across the room and a gate whirled up in front of her, bright and swift. She let it take her. Laryl smiled as it winked out, taking Storm with it but that smile became a frown in an instant as something beside her retained the glow of the gate where there should have been no such radiance. It was 
A small filigree work adamantine sphere on the seat where Storm had been. Her sister must have left it behind. A sphere that had two tiny rough pebbles inside it. It was not here by accident. Storm did not misplace things in her wake, ever. So why? Rather than touch it, Laryl used the weave to reach out and probe it, slowly and very warily, and found herself meeting the minds of her sisters Dove and Silone, each bound to a pebble. Hi, Lair. Well met, sister. Laryl laughed aloud in happy astonishment and greeted her sisters mind to mind, their thoughts flashing back and forth like voices bubbling through the weave. All wizards are crazy, Dove thought, present company very much included. Such compliments, Laryl exclaimed. You'll turn my head. What? Silune's tease was sharp-edged. Your head can still be turned after Kelvin? Well, this is strong magic. So how goes ruling Waterdeep thus far? Not as well as I'd hoped, Laryl said aloud, ruefully. But better than I'd expected. Meaning you're still alive and the city isn't under siege or riven by civil war. Yet. Ouch, Laryl replied. You are a witch, Lune. Gotta live up to the title. When your body's gone, without your reputation, you're nothing. So Storm brought you both here to... What? Keep me company? Storm was commanded by Mistra to bring us here to help you. Our lady knows you'll have need of us. I see. Forgive me, but I've not yet become a weave rider, so tell me, what exactly can you two do? Silune sent a smile through the weave. We can fly about, but are intangible, so we can carry nothing more solid than drops of fine liquid, and we can appear as whatever seeming we desire, though you can see through us and we look rather eerie. As if we were ghosts or wraiths or specters, Dove put in. We see and hear and speak, Silune Mind spoke again, and point and gesture, and become visible and invisible at will but we can't go far from our pebbles or leave them for long. So, Dove took over, we can serve you briefly as short-range spies and envoys going where you can't, though we've discovered most magical barriers can keep us at bay. Nevertheless, Laryl said aloud, that will be very useful, and far more than that, I won't feel so utterly and desolately alone. You miss him, don't you? Silune did not have to use Kelbin's name for all three of them to know who was being spoken of. Laryl nodded, suddenly close to tears. He was Waterdeep. Everywhere I turn, every single God's be damned thing I look at, he's there. Looking stern, or smiling, or being imperious. Whatever he was doing when we were last in that place, or holding whatever it is, or one like it, or... He was so strong, so dominant. My hero. She turned away abruptly and started to pace. Her whisper when it came was so quiet it might not have been audible without her sisters hearing it through the weave. And I am lost without him. Sister, Silune said firmly, I was his secret confidant, his confessor, if you will. What El likes to call the backup keeper of his secrets— Command words, hiding places, in case anything happened to you before he fell. And he told me things he didn't dare tell anyone else, including things about you. So let me break one confidence he placed in me now that he is gone. Laryl, he was lost without you. Laryl spun around again and let them see how wet her face was as the tears leaked out in a silent waterfall to run down and drip off her chin. I... Her lips trembled, and she swallowed salt tears, drew in a deep, shuddering breath, and tried again. I know this. Yet somehow it makes me feel no stronger. There will never be another Kelvin. I'd cry if I were you right now, Dove thought at her bitingly dry tones. You mourn Kelvin and have to make do with Mert the moneylender? Ha! <laughs> Crying is the least I would do. 
Tell me, is he a twentieth measure as good a lover as he thinks he is? A sixtieth? Laryl snorted, choked on tears, and burst out laughing despite herself. <laughs> how would I know how good a lover he is, sister? I do have my minimum standards, you know. Usually male, vaguely human, and more or less alive. Dove's thought was sardonic. Have I covered it? Laryl burst into helpless laughter, throwing her head back and shouting her mirth at the ceiling. She was still laughing when someone tried one of the doors and a moment later someone else tried another, violently. Lady Silverhand? came the anxious muffled cry of a maid through the first door. Lord Laryl! Talon Tellfeather called through the second. Laryl collapsed in giggles and thought fiercely at her sister's stay invisible and silent now as she hastened to go and let her seneschal in. To his frowning face and drawn blade, she announced merrily, All wizards are crazy. Have no fears for me. I am alone, unharmed, and unthreatened, merely gripped with glee. Even before she turned away to go and let the maid in, Tellfeather said reproachfully, Lady, you've been crying. You must tell me what is wrong. His face turned grimmer. And you must tell me the truth. The truth, Seneschal, she replied firmly over her shoulder, as she gave the maid a smile and ushered her in, is that I miss my dead husband very much, and will no doubt continue to do so whenever stray thoughts make me remember him. Oh, is that our collective nickname now? Dove asked in her mind. The stray thoughts? Has a ring to it. Silune agreed, and Laryl had to smother a fresh sputter of laughter. Ere she drew herself up and addressed the maid and the seneschal sternly, and if you're wondering as to my sanity, don't, thank you very much. I am no more madwits right now than I was when I was asked to be open lord of this city and accepted the honor and the burden. Memories of my husband, Kelvin Aronson, the Blackstaff, rise to mind everywhere I turn here in Waterdeep. So I'm going to cry, and laugh like a banshee betimes, too, again, because I am human. Lady, the Seneschal said gravely, I never doubted it. He bowed, backed to the door she'd led him in by, and withdrew, closing it behind him. The maid went to one of the small decorative panels in the nearest wall, opened it to reveal a small storage cupboard Laryl had found and investigated several days back, plucked forth a lace-trimmed handkerchief, and offered it. Lady, if there's anything you need, just ring for us. Thank you, M. Elra, Laryl said warmly, taking the handkerchief. The maid looked startled that Laryl knew her name, but pleased, too, as she nodded and departed through her door. Laryl closed and locked it, then made sure Tellfeather's door was also locked once more. And then, handkerchief in hand, she went and sat down on the chair to have a good long talk with her sisters. She was so pleased by their company that she felt she could truly relax and trade jests for the first time since she'd arrived in Waterdeep. And stars above the harbor did she have a lot of joking and trading sharp barbs and gossiping like a young girl to catch up on. Jalister dodged into an alleyway he'd never intended to set boot in, and by the time he was halfway along it, the faint and stealthy footsteps behind him did too. That settled it. He was being followed by more than one person, judging by how many footfalls he'd heard. More like six. No, at least six. They were trying to keep quiet, but he'd grown up a silver mane, and had spent years listening from upper windows of the old skull to the sounds of travelers approaching in twilight or after dark, trying to gauge how many there were, and if the noises hinted at anything unusual that meant he should raise the alarm. He probably should raise one now, but it was the chill tail end of night in an unfamiliar part of North Ward, and now he knew just how Water Davians felt when they grumbled that watch patrols were crasted everywhere when you didn't want them, but couldn't be sighted or hailed to save your skin when you did want them. 
He'd been walking for what seemed a very long time now since he'd slipped out of that rented room at Swordshire House, heading south for his bed at the Castle Gate, as dawn stole up on a city that was probably as quiet as Waterdeep ever got. He'd departed the Nandar revel in the company of a weavingly drunken but gallant and somewhat handsome old noble, Lord Weverell Zun, the wastrel younger brother of the Lord Zungarl Zun who headed that house, Jallister gathered, who had obvious designs upon his person. Yet Wever seemed far kinder and gentler than the persistent Lord Dresdark Cormalis, who seemed to be gathering a bevy of beauties of both genders to engage in some sort of sweaty team bed sport, and the repulsive ginger whiskers who kept unexpectedly reappearing and leering at him. Wever had taken him to a hastily rented room in a new and rather spartan Northward Inn, Swordshire House, and the moment its door had closed behind them, had pawed at him for a few chortlingly clumsy moments, and then collapsed headfirst onto the bed alone. Old Zun was snoring the moment his short, stout, and prodigiously side-whiskered body had finished its face-down bouncing and settled to rest. So Jallister had quietly dressed again and slipped away from him and the inn. The alley came out into a cross street, and although it continued on the far side as an even narrower dark cleft between the outside stair-adorned backs of buildings, he turned onto the street and headed west. He urgently wanted wider and better-lit surroundings where there might be a frasted watch patrol he could take refuge among. His pursuers were moving faster now, not worrying so much about keeping quiet, closing in on him. And there were more than six of them, maybe as many as ten. Jallister started to quick walk, not quite trotting, but walking with what would seem comical haste to any disinterested observer. It would be a clear signal to his pursuers that he knew they were there, and he wondered what they'd do. Already he was sidestepping abruptly from time to time to somewhat lower the chances of a crossbow bolt easily finding the back of his neck or the midst of his shoulder blades. Somewhat. The cross street met with the larger north-south street, and he turned south and started to run. And all too soon, pounding along with his breath starting to come in gasps, he heard the thunder of boots in his wake, a thunder that was quickly growing louder. They were overtaking him. Jallister risked a look back over his shoulder. Tall and long-limbed adventurers, unarmored but with sheaths and scabbards bouncing at every belt, and cruel grins spreading across faces as they saw his own expression. Ten grins. Where were the gods-be-damned watch patrols? Not a blade drawn yet, but those unlovely smiles had been clear enough. They were coming to kill these ten men he'd never met before. So, hired by someone? But who? Who gave a Stlarn about one outlander, an adventurer from a distant dale with no reputation at all? Another two blocks and the castle gate couldn't be far off now, yet with still no watch patrols in sight and nothing and no one at all to be seen but some early delivery wagons with rag-bound wheels to muffle their rumblings, the inn he sought might as well have been clear across the Sea of Swords from here. He was quite likely going to die. Soon and painfully, being as it was ten to one and his foes looked neither naive nor careless, but advanced as a team, maintaining an easy formation without seeming to think much about it. He was badly outnumbered, and only in chapbooks did heroes miraculously escape alive from back-alley skirmishes. Not that he dared duck into another alley, as none he'd seen around were halfway narrow enough to prevent these grinning slayers from surrounding him. He'd probably not last much more than two quick breaths or so. Jallister started peering at shop doorways as he ran past, trying to find one he might be able to defend, or even an open door he could dart through. Though that, too, was more the fancy chance of a chapbook than likely reality here in North Ward before dawn. The scrape of a hurrying boot on a cobble arose right behind him, and he swerved desperately aside, still not daring to slow enough to snatch out the little knife he bore sheathed down the inside of one boot, not when...
A ruthless hand clawed at his shoulder and then his hair, trying to drag him to the cobbles. Jalister shrieked, more in an attempt to make someone hear than in fear of pain, and flung himself in the other direction, not caring how much hair his unseen assailant tore out by the roots. He had to keep moving, had to stay ahead of the rest so they couldn't. But they could and had, and there was a sudden icy feeling across his back that left a wetness in its wake, and someone sneered. He bleeds easily enough. Think you can slice all his bits off before he goes down? Someone asked gleefully. Cut his tongue out first, a third and older voice grunted, and shove garments we carve off him into his mouth. I've heard enough shrieking and eventually it'll bring down the watch on us. Jalister screamed as loudly as he knew how. Help! The watch! A rescue! The watch! And suddenly, as another sharp blade sliced into his jerkin and slit one side of it into flapping ruin, a shop door opened and women with swords in their hands burst out of it, charging headlong into Jalister's pursuers. Steel rang on steel. There was a startled curse. Someone slipped on the cobbles and fell heavily. Swords sang past Jalister's ears on all sides, and he became aware that sprinting along in the heart of all the hard-eyed women and their swift blades was a gaunt old man in rather tattered robes with a long white beard, twinkling eyes, and a hawk beak of a nose. Well met, this startling oldster said politely as he rushed past and thrust a slender and ancient-looking longsword into the belly of the man who still had hold of a great tangle of Jalister's hair. Ye shrieked, so these harpers I was meeting with took it to mean ye wanted a little assistance. Who? Who? Jalister managed to ask, as he stumbled, fell to the cobbles, and rolled hurriedly up to his feet again, boot-dagger in hand. Even though he had that little blade up menacingly, the white-bearded man had positioned himself like a bodyguard, shielding Jalister from the nearest of his pursuers, most of whom were down and bleeding now, or turning to flee with harpers right behind them. He smiled almost fondly at the little knife, and when Jalister stabbed it at him warningly, he batted it aside unconcernedly with the back of one long-fingered hand. Thy great-grandmother was a good friend, the old man informed him, clapping him on the shoulder like a jovial uncle. Then, still gripping that shoulder, he added a rather sad smile. Mind ye sire children to carry on the silver main name before ye go and get thyself killed now. Jalister gaped at him, then ducked and twisted free of his grip to wind up facing him from a sword's length away. Who are you? They call me Elminster, and far worse things, too. Lad, will ye have a try at calling me friend? Jalister gaped at him. Elminster? As in the Sage of Shadowdale? That Elminster? Aye, indeed. Accept no substitutes. Around them the din of sword play had died away. Jalister's pursuers were all down or fled, and the Harpers were now forming a watchful ring around him and the old man. But you must be... Hundreds of years old? Aye, I am, yet still lusty. Jalister gave him an incredulous grin. Lusty? Are you now? Is this how you lure lasses and lads to bed? It's worked before, Elminster admitted impishly, and then added, But no, lad, I have no designs on thy body. Yet, Jalister replied pointedly. El guffawed, and seemed so good-naturedly amused that Jalister found himself joining in. He was alive, delivered out of the very jaws of doom, and who cared how crazed this old bearded man was if he'd managed that? Right behind Elminster, a red-haired and severe-looking harper said to the shorter and more curvaceous harper beside her, So, this must be how he lures them all, that and magic, because it's sure not working on me. El whirled around, flinging his arms wide and then clapping one hand to his brow in dismay. Eve resisted the spell? Ah, this younger generation— 
Whoa, whoa, all my power and wickedness is gone. Tell me, are all wizards crazy? The shorter harper asked the redhead. Or just all the ones we ever meet? Chapter 8 No Shortage of Waiting Graves Yet High hearts and brilliant plans so bright Give many a gallant good cause to fight Yet never any lack of black-hearted knave Keeps heroes from waiting yawning grave From the ballad Waiting Grave In A Minstrel's Whimsy Lyric Chapbook by Desmar Langrafarl of Erie Abor, published in the Year of the Black Blazon. Visitor to see you, lady, a maid announced, setting a decanter of cordial and two glasses before her. Says he's a lord. Laryl lofted an eyebrow. You have reason to doubt this, Denamra? Before the morning maid could reply, a pair of pudgy-fingered hairy hands closed around her hips, lifted her bodily aside, and their owner lurched past, wheezing, Fair morning to you, lady. Mert, Laryl greeted him, giving Denamra a look that mingled sympathetic commiseration and gentle dismissal. You seem to have a keen nose for frying boar. Morning feast arrives, and scarce I have picked up my fork when, wham, here you are. Eh? No, lass, t'wasn't my nose. No whiff of boar made it through that reek two rooms back. What is that smell? They've just oiled the floors in the Lord's Moot, Laryl replied, applying herself to her nutmeg cup of almond sauce-drenched rice before Mert could. Strong, but hardly a reek. It's not unpleasant. Well, mayhap, but it'll go up like a torch if anyone ever drops a lit lamp in there. I'll command the staff to refrain from arson for the nonce, she told him dryly, and steered the dish of eel hot spice in his direction. Hungry? Nay, lass, Mert told her, belying his words by snatching up the dish with one hand and using the other to shovel its entire contents into his mouth. Laryl watched his eyes and cheeks bulge in sudden unison and sat back in her seat in case he offered the hot spice back to her in one gagging spew. However, it seemed the longest-serving Lord of Waterdeep was made of sterner stuff. He chewed manfully as he set down the dish, snatched up a large vase of fresh flowers, plucked those blooms forth, and downed the flower water in one long throat-bobbing pull that evidently washed the hot spice right down. Laryl fought down an all-too-vivid vision of ring-shaped slices of fried eel wriggling and swimming down Mert's innards as the man whooped in a mighty breath, belched impressively loud, deep and long, and resumed his sentence with the air of a man who's performed acrobatic wonders to regain his saddle in the galloping midst of a charge. I came not for the food, I mean eel. Really? But to do my civic duty. Oh? Laryl asked warily. How so? Inform the open lord in a timely manner of grim news she should be apprised of without delay. Oh, what now? I had this from the high harper they call the shepherd, Mert rumbled thrusting his head forward conspiratorially and lowering his voice to a whisper that barely carried three rooms away. The masked Lord Tulver attended a revel last night at the Nandar mansion and has gone missing. Laryl sighed. She knew what that undoubtedly meant, but felt moved to ask. Tam is sure of this? He didn't just hie himself to a rented room somewhere else in the city with a randy noblewoman or other who didn't want her husband to know. You know Zawad? Mert sounded genuinely surprised. I may be in my dotage, old wolf, but I'm not a simpleton, Laryl told him, more gently than she felt like speaking just then. Have some boar fry. Mert eagerly accepted her invitation, crunching down on crispy-edged slabs of pan-blackened sliced boar like a starving man. Laryl didn't quite manage to entirely quell her grin as she pushed more food at him, 
orange Tetherian melons carved into the semblance of flowers, and little golden boats of hollowed-out potatoes filled with the steaming peppered yolks of goose eggs. He devoured it all as Laryl rested both of her elbows on the table, leaned forward to let her gaze wander thoughtfully over the down-to-the-last building burned into a burnished giant Rothay Hyde city map that underlay its glass top, and mused aloud, So, they got Tolver. No great loss. The man was a pig despite his usefulness in debates among the lords. But who'll be next, I wonder? And is someone merely seeking to eliminate the rulership of Waterdeep, or just remake it with new faces belonging to individuals more amenable to their direction? When I was a lord, Mert rumbled through the last of the goose eggs, we used to call that possibility the quiet coup and watch hard for it, as all of us hired our own favorite watchful order spell hurlers just to second-guess Kelvin. And me... Laryl reminded him dryly. And you're still a lord of this city, Mert, which makes you a target, being as you're the one hidden lord I know isn't sponsoring these murders. Not unless all the negotiable ladies you've been enjoying are taking your orders to the Slayers. You haven't been out and about enough to have managed Tolver or Hailing Horse. Ah, uh, but I could have a double, Mert suggested brightly. Laryl eyed him. You could, but someone who could pass for you couldn't escape the notice of the watch, and the watchful order, and Lady Haventree's harpers, all of whom have been instructed to keep watch over you. What? Don't you trust me? Mert teased, acting shocked, and fluttering his hands in overblown mimicry of a scandalized matron. Trust you? Mert, I know you. I trust you to get up to every crime set down under a plaint on our books, and to invent new ones. That made Mert sit back beaming in satisfaction. The huge silver morning feast platter, Laryl noticed, was now empty. When her rotund table guest saw her gaze fall to it, he exclaimed, By my garters, the food's all gone. Would the kitchens run to more, do you think? You wear garters? Laryl inquired archly. Show me that sight, and I'll have them cook you up your very own morning feast. They can do it while I'm screaming and trying to claw my eyeballs out. I believe, Mert said heavily, I feel the need for strong drink coming on. Lots of strong drink. Then he brightened. Got any Elverquist? It was shaping into a bright and pleasant morning, and the breezes were quite pleasant in the dappled shade here at the back of Malankar's garden, even where she and Cuthbarrel were sitting under the trees and safely hidden behind some shrubberies that looked like some clipped-to-a-fare-thee-well variety of juniper, Tashin felt no hint of cold. She'd never been in this particular private garden before— but then she'd never felt the slightest desire to call upon non-noble masked lords she detested. Osber Malankar was the sort of haughty sneerer she regarded as an imposter. Why, the man was a Sembian before all the gods. What right had he to give himself airs here among the true nobility of Waterdeep? Still, this garden, though modest, was both lush and cozy. She had to give him that. Not that he'd live much longer to enjoy it, for he was next on Antler's list, and that was why they were here. The walled grounds of Malankor's North Ward mansion spanned the space between Hassentier's Street and the Street of the Manticore, three doors east of Vezor Street, and the garden end of Malankor's spread was quite large enough for a nice marble bench, an even nicer fish pond surrounded by a decorative edging of cut and shaped flagstones, and all the cover his unannounced and almost certainly unwelcome guests needed. Tashin had no idea why Roysark Cuthbarrel found it necessary to converse in whispers, but she didn't mind humoring the man. The gods knew guildmasters got little enough fun in their busy lives of grubbing for coin, fending off feuds within their ranks, and push, push, pushing the civic authorities for tiny advances and advantages for their members. 
For a single shiny copper nib, Tasheen would happily have slaughtered her way through their ranks. Every last guildmaster in the city. But they weren't on Antler's list, and she had to admit that they did more good for Water Davians as a whole than the nobles as a group did. Not that that was saying much, but she'd best pay attention to what Cuthbarrel was hissing so conspiratorially at her before he got angry. You see, he was saying, I'm afraid the Lady Silverhand was picked to be open lord because she can magically mind-read the entire city. I've heard that same rumor, Tasheen replied, and it's certainly making the rounds of the city, but just because something's said often and by many doesn't make it true. If Silverhand could read all of our minds, we'd all have been arrested and executed days ago. Cuthbarrel frowned, then nodded slowly and glanced over at Zarela, who was lying on the edge of the fish pond watching the lazy fish drifting along under its waters and ignoring them both. She'd just finished disrobing, and the guildmaster's gaze left her bared body more than a little reluctantly. When his eyes drifted back to Tasheen, she took care to forbear from smiling or looking arch. There, there's truth in that, he admitted slowly, nodding. Tasheen nodded back encouragingly. I, and more than a few others in the city, some of them situated where they can know things for certain, think the mighty powers of the Chosen are more legend than truth. I think they can't do much more than a senior watchful order mage these days, if they ever could do more. Tales have a way of growing wildly in the telling. Have you actually ever seen an archwizard standing in midair above waterdeep hurling spells across the city at a foe? Yet we've been told that very thing has happened, more than a score of times down the centuries. I'll wager it was one man on a balcony blasting another in the street below. One or perhaps two spells each, and done. The bards and drunken tongues and taverns ever since did all the rest. Cuthbarrel looked unhappy. I like the old tales, he complained. They're part of what makes living in Waterdeep special. So they are, Tasheen agreed. Now, got the sack? It's almost time. She and Cuthbarrel were waiting to slay with the sack to muffle and then asphyxiate. Zarela was to be the lure, to get their quarry within reach, and Darleth Drake was waiting in the vines and overhanging floral hangings of the arch atop the stone gate at the end of the path through the Lord's Garden. He was standing lookout for watch patrols and other trouble, ready to pounce on the Lord and finish him off if Malankar somehow managed to flee. Even as Cuthbarrel helpfully held up his sack, Zarela calmly rose, strolled through the garden and down onto the flagstone path, chose some of the smoother stones, and knelt on them in prayer. She'd timed it perfectly. A bare half-breath later, the city bells struck the hour, above North Ward and all over the city, and as the echoes started to come back off Mount Waterdeep, Osber Melancar promptly emerged from his mansion, dapper in long-tailed coat and new three-feathered hat, with a silver-mounted walking stick in hand. He was heading out to his usual club, to go and make deals there with fellow collectors, the procurers of curios who supplied them, and fellow investors and the needy who wanted their coin. He did so eight days in a ten-day. I thank you for the advice, Laryl said gently, but this is not the water deep I knew, and Mert, it is not the water deep you knew either. You mean well, but you're not helping. Mert regarded her unhappily, and so, he growled, I need you to do what I can't do easily. Go out into the city and be my eyes and ears and hands. I can't spare the time away from the palace to do all the skulking I need done, can't spend magic on elaborate disguises, and will accomplish nothing at all but to make myself a target if I go as myself. You're not happy, Mert said slowly, peering into her face. You're not happy at all. No, Laryl admitted coolly. No, I'm not. 
Mert reached out with one hairy hand and stroked Laryl's cheek with the back of one stout finger. Laryl smiled at him. If that's an invitation, then I thank you, but no. I found my right man and want no other. I meant to comfort, not more, but forgive me, lady. He's dead, Mert growled gently. These passing years... He can no longer warm you, give you pleasure, laugh with you, scratch that itch we all have. The weave can scratch my itch if I need that, Laryl told him dryly, which is far more than you need to know. No one can be my Kelvin, so I don't want anyone to try. Forgive me. And she gave him the saddest smile he'd seen in a long time before turning gracefully away. Osber Malankar was more than at peace with the world. He was eager and happy to devour a bit more of it today, take another bite from the endless juicy apple that was Waterdeep, city of endless financial opportunities. And many of them his. Ah, to get to the gold crowns galore and fresh deals. It wasn't even about the money anymore, now that he had more than enough. It was about besting others and imposing his will on the City of Splendors, and becoming someone nobles and guildmasters alike fawned over and feared, not because he was a lord, but because he was Osber Melanker. He came down his steps humming and allowed himself a jaunty little swagger, flourishing his silver stick as he set out along his path and the arch-topped stone gate that would open into the waiting city beyond. Only to come to an abrupt halt and goggle in astonishment at the sight of a beautiful, flame-haired young woman kneeling nude on his garden path, praying. Happy dancing hobgoblins. She didn't look like a troll. She looked high-born, unblemished and gods above beautiful. He'd never laid eyes on her before, he was fairly sure. He'd have remembered a body like this one. He hastened over, summoned his wits, and after peering in all directions to make sure his garden wasn't full of watching, lurking assailants, the juniper offered ample concealment, and it was clear he hadn't seen Tasheen or Cuthbarrel said to the upturned face of the nude kneeling maiden with her murmuring lips and closed eyes, Ah, uh, good lady, well met. I am Osber Melanker, and this, well, this is my garden. Not that I mind your intrusion, but how came you to be here? The young lady opened gorgeous eyes, gave him a dazzling smile, stood up and spread her arms wide as if to embrace him, and said rather dreamily and vaguely, The goddess Ilustre led me here, for there is to be a dance on this very spot, a holy dance. Melancar was dumbfounded. Drow? Here in my garden? He'd heard the dark dancer had been seen dancing and speaking to mortals, at several places up and down the Sword Coast, but... but here? Again he peered swiftly all about, looking in vain for accomplices or approaching trouble. Seeing nothing, he asked sharply, Who are you, young miss? I... I... The fire-haired woman had a haughty patrician face, legs even longer than her glossy fall of hair, and a figure that... that... Melancar swallowed, acutely aware that he should be keeping his eyes on hers, because she was staring at him blankly. Bewildered fear rose into her eyes, and she whispered, I... I don't know, and sprang forward, flung her arms around him, crushing his nose against her bare bosom, and begged, Protect me. Oh, great sayer, whoever you are, take pity on me. Protect me, will you? Half suffocating, her deliciously rounded skin bore the faint lingering scent of a very expensive perfume that he'd smelled before at one or two of the rare revels nobles in need of coin had invited him to, 
Malankar managed to assure her he would, and somehow managed to get free of her grasp and take her by the hand. He dragged her off the path, where anyone passing in the street could glance in and see them together, and up a grassy bank into his garden. Specifically, to the curved marble bench there that stood in front of a thick row of junipers, where he sat her down to comfort her. And as he feared, his kindness made her shoulders shake and sobs come. She nestled her head against him, and just when he felt his ardor begin to stir and started to worry that she'd notice, she started crying in earnest and swung the other way, so she was facing away from him. He stroked her hair awkwardly and said a little helplessly, There, there and that made her turn and embrace him fiercely around the waist. Her head was in his lap as she clung to him, and he was acutely aware of her beauty, and now, yes, he was getting aroused. Which was when something heavy and dark and smelling of old dirt and potatoes descended and blotted out the world. A sack. It must be an old sack. The girl's weight on his lap and thigh was suddenly gone, but he felt a sharp pain in his crotch. Then her hands were at his throat, thrusting in through the sack and choking him, and other strong hands were pinching his nose closed through the sack and... 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 Melancar kicked and writhed for a surprisingly long time in Cuthbarrel's grimly firm grip before he went limp. The guildmaster didn't let go, even after Tashin had drawn three breaths and counted them aloud, panting only slightly. Cuthbarrel's wordless response was to make sure by yanking the sack off, carrying the limp Sambian to his own fish pond, and plunging him in. He held him under until the last of the bubbles stopped. That was a distinct pleasure. Cuthbarrel announced, rising, dusting his hands and staring down at the body. I owed him a lot of coin. After a moment, he turned and looked at the mansion. Now, if we get our hands on his wine cellar, the servants will all see you and be able to identify you, Guildmaster, Tashin told him sharply, as she took him by the hand and towed him back toward the path. Let's be gone, now. Zarela, don't leave any clothing behind. The other woman, still unconcernedly bare from head to toe, sneered at her. Think you're the only one who's ever murdered anyone, do you? No, Tashin replied as they all came out onto the path. That's just what I don't think. This is a city of murderers. We're surrounded by experts, and experts spot things. Let's move. And at that moment, as she looked at the gate, she found herself looking straight into the eyes of a passerby, a well-dressed man who was out on the street and gawking at them along Melancar's path. Even before she could swallow, Drake dropped on the man from above, hands taking hold and then jerking brutally. Tashin smiled, neck broken with a deft twist, as the two men crashed to the cobbles together, just like that. Drake bounded up from the body, opened the gate, and heaved the man he'd just killed through it. Then he closed the gate again and hurried toward them, dragging the dead man with him. Watch patrol, five blocks east along Hassentier Street, but coming this way at their normal trudge, he puffed and pointed the other way along the path. So we'll be leaving, right after you help me arrange this carrion with his hands around Malanker's throat, both of them underwater in the pond there. Your job, Cuthbarrel. Tashin ordered briskly. Her tone had him hastening to help Drake in an instant, but as he got his hands on the dead man's collar, he turned and gave her a hard look. And just when did I become your lackey? Tashin rolled her eyes. Not now, Guildmaster. Have my apologies and let's get this done and get gone. She saw that Zarela was dressed again. Hmm exhibiting a speed and precision that suggested she'd robed and disrobed in efficient haste many a time before. Blast and be bolt, 
Cuthbarrel muttered, eyeing the rail and Tabor heiress as he and Drake lugged the dead merchant past. I'd like to have seen more of that. You can, Zarela told him cheerfully, when we need another hidden lord distracted so you can kill him. And the one after that. There's quite the list still to do, isn't there? So many killings, Drake murmured, hauling Melanker back out of his own fish pond by one ankle and rolling him over. In so little time. No wonder assassins charge so much. Zarela strode back to the gate to peer down the street at the approaching watch patrol. She turned, hastened back toward them, and announced, We'll be leaving now. And they did. The two face-to-face -face bodies with arms now at each other's throats settled slowly down through the disturbed waters of the fish pond. Only a few bubbles rose in their wake, and by then the fish were drifting unconcernedly about again. And the watch patrol tramped on past without a glance. Laryl was beginning to get just a little tired of masked lords arriving unannounced to have urgent private meetings with her. But only a little. No matter how unpleasant the meetings, they interrupted her paperwork, and she was beginning to see that as a very good thing. There were only six of them this time. Vosker, Herimral, Hailhand, Heerlerpost, Meremther, and Kazander the six hidden lords she was beginning to grow very weary of. This morning, it seemed, they were worried by the latest murders. No, more than worried, fearful. It was Lamech Heerlerpost who voiced their urgent request, scarcely waiting for the courtiers to close the doors of the lord's moot before he started thundering. The open lord must call all the hidden lords together and vote in new members without delay. Is this the right and prudent thing to do at this time? Laryl asked, keeping her face and voice neutral. Here it comes, the power grab. It is essential. The city stands endangered. And, Braithen Kazander put in, the Open Lord and the Hidden Lords all have one vote each. We are not alone among the Lords in wanting new Lords installed. So you can agree to this now, or we shall force it at our next All Lords meeting. If you seek to delay that moot, we shall hold it elsewhere without you. Laryl nodded calmly. I did not say I was opposed. I asked what I asked so you feel strongly that we need new lords in their chairs immediately. So, my lords, who are the candidates? Ah, Heerler Post said, blinking in surprise at her ready acquiescence. Uh, well... And then, of course, he looked to Kazander. Laryl carefully did not look in that direction as she spread her hands and said softly, but icily, I'm going to be more than suspicious. If I find you six have agreed on just one convenient list of candidates to replace the same number of slain lords. That brought Heerler Post to his feet again, to sputter that no one had told him who to propose as replacement lords. He then suggested that each of the masked lords present propose one name. Not you, he said curtly to Laryl. You've not been in the city long enough. She merely nodded in silent agreement. Heerler Post gave her a smile and a nod, looking relieved, and went on. We shall then discuss the names, followed by a vote. If a suggestion receives four or more votes, that candidate makes the list. Any that don't will be dropped. Then all of we six lords here now will suggest a second name, and so on, until we have a list of six. Agreed? This seemed reasonable to everyone, but Laryl did not fail to notice that twice as he'd spoken, Heerler Post had glanced briefly at Kazander. Almost as if checking that he was saying the right things. Laryl let herself sink into closer commune with the weave to make sure no one was using magic at the table, and in an instant found an obvious blockage in the flow around Kazander. The man was 
bearing a mind stone. The oldest, most powerful elven-made variant of a ring of mind shielding. Once it would not have been able to keep her at bay, but now... Laryl only just kept her grim frown off her face. Mind stones now, and spell gemstones. They're making once a secret of the high mages of the elves. Opals or moonstones, usually, their enchantment requiring seven spells, and of those seven, two cast simultaneously to begin the process, and another two cast on the stone at the same time later in the sequence. It was all much easier if a Baelnorn oversaw the process and steered and steadied the settling magic, if done carelessly, or by someone impatient or just unaware of how slowly and delicately certain of the castings must be made. The result was an explosion of the gem and a momentary flare of wild magic. So they had always been rare and precious, and had become more so with the passing centuries. Senior priests of most churches had access to one, kept in a major temple of their faith somewhere in Faerun, but they were otherwise held by elves. With one exception. Here in Waterdeep, there might well be a score or more of the treasures scattered about the mansions of Waterdeep's nobles. Each one could have completely shielded a mind during the spell plague and probably had, for if worn or kept close, they could protect an unwitting mind. So how had Cassander... Well, a matter for another time. He definitely had one now. Laryl studied him more closely while trying very hard not to seem to do so. The man was smiling faintly, his eyes two hard nailheads as he watched her. Laryl was reminded of a deadly snake awaiting the moment when prey wanders just a bit too near. He was wearing quite a few things that might be enchanted and if even a quarter of them were, and had the powers they most likely did, some of them would only work for him if he was attuned to them. Which meant he was a wizard. Well now, as Elminster would say, well now. She'd never heard of Cassander having any aptitude for the art and he certainly wasn't a member of the Watchful Order or written down on their keep-a-watch-over list as an unregistered citizen spellcaster, but there were such things as untrained wild talents, and Waterdeep was full of folk with little secrets and pasts they didn't talk about. Perhaps this Cassander was a sometime dabbler, never trained but wealthy enough to acquire items and even pay passing adventurer mages to assist him in learning their use and attunement. Or perhaps he was something more. She had already fallen into the habit of using the weave very lightly at all meetings of the lords, at the ready to detect covert castings any lord might make so she knew Cassander had made no use of the art at all in her presence since she'd been named Open Lord and started meeting with the Hidden Lords. And that, of course, meant nothing. Nothing at all. And this Cassander could just be a sly and wealthy man who feared magic and could afford to buy magic items to protect himself against it. Waterdeep was home to many of those. Yet somehow she doubted that. The lords made their suggestions and readily agreed on four of the six candidates to be named. One man they all agreed upon was Daresk Quareth, a busy veteran investor and shipping fleet owner whom Laryl had heard, mere rumor she had to admit, was seriously financially overextended and therefore owed many favors. Not a strong candidate in her opinion, but as she'd been told she had no say in this, she kept silent. The six lords across the table from her easily agreed on two more candidates from among their second round of suggestions. Then she did speak up. In my opinion, lords, if we're to be fair... Yes? Hyler Post asked sharply, ready to do battle. You six have had your picks, Laryl continued. So if any of these candidates should fail to be voted in by a majority of all the lords, 
Your fellow lords who aren't here at this table now should be the only ones nominating more candidates. Her words fell into a little frowning silence, but it was broken by Kasalra Marimther, who thrust out her chin and announced firmly, That seems fair to me. After that, the other five hidden lords murmured their assent, and before Heerler Post could take the floor again, as he was clearing his throat to do, Laryl asked, In light of the murders, how should voted-in candidates be informed of their new status? And what do you intend to do if any of them refuse? Oh, I doubt any of them will do that, Heerler Post said dismissively. The power, the prestige, the yawning, waiting grave, Laryl murmured. Cassander looked at her sharply but said nothing, and another little silence fell. As the orcs say, Harimril commented lightly before the moment could become uncomfortable, Let's burn that bridge when we're standing on it. Very well, Laryl replied. Deferred until the meeting of all lords to elect replacements. And again, in light of the murders, when and how do you propose that this general vote of all lords be held? On the morrow, Cassander rapped out, obviously voicing a conclusion already reached. Tomorrow evening, to be precise... A supper here at the palace, as we often do for major meetings, followed by an assembly in this room to vote. And so it was agreed. After the lords had all departed and Laryl had watched them go, she turned and walked the palace back rooms and passages until she laid eyes on a particular kitchen drudge. Taking the maid off alone in a back pantry, Laryl closed the door and said crisply, You like to harp? Go tell the shepherd to send someone trusted here to me. He's to tell the guards he's found out who makes the tarts I used to love so much in the days when Kelvin and I were lord and lady mage of the city. That way I'll know he's from Tam. I will need four people told their new hidden lords of the city without my sending known palace agents to their doors. Oh, and please alert me swiftly to the slightest hint of a giantess or disguised giantess anywhere in or near the city. The kitchen drudge nodded, plucked an empty and waiting pie plate from the nearest counter, and flung it hard to the floor. The crash was impressive, and as the shards rocked on the flagstones between them, the maid murmured, I dropped and broke a plate, and you were so furious that you sent me home for the day. I flee and she flung her apron in Laryl's face, turned, crashed out the pantry door, and was gone. Laryl smiled, went and closed the door in the harper's wake, and started picking up shards. As the door behind her banged open, and a frowning cook, having heard the crash, came rushing in. That door was swinging so violently that it banged shut again behind the cook, so Laryl never saw the man he had been talking with, an individual who was now standing and listening to Laryl's explanation of the crash. That listener was masked Lord Brathen Kazander, and his face was thoughtful. Chapter 9 Progress through diplomacy. And though to many a sword seems a sharper, simpler, and more decisive an argument, there is, if one consults historical record with an open mind, free of passion and preconception, an argument to be made for solid progress through diplomacy. This has happened too often for it to be a miracle or mere chance or mistake, yet... Men being who they are does not happen enough. Garandal the Chancellor, in Chapter 7 of The Rise of Randrill, a chapbook adventure by Sandrith Yendrill of Neverwinter, published in the Year of the Striking Hawk. We're using a conveyance because some of those who sought thy life got away, and because whoever hired them is still out there. And we're off to Ulbrinter House because I want ye to hear something. All right, Jalister agreed as the hired way coach bounced over a particularly rough stretch of cobbles, almost bouncing him into a nose-first encounter with the old wizard's chest. But what and where is Ulbrinter House? 
"'Tis the city mansion of the Ulbrinter noble family, Elminster told him, and stands on Del Zorin Street in North Ward. Soaring towers, nice conical turret tops, splendid architecture. Not half the howling architecture monstrosity many of the water Davian seats of the nobility have ended up as. Ah, Jallister said to that. Understanding water Davian architecture standards is important to my cultural education, to be sure. Elminster gave him a sharp look. Ye have the blood of jail in thy veins, ye do for sure. Not to mention the sharp tongue of thy mother, Jalistra. That's going to make convincing ye to wear a disguise harder. What? A real unwashed Dale's bumpkin isn't good enough for the Ulbrinters? Jalister flared. Nay, a recognizable Jalister Silvermane remains a target to be slain for persons still unknown. The nobles and guildmasters we'll meet at Ulbrinter House don't bloody know who ye are. Or care. Ah, Jalister replied, as the coach slowed and rumbled around a corner, the coachman calling a cheery greeting to a colleague passing in another direction. That makes me feel so much better. And then he leaned forward and added earnestly, Forgive me, sir. I should be all over you in gratitude for saving my life, and I do feel that way. But I'm still angry and fearful and tend to lash out when I'm unsettled. L smiled. And would ye still be human, are ye not? Young and foolish and headstrong, aye, which is why few adventurers live to be old and successful and wise. Ah, but I see we've arrived. Thy host is the Lady Haven Tree, Remy to most, but greet her as Lady Haven Tree to begin with. The coach rumbled to a stop. Elminster clambered out and handed the coachman the second half of the fare, and Jallister was right behind him, peering alertly all around. Up and down a fairly busy street in which no one seemed to be paying them any attention at all. Here in North Ward it was quieter than more southerly reaches of the city. There was chatter and even music wafting out of high windows but almost none of the crashes and bangs of heavy labor or the unloading of crates and casks. And at the gates of Ulbrinter House, right in front of them, there was only watchful silence. Tall guards in smart armor standing to attention flanking the gates, Jallister was glad his dagger was stowed away again, and liveried servants on the inside of the bars expressionlessly surveying anyone approaching. They stayed expressionless as Elminster waved Jallister forward as if he was a courtier and the scion of the Silvermanes was of high birth and escorted him through the gates and into the waiting, soaring bulk of Ulbrinter House that Jallister would have liked to stand back and admire but was given no chance to do so. Well, at least he was still alive to have the chance to step out and look at it later. The sea breeze was as salty as it was cool when it blew around the north side of Mount Waterdeep and scudded southeast across the poorer wards of the city. Water Davians called it the Thief Breeze because it stole away words, snatching what was said and whipping it away out of hearing. Which made the north-facing slope of Castle Spur, this lowest arm of the mountain, an ideal place for a private chat low enough down not to be silhouetted on high and so attract notice, yet just high enough to see anyone approaching. And thanks to the thief breeze, any eavesdropper would have to be standing within arm's length to hear a normal-voiced word properly. Which was why two men were on the mountainside overlooking the foot of the Street of Silver right now. The one climbing it was slender and nondescript, and had been hired for his forgettable looks, as well as his ability to quietly use a knife to murderous effect. The other, who stood waiting for him, was taller and burlier, with the scars and broken nose of a long-time sailor or docker turned menacing thug. One of his ears had been sliced off long ago, leaving a hairy hole on that side of his bald head. The earless man was good at being menacing, even when he wasn't trying to be. Shrike Gulk was also a man of few words, 
so he wasn't bothering to tell the shorter, thinner man that he was late. He doubted the man would live long enough for it to matter. Mouth shut, Elminster had said firmly. Ears open. Learn. Jallister was fine with that. They were sitting side by side in the middle of a row of elegantly high-backed chairs at the very back of a wide balcony, where they couldn't be seen by anyone in the large and impressive room below. On either side of them sat Harpers bristling with weapons. Twice since they'd entered this mansion, Harpers had closed in on them, frowning and with weapons half-drawn, only to draw back with grave nods when they recognized Elminster. From down below, voices floated up to them. Lady Haventree was meeting informally with five overpainted old noble matriarchs dripping with jewelry, four old noblemen who looked to be the heads of their houses, and eight guildmasters, so far as Jallister could gather. And Elminster had just wordlessly leaned toward him and pointed down over the balcony railing meaningfully, to underscore what one husky old woman's voice had just said rather sharply to a guildmaster, interrupting his claim that the nobles of this city were all too selfishly decadent to even see the troubles afflicting Waterdeep at the moment. Oh, pish, sir, pish. You say you have Waterdeep's best interests at heart, and I believe you, but now I need you to believe me, too. When I say all of us here want our city renewed and flourishing again, we just don't all agree on how to achieve that. None of us has a monopoly on being clever or virtuous. I did not mean to imply that any of us did. The guildmaster gave dignified retreat, but before he could say more, someone loud and old and male and probably noble growled, Remy, what's this I hear about some foolhead scheme to knock down a block in North Ward and plant a little forest so lassies who like to take their clothes off and dance can go and worship Ilustray there? Jallister could hear Lady Haventree's smile. North Ward now, is it? All I've been approached about is possibly sponsoring a proposal to establish such a temple at the north end of the former field ward. Oh, and what did you tell them? That I'd love to see more trees in the deep, whatever the reason or cause, wouldn't you? Hmm. <laughs> trees are just handy firewood to me. Trees, a nasal male voice put in dismissively. Trees take years. We can talk about trees later. We've got a harassed floating castle just outside the harbor, and if the storm giant who lives in it if there's a storm giant living in it, and not some cabal of mighty wizards or a dozen undead dragons, or worse, decides to prey on ships sailing in and out, what then? How long does Waterdeep remain the busiest port on the Sword Coast, the world? Then, hey? A pressing matter indeed, a mellifluous and cultured old voice observed. And at any other time it would and should be what most occupies us. But not now. Not when lords of the city are being murdered right and left. And guildmasters, someone heatedly pointed out. And Jallister didn't have to get up and go to where he could look over the balcony rail to know that the someone was a guildmaster. That's what? Four lords down now? Someone must be after them all. For four to be murdered all by different foes in a handful of days, what are the odds on that? I wouldn't know. I do not wager with people's lives, a matriarch said icily. Oh, well, what do you think you're doing when you invest in this venture or that one? Do you truly understand causes and effects so little? No wonder you feel no responsibility. Feel no... Sra, I have nothing further to discuss with you. Good. Murders, or floating castles, or knocking down houses to raise temples, it all comes down to what it always comes down to, another matriarch rasped. What decisions our open lord should make. We should not deceive ourselves. 
We sit here doing what they do in the lowliest taverns in Dock Ward, second-guessing Lady Silverhand. She sent me a note yesterday asking me if she should refound the Navy. Why, she sent me that note, too. And me, asking if she should refound the Navy rather than continue to rely solely on Mintarn. She said she's leaning strongly toward doing so, but wants to hear any objections I may have before she goes ahead. That's how my note read, too. Well, now, a matriarch said in tones of pleased wonder, an open lord asking us for counsel before decreeing rather than after when we complain? That's progress. Hm, <laughs> sniffed an old nobleman. Lord Andalar Helmfast. Jallister had been introduced to him by Elminster at their arrival, and his rough old whine of voice was certainly distinctive. Time was when open lords did what we nobles told them to do. That's how it's supposed to work. A long time before your time, was it? A guildmaster asked skeptically. As in, lost in legend and the nostalgia of never was? Old Lord Helmfast erupted with an angry roar, but Lady Haventree overrode him, her voice ringing out like a trumpet. Loyal Water Davians all! I don't expect us to agree or even to like each other, but can we not make and keep common cause on behalf of our families and homes in the city we all love so much? Lord Helmfast? I'm still here, aren't I? he retorted. Well, I think that though we decide and vote on nothing, we can get more done here than they can in the palace because we can speak freely, another guildmaster offered. Be blunt, honest, and plain-spoken. So let us rise above wrangling over things where we are in bitter dispute and see how much we can cover swiftly so we at least know where we all stand. I brought along a list. That evoked a chorus of chuckles and snorts, but the guildmaster went on. Dismiss lists as for servants, if you must, but without them things get forgotten in the heat of tongue-wagging and never get talked over at all. We always have lists at our guild meetings. We are not, snapped a noblewoman whose voice sounded ancient indeed, going to run this city like a guild. That, the same guildmaster said flatly, is something I can't reply to properly without descending into wrangling, so let it pass. Say on, then, Lord Helmfast growled. I shall. I believe I speak for all of us who represent our guilds in this room when I say we want Field Ward and Down Shadow and Mist Shore all rebuilt so the city can hold the maximum number of people, that is, customers. No, several matriarchs said at once. Another distinctive noble voice, Lord Dolphorus Thongalier, put in. They were all slums, or well on their way to becoming so, and it's better to tear down old and build new, only higher, more floors all over the city. So the poor are everywhere, not clustered in a slum. Oh, the skeptical guildmaster inquired nastily. And will you be paying for the raising of all these expensive new buildings, only with lots of low-rent rooms for the laborers rather than high-rent suites for the wealthy? Yes, Lord Thongalier replied firmly, and several other nobles echoed him before he could add, It's got to begin with us. Well now, said the guildmaster who'd brought the list, if you recognize that and stick with it, We've done something here today. That's a big first stride toward a brighter future, if you ask me. Writing a speech, are you? The skeptical guildmaster commented. Jallister couldn't help himself. He got up and stole forward to where he could look over the balcony rail, barely noticing that Elminster was rising to leave. One of the harpers rose and went with Jallister, but said nothing and he reached the rail in time to see the guildmaster with the list turn to his nasty colleague and say, 
If you can't keep a civil tongue in your head, Raverell, I'll start knocking teeth out of that head until your tongue learns silence or politeness, I care not which. You can stay and help, or you can go. But don't be surprised if I start telling all your guild members what a disgrace they have as a guildmaster, and perhaps they should start thinking of replacing him. You'd not dare. Meddling in guild affairs is not done. A lot of things are not done, but time and again some folk in this city go ahead and do them, good and bad, while the rest of us sit and cluck disapprovingly. Am I not right, Raverell? And Gundor Raverell of the Watermen opened his mouth, closed it again, blinked, started to say something, and then just nodded, and dropped his gaze to the tabletop in front of him. Whereupon one of the nobles silently slid a goblet full of expensive wine under his nose, and when Raverell took it, he looked up and managed a nod of thanks, and then the weak beginnings of a smile. Progress. There with me, Mert said menacingly, and I paid you well for this room, so bring the food and keep your disapproval a trifle more silent. And as the housemaster flinched back, looking sullen, the fat old lord of Waterdeep dropped a generous handful of silver coins into the man's grimy palm, turned on his heel, and lurched into the private back room he'd just rented for half a day. It was the only privacy on offer in the hearty platter, a dingy and less than memorable eatery in Dock Ward that had been a tavern fairly recently, until the third brawl in as many nights had bankrupted its proprietor and left every stick of furniture in the place broken. Dreary place, but its name had made Mert smile. The Rake's Reputation, it had been called. Gone now, leaving Net Street the drearier. Aside from the lack of loudly profane and vomitous destructive drunkards brawling, this replacement establishment was not an improvement. The new owner had made do with tables and benches made of old crate sides nailed to barrels and hadn't done even the briefest lick of cleaning, but at least the smells wafting from the kitchen were hearty. Mert sat himself down where he could see the room's lone door and faced the trio of dirty and underfed young street girls a few tossed coins had managed to lure in here with him. Rava, Drella, and Waratra. Not their real names, of course, but what they wanted to go by, and that was good enough for him. He still had a few secrets, too. Their looks as they sat down, sullen sneers and pouting poses that thrust their little chests forward as they parodied fine ladies preening, told him as plainly as if they'd shouted it that they believed the last thing he really wanted to buy from them was information. Yet for the coins he'd already given, and the promise of food, he'd ordered hot eel pie, and when he heard it could be had, venison pie, too, they were obviously ready to be molested atop this excuse for a table in a filthy dock ward back room, with an old, wheezing, and overweight wreck like him. Oh, and the drink might well have been as strong a lure as the food— He'd called for the best wine, which would almost certainly be terrible, but even so likely much better than the sour rainwater beer, which was what the poorer wards of Waterdeep called the watered-down combined dregs left in tankards in better establishments of the city, and bought in barrels by places like this, that the likes of these alley rats could customarily afford. So, Sayre, which of us first— Rava was the darkest-haired and quickest, but also the dirtiest. She might in time become a bit of a beauty. Might. The three of them eyed him and traded swift side looks, no doubt judging who would try to rob or garrote him while the least fortunate of them got crushed under his lust. But Mert sat back and rumbled, I'm so overwhelmed by your beauty, the three of you, that I'm unmanned. And my knees are all a-tremble. What you offer might just stop my vitals, to be sure. So let me cleave to what I said the deal was back in the alley. Information. Just information. 
In short, let's talk. Food and drink as pay, plus coins when I think you've earned them. And mark well, I pay better for truth than for fancy tales you think I might want to hear. He was playing the flatterer. They were clever enough, and keen wits and flashing eyes and smoldering looks and a glib tongue got lasses far, but he wasn't all that partial to fleas and ribs standing proud through scrawny flesh, and even less interested in girls who were far too young to be this worldly and ruined. If he closed his eyes and just listened to their sauciness, they'd sound alluring enough, but he wasn't drunk or foolish enough to ever close his eyes within reach of lower ward lasses. The housemaster, silent and sullen, brought the eel pie, setting the battered metal tray down with a thunk in front of Mert, who pushed it across the table with his fingertips. The three girls looked at him, then pounced on it, and made an astonishing amount of it disappear before the wine arrived and they could wash it down. Mert waited patiently. They were even more ravenous than he thought they were, and, they promptly demonstrated, could belch like sailors. The pie dish was empty already. Oratra, the oldest-looking wench, pushed it away, fixed Mert with defiant eyes, and asked, So, which of us first? Mert shook his head. I need what you know, lasses, not your bodies. Her eyes narrowed. You with the watch or summit? Summit, Mert agreed, and slid a shiny new nib across the table to her. Oh, she sneered. Shiny. Made it yourself, did you? Could be, Mert replied, calmly sliding another one to Drella, who pounced on it, bit it, peered hard at it, and made it vanish inside her bodice into a slit in the leather inner lapel of her gape-front top, no doubt, in a trice. Unhurriedly, Mert slid Rava the same sort of coin and followed it, as the housemaster set it down with superb timing, with the second bottle of wine. You're trying to get us drunk, Waratra said, accusingly, but with a smile. Mert spread upflung hands in mock dismay. Ah, uh, but you're too clever for me. I should have known. Rava stared hard at him for a moment, then giggled. And as the venison pie arrived and he offered them that too, the three girls ate and drank and started to talk, and Mert slid coin after coin across the tabletop as the converse unfolded and kept a stream of questions coming. So, have you heard anything about the Xanathar? Rava frowned. You mean the new Xanathar? Far quieter than the old one. Doesn't mean he's up to less, pockmarked Drella put in quickly, eyeing the coins Mert was now putting on the table and pinning down under his fingertips. Just means he's eliminated the most talkative of his spies and bully plates. I've been alive through at least three Xanathars, Waratra said proudly. And we don't even know it's a he, mark you. We just always talk about beholders as if they're male somehow. They're horrid monsters, not people. Rava frowned thoughtfully. I wonder if they think of us the same way. Huh, Waratra said dismissively. Don't be getting yourself all deep and sagely over that. If you ever got that close to one... You'd not be wondering about their troubles and world view. You'd be screaming and running, believe me. Trouble isn't their tentacles, nor even the maws that can swallow you whole, or the magic that can kill you six, seven ways in the blink of an eye. Real trouble is that they're smarter than your nastiest wizard. But yeah, this new Xanathar lurks deeper, or makes his dirty workers lurk more. They're letting the Gentarum move in again. Oh, Mert raised his bushy eyebrows. The Gentarum, eh? Aye, Red Sally over on Wharf Street. She's one of their watchers, Drella put in. They've a lot of eyes in Dock Ward and South Ward, Rava agreed. Red Sally and Old Jack Thorne and Presdrin the Pickle Man. Ah, aye, Mert agreed, nodding. He'd noticed that ugly as several rotting squid pickle vendor at the foot of Cedar Street some days back. 
Some city Kant hadn't changed in more than a century. So far as he knew, watchers and eyes had always meant passive spies, locals on the take to just watch and report when those who paid them drifted by to ask what they'd seen. It would have been odd if the gents hadn't had their watchers here, nigh the busiest docks up and down the Sword Coast. But there'd be bigger fish, too, and forcers with knives who took care of double dealers and two loose tongues and folk who came around prying too much. Right now, that included the likes of him. He slid some silver shards their way, and their eyes brightened, and they told him about more gent agents, more gent smuggling, and the making of many little deals with shopkeepers to let the gents store contraband in their cellars in return for cut prices on roasts and sacks of potatoes. The gents are taking over some of the alley gangs. And the watch and the harpers haven't noticed? Mert was genuinely surprised. The ever-present vigilance intended to prevent the rise of any thieves' guild in the City of Splendors was very good at keeping alley gangs small and weak and unsponsored by any central authority. Them, Drella sneered, they're too busy worrying about the nobles all starting their own gangs. The what? Mert feigned more astonishment than he really felt. Well... Of course, overly rich and bored nobles who chafed at laws and scrutiny that let them throw their weight around would dabble in hiring their own dark hands to do dirty deeds and then throw said operatives to the wolves if they were ever caught at it. They always had. But what was this about nobles all? Now that Drella had seen the color of his silver, she was more than prepared to talk. Oh, there's always been high noses as lights the danger and daring, to watch brawls their hired lads start and to lash out at anyone who displeases them with a little vandalism and servant beating. But this last season, and even more this one, high house after high house is getting into it. There are even sons sponsoring different gangs than fathers, the Margesters for one, and... And the nobles' gangs are making all the noise and keeping the watch busy, Rava burst in, her eyes on more coins too. The old noble lords send them to bloody the noses of their rivals' gangs, you see. So it's brawl after brawl and bad blood building on all sides, and the watch busy every night with all the knifings, slashed faces and missing noses aplenty in those crowds. Waratra wasn't to be left out of any coins on offer, and could play the eldest and wisest, and did so now. But I see worse, much worse, in a year or two, maybe less. While these nobles' playthings make all the noise, the gents and the Xanathar and maybe others will have time to build real gangs that skulk and menace shopkeepers and do real dirty deeds night in and night out. And of course the time will come when they'll make war on each other, real war, and the guilds and all will arm up to protect themselves and we'll have night armies in the streets and buildings burnt down and all. If it gets that bad, won't the hidden lords stop all that? Mert asked innocently, sliding coins across the table to all three of them. Huh, them, Drella was dismissive. What did they do? Chapter 10 Storm Clouds Gather and Grow Dark But when the storm clouds gather and grow dark... And the wind rises high and starts to scream. Find snug harbor in haste and take cover. For in the end, heavy weather topples even the mightiest keeps. Old Sailor's Chant of the Sword Coast Set Down in Ballads of the People By Hamlayer Dunther, Wayminstrel, Published in the Year of the Bent Blade. Well now, Mert asked mildly, these masked lords, don't they rule the city? Ha! They hide their faces. Those so-called masks they wear are revel masks worn under magic helms that even change their voices. So they can really hide and make little laws that help the high and mighty stay high and mighty and the rest of us down in the dirt. They're all lords and guild masters and rich landlords and money lenders, not citizens as has to work for a living. Rava sounded indignant, 
and Mert almost chuckled until the thought struck him that lying on your back and spreading your legs and getting half crushed and pretending you enjoyed it all was work. Yes, Waratra agreed with real heat. It'd be different if they had to show their faces and everybody knew where they lived, you know? Then it wouldn't be, rut the lot of you, I spit on your worries and futures so long as my nest is warm and my larder full. Not for long, anyways. Murd hid a grin behind his battered tankard. But haven't there been lords everyone knew were lords? Not for years and years, Waratra told him as authoritatively as any wise old sage. Oh, I've heard tell there was that dashing fan fop that everybody was pretty sure was a lord. And then there was that big old fat fart of a lecher named Mert. Looked sort of like you, Sayre, only a bit more handsome. I've seen a painting of him up on the wall in the Hammered Dwarf, as owned half of Doc Ward and flat out told everyone he was a lord. But it's always those as talks the loudest as you can trust the least. And I think he said he was a lord just to get into the beds of haughty noble ladies I do. He just vanished one day, and the whole city said some husband caught up with him. Murd fought down some beer that threatened to choke him and managed to get out. Well, I thought that was Elminster. Oh, him, Drella said in quite a different voice. We still see him, though only once or twice a year these last few. Throws us coins and buys us ale and soup and never wants more than a kiss. We likes Elminster. He remembers my name, the dirtiest Rava said with a sort of fierce pride. My real name, I mean. No one else bothers. Waratra nodded, sounding suddenly on the husky verge of tears. He came walking out of the sleet three winters ago, the night of the big blizzard, saw us shivering together in Keel Alley, and bought us all a room at the Lion's Head for the night, then stood over them there until they'd served us a big roast bustard steaming on a platter. The Lion's Head! The sheets were like warm silk, Rava recalled dreamily. Sure, you can't manage us a room at the head, Sare. We'll make it worth your while, she leered half-heartedly. I don't doubt you would, fair lady, but I can offer you all something less decadent, but probably worth more to you. Mert let that sentence fall across the table, and then just waited, not saying a word more until they couldn't resist asking. It took them about half a breath. What exactly? Waratra snapped. You want to brand us, or have a service a dozen of your friends at a revel up in your rooms, or pretend to be your daughter so you can work some swindle stealing gowns from a shop or some such? No. I was thinking more along these lines. Five shards for each of you, just you three, no friends, if you show up here and talk to me as freely as you have now, a ten day from now. Five shards every ten day after, food and drink laid on each time. I may ask you to watch certain people and places and tell me what you've seen. No more. The rest of your time is your own, and you don't even know me. The three girls stared at him as if he'd just grown three heads and clapped a shining crown on each one. Just talk? We don't have to go to bed with you? Just talk, Mert growled, starting to wish they were older and a mite cleaner and he was younger. There'd been a time when he'd have lowered his standards and his britches both and... Rava was the fastest. Lord Sayre, you and I have a pact, she said formally, spitting on her hand and reaching out to clasp his forearm as solemnly as any veteran merchant. Mert did the same and they shook as equals. Show you my bite bolds for a copper extra, she teased, and just as solemnly he dug out a nib and flicked it in her direction. She caught it between her teeth, grinned at him around it, displaying a smile full of gaps, and pulled down her bodice. Sure those are worth a nib, Drella drawled. Sare, I think you just got taken and she spat on her own hand and reached out for him, Waratra only a shade behind her. But the oldest of the three pulled down her bodice as she did so and announced with dignity, I'll show you mine for free, just so you know how much you're missing.
Mert chuckled despite himself. Nice indeed, he raised his tankard in salute. We ladies are going to get along just fine. And in return they gave him three genuine, gap-toothed but genuine smiles. Laryl sighed, and for one wild, mad instant contemplated crumpling the parchment she'd just signed into a ball and hurling it across the room. Bombard inspection, Rotus? Really? Then she smiled ruefully, shook her head, and got up from her desk, took the three steps necessary so she could just reach the right stack of signed contracts on the sideboard and slid the parchment onto the heap where it belonged. She was beginning to really detest contracts and treaties. They were necessary and all, but, well, it would time for tea soon enough, and then she could... The door of her study slid open, and two unfamiliar palace servants came in, unsmiling men in full formal evening feast delivery bearing large ewers. Ewers? There wasn't a single plant in this room, and... Laryl was already clapping one hand to her ring of the ram, just in case when the foremost servant dashed the contents of his ewer at her face. Laryl ducked away, hoping it was just water and not acid or worse, and watched the second man hurl ewer and all at her, and have it fall short and drench her desk instead. He was getting rid of it so as to drag a long knife out of a down-sleeve inner forearm sheath, but Laryl had no more time to watch him. The foremost servant was around the end of the desk and almost upon her, his wicked long knife stabbing out. The translucent ram's head formed in the air between them as Laryl backed swiftly away, dodging aside and raising her right arm so she could try to bat aside the second false servant's knife if he hurled it. Then the ram's head struck, smashing the first man against the corner of her desk. He barked out a startled curse of pain as his tailbone met unyielding furniture and lost his grip on his knife. But as if his snarl had been a signal, a side door of the study burst open, and more men with unfamiliar and unfriendly faces all in palace livery charged into the room. Laryl risked a spell, walling off the room from her desktop to the ceiling and filling all of the small room beyond with spell-spun webs. Various loud and profane complaints promptly made clear how little her assailants appreciated the clinging impediments— Swords were out and being busily swung, and her foremost assailant, the one she'd already smitten with the ring, was on her side of the wall and coming for her again, his knife back in his hand and murder on his face. Laryl promptly turned to the sideboard and flung an entire heap of freshly signed parchment into his face. Ha! This was a better use for them all anyway. She charged at him through their whirling chaos as he staggered back, both arms up to intercept the wild slash of his dagger she was sure he'd make. She wasn't wrong. He was strong and fast, but her arms deflected his own arm upwards just enough to give her a magnificent opening for a full-bodied kick up between the man's legs. She took it with gusto. The false servant emitted a loud and heartfelt, Eep! and toppled face first to the floor with a room-shaking crash. Laryl winced. The man's nose had broken with the distinctive sharp snapping sound. Someone, she panted aloud, is employing expendables to try to eliminate me, or at least see how well I'm defended and what doom I can still hurl. Not much was the unspoken answer to that, she thought grimly, as flame flared up somewhere amid the webs and they started to burn. One of her attackers had brought or made fire somehow. So she'd have only a breath or two to flee before. Her desk erupted from the floor, lifted by three of her attackers, flinging it at her in a wild heave, and of course it crashed short, spewing a cloud of papers and quills and ink stands landing on its side. Enough. Time to use the door behind her and get gone before... She had only half turned when someone crashed into her through the last door and slammed her to the ground, winding her good and proper. Well met, Lair, Elminster greeted her cheerfully from atop her, his nose a bare inch from hers. Now stay down. 
Then he kissed her. She felt the tingling of the risen weave around them swirling eagerly to work, and an instant later she was staring at herself, a Laryl who gave her Elminster's familiar wink and grin air springing up off her to spin and face her foes. So, false servants fighting a false Laryl, the thought came to Laryl as she struggled for air. The webs were shrinking back in all directions as they burned, the room was filling with acrid smoke, and through it leaped her persistent attackers, swords and daggers in their hands. One of them bounded over the desk with a roar, and Elminster let fly with the weave magic Laryl had never seen before. One that in an instant, with the would-be assassin in mid-air, blasted flesh from bones, so only a bloody skeleton crashed to the floor in front of Laryl, collapsing into a welter of wet bones, sword, and dagger clattering away. Elminster waved a hand, and the desk rose up ponderously, swinging around like a great battering ram to slam into another attacker, and then another, smashing them to the floor. And then there were fresh shouts and the thunder of heavy-booted feet and a man shouting, The watch is upon you! Surrender! Surrender, I say! Open all doors! Get rid of this smoke! Halt, you! Down blades! Down blades! I... Rah! That bellowing orser parried a sword heading for his throat with a mighty swing, bearing the attacking blade to the floor, and kicked brutally at the planted leg of his off-balance attacker. The room where the last of the tattered webs were becoming ash was now full of mortified servants and hard-eyed watchguards in gleaming armor, and as Laryl mastered breath enough to clamber to her feet, Elminster melted back into himself and ordered crisply, Take them alive for questioning, if ye can, and don't get any blood on any of these documents underfoot. They're all precious. The Lady Silverhand and I will repair to the adjoining room now. We're late for tea. Sword captains, Rordans, and Orsers alike all gaped at the old and long-bearded man as he offered Laryl his arm with a courtier's flourish, and they swept out together. The last thing Laryl saw was the astonished look on Talon Tailfeather's ashen face, and she had to fight down a guffaw of glee. To see that, well, it almost made all the rest of it, the nearly getting killed, worth it. The room they entered wasn't to Elminster's liking, nor the next, so he kept right on towing Laryl along, heading now for older, smaller rooms at the back of the palace that were probably more familiar to him. A little shaken by how dangerous so relatively feeble an attack was to her lessened self, Laryl didn't protest or try to go to the stones that held her sisters, but kept hold of Elle's hand and allowed herself to be bustled down passages and through rooms until they reached a small antechamber that looked suspiciously as if Elminster had been making himself at home there. Four old and rather shabby armchairs were drawn up around tables strewn with some lurid chapbooks and a well-worn map of the city. And there was tea, with the smiling maid just retreating from the trivet she'd set it on. Ah, splendid girl, Elminster said delightedly. Such timing. And he settled Laryl into the best chair, handed her a chapbook entitled Wonders of a Wanton, and said, I particularly recommend Chapter 3, when a bed in fervent use starts sliding down a flight of stairs. Most amusing. L, Laryl asked, finding her wits and voice at last, did you know that attack was coming? An attack, to be sure. That particular one and its timing, not at all. Hence my tardy arrival. Though I'm still faster than watch guards on duty, I haven't failed to notice. Once they've all cleared out, I'll have to see to preparing your study and the open lord's audience chamber, too, with plenty of things rigged to fall on people. Fall on people? Laryl queried, rolling her eyes. When ye pull on cords, either by directly pulling their ends or by means of a mage hand. Come to think of it, did I ever teach thee weave fingers? No, Laryl told him, you did not. What is a weave fingers? A weave effect. Works like seven simultaneous mage hands. You can turn a stocked shelves storeroom into volleys of missiles to bludgeon foes. That might be handy, 
Laryl said cautiously. Later. Agreed, said Elminster, pouring tea. First, we'd best consider who just tried to kill ye. Or, to be more precise, who hired the louts who just tried to kill ye? Someone who wants me gone? Laryl asked with bright sarcasm. Or someone who wants the open lordship vacant and the incumbent's inconvenient ties to powerful chosen of Mistra allies gone with her, El responded. Agreed, Laryl replied, her mimicry precise. My point was and is that there are so many possible someones that even your welcome precision leaves us with more than, to pluck a fanciful number out of the air, a hundred thousand possibles. Have some tea, Elminster suggested. However, granting that whoever's behind the murders of the five hidden lords slain thus far may not be the same person who wants me gone, though it's tempting to equate the two, I believe it will be more useful for us and more helpful for Waterdeep if we try to narrow down our hunt for that particular villain. Elminster nodded. So Laryl leaned forward, picked up the untidy stack of chapbooks, and set them back down on the table one by one as she announced names. Here, then, the Lord's slain, and we must, I'm afraid, add, so far. She laid the first book on the table. Namandus Gorlar, slain four nights ago in the street beside his house just before he arrived home. The second book joined the first, neatly atop it. Then fell Avner Ravelmark, slain in his own stables three nights back. The third book made the stack higher. Followed by Barkeld Hailing Horse two nights ago on an upper floor of his own home, head still missing. A fourth book joined the mounting edifice. Andreth Tolver at Nander Towers last night, body still missing, but there's enough talk among the nobles about him being fed to the sewers rolled into a carpet, and there is a carpet missing that the Nanders aren't pleased about, that I don't think he's in hiding or kidnapped or enjoying some other, will resurface when he wants to, fate. A fifth chapbook crowned the stack, and just before the attack on me you so helpfully interrupted, I received word that Osber Melanker was found drowned in his fish pond, locked in the arms of another man, They'd apparently been struggling with each other. And that other man is? Laryl shrugged. We're still finding out. Not a noble or anyone known to the watch. And earlier today, six lords, Vosker, Harimral, Halehand, Post, Meremther, and Kazander, came to me to have my blessing for six candidates to put forward for the four vacancies. And these likely lords to be are... Laryl spread her fingers and counted them off one by one. Darask Quareth, a seemingly tireless veteran investor and shipping fleet owner. Zuzina Kelder, known to some as Lady Sharptongue. She owns almost a score of shops all across the city, a wide array of emporia selling everything from lingerie to cheese. Halark Tarncrown, a wealthy independent merchant and investor. Quiet, dignified, handsome sort. Kadraith Hollinar, a forceful widow who since her husband's death has gotten out of breeding horses and selling livestock and become a successful non-guild maker of staircases and ornamental shelving in the city. Zareth Kalterand, an investor and moneylender of Kalashite heritage and trade connections. Oh, and Perengel Yeskalant, a rather unlovely but unfailingly polite shipping fleet owner and no friend to Quareth. Elminster regarded her over the last of his tea. I know ye, lass. Thy tone makes it clear ye have suspicions regarding this little exercise of behind-doors decision-making of six lords for all the rest. I do, Laryl confirmed gravely. Although they made a show of all proposing names and voting on them, they did so in a way that would have suggested to just about anyone with two wits to bundle together that at least two of those lords, Hirler Post and Kazander, had discussed matters beforehand. 
and that Kazander had more or less scripted the meeting and picked most, if not all, of the names put forward as candidates. L nodded. So, if he's not our murderous mastermind, we need to find out just who is either friends with all of these proposed new lords, or has a hold over all of them. My, that'll be a swift and easy job for Chosen who can mind-read every person in all water deep in a trice, Laryl observed sarcastically. And they chuckled in rueful unison. Just as the door banged open and a certain stout former moneylender came wheezing in, hurrying and with his sword half-drawn. We're all excited down front, Mert huffed. Has there been violence? Did I miss anything? Laryl and Elminster exchanged looks and burst into laughter. Cuthbarrel looked around the tower room. You should get this fixed before it all cracks right along here and the whole works just collapses down into your grounds below. Tasheen realized it was the first time either of her co-conspirators had been in the disused northwestern tower in proper daylight. She shrugged. I've no particular attachment to this tower, or Sea Shield Hall itself, for that matter. It's always been empty, used for storage and the rack of my father's passing enthusiasms. Cuthbarrel gave her a shrug right back. But you're the family heir, and this'll be worth a lot less as a ruin than it is now, and cost much to rebuild, whereas a crew of masons and half a ten-day... But what need hath Lady Tasheen Melshimber, the only living child of Lord Harland and Lady Andrethra Melshimber, of money? Zarela asked the ceiling mockingly. Mere coin means less than nothing to the young beauty of Mel Shimber House. You have no idea, dear, Tasheen murmured coldly, and had the satisfaction of seeing Zarela stiffen. Yet they were meeting, with Drake standing lookout two turns of the stair below, to plan their next murder, not to play at being catty. So Tasheen hastened to get to the business at hand before Zarela's tongue could work fresh mischief. Our chosen victim, she announced, is the masked lord, Dethanza Mural. Cuthbarrel's eyes narrowed. The half-elf sorceress? Mural had become very wealthy in less than a decade, making and selling prefabricated stained glass windows and delicately scented tapestries and window draperies to match. She'd risen so fast and done so well that she was hated by the guilds. She's a hidden lord, then. So that's how she got so rich so quickly. The guildmaster smiled. This will be a pleasure. Tasheen smiled back. She's to be slain at her workshop tonight, when she'll be working alone in the wee hours. Cuthbarrel frowned. To be? Now, lass, hear me. When we started this, you gave us the impression we were hatching this together. All of this removing the cankers that infest the rule of our city. We were equals. Yet from the first, you've chosen our victims. At first, it seemed we were going after those you'd watched and prepared for the most. But for these last three... It seems you don't know beforehand whom we're taking down, yet once you have a target, it is that lord and no other we slay. So tell me now, is someone else selecting the lords we slay for you? Are we slaughtering our way down someone else's list? Tashin took care not to answer too swiftly, yet not to seem to hesitate, as she leaned forward to look closely into his face and, eyes steady on his, say firmly, No, Cuff. I have my spies, Drake, whom you've all seen, is one of them, and they continually bring me word of what this or that masked lord has said or done. I have my dark list of those whose votes and opinions and deeds in private life make them ripe for removal, and my spies work tirelessly to narrow down who those dark lords really are behind their masks. Once I know who a given lord is, for hear me well, I will not be party to murdering innocent Waterdavians in error, 
I ask my spies to find out all we can of their routines, of where they may be found, and when they are most vulnerable or may most easily be reached without it being too public. And when I feel I am ready, and only then, we move against them. With that said, obviously once the hidden lords realize someone is killing them in earnest, so to speak, they'll arm up and defend themselves accordingly. So as we've now started and word is spreading, the faster we can take down the easy targets, the better. Cuthbarrel nodded slowly. I believe you, and I'm sorry I doubted you. I... forgive me, but I expect nobles to manipulate the rest of us, and you are of noble birth. Cuth, Zarela put in, all humans manipulate. It's what we do. She rolled her hips, struck a provocative pose, then looked a silent question at him. Yes? Agree? The guildmaster nodded a little grimly, and Tashin decided to sweep on as if nothing had happened. Now, she said briskly, placing a scroll that had been tacked flat to a board on the table in their midst, here's the filed guild floor plan of Miral's workshop. She may, of course, have altered interior walls and doorways since it was built. I've heard tell she wasn't happy with the Durthdra. That's a dumbwaiter, Zara. Size and location, for one thing. But we do know she works alone and will almost certainly be hereabouts where she... The steel shadows were wont to take their high sun feast or the newly fashionable late sun light afternoon meal at the bountiful boar eatery on Horn Street and as Jallister had apprised Elminster of this, he wasn't all that surprised to see the wizard shamble in, stroll straight to a back table, and murmur an order for wine to a table maid. When it arrived with two goblets, which meant he'd planned this, the old rogue, he beckoned Jallister over with a wave and a smile. The young adventurer shrugged. His fellow shadows were still out seeking employment, so why not enjoy some free wine? Well met, he said with a smile, accepting a goblet. I hope you aren't going to quiz me about the moot Lady Haven tree presided over, because I tell you frankly, I soon lost track of the few names I did learn. Nay, I'm not nearly that cruel, lad, Elminster replied wryly. You're a long way from Shadowdale and I wanted ye to get a feel for those who wield power in the city, not just those in the shops and streets. Right now I confess I want to know something simpler, yet perhaps harder. I desire to know what ye want to do here in Waterdeep. Make a living as an adventurer hired out to someone, aye, but if it can be anyone for anything, where does thy heart lie? And are the other steel shadows similarly inclined? Can ye speak for them? If they disagree with ye, is it likely to lead to thy fellowship splitting asunder? And if so, are ye prepared for that? Will there be rancor? Jallister flung up a hand against the flood of questions and protested. Here now, give me time to think. But even as those words left his mouth, he heard the front doors of the boar's dining room squeal open and familiar voices jesting and chattering. His fellow shadows had returned, and once again, as had happened so often before, life hadn't given him time to think. Chapter 11 Easy Coin and Trouble Yet when peace reigns and men grow fat and proud, and sneering and lazy and ever more loud, then do the rumors leap up and start to bubble, and men talk of dark conspiracies, easy coin, and trouble. The Rolling Road of the Wayfarer, a ballad by the bard Belathra Bearlow, published in the Year of Silent Shadows. Hoy, Jalus, hard day's drinking already, I see. Who's this old dog with the fearsome beard? The steel shadows were loud, young, and swaggering, and by their voices, looking for trouble. Jallister saw Elminster put a blandly polite smile on his face and winced. He looked a silent question at the old man who gave him a slow nod. 
So as Nelvor, the swiftest wit among the shadows, loomed up over the table, Jalister said, This, my shadows, is the famous wizard Elminster, the sage of our own dear Shadowdale. His introduction was greeted with instant and open disbelief. Out of the howls of derision, Nelvor practically leered into Elminster's face as he told Jalister, Oh, I'm sure he told you he was Elminster, but has he blasted any dragons out of the sky yet, or revealed his true form? Elminster stands nine feet tall and has wands strapped to every finger, and his codpiece flashes warningly out in front of him to tell all women to beware his five-foot-long... Nelver, Jalister interrupted firmly. Leave off. It's less than wise to be so casually rude to anyone in Waterdeep. They're all too frasted likely to be someone powerful. We're not in Shadowdale now. I'll say, Eriskin, the larger warrior of the Shadows, agreed. And I, for one, am never going back there. Not now I've tasted the pleasures of the City of Splendors. Do you know they have literally hundreds of taverns here, and most of them try to have cellars with contents that differ from other drinking houses nearby? And that's just the throat slick. Why, I had some fried sea squid last night that's far and away the best thing I've ever tasted. Simply, some of us, Eriskin, think of more than our bellies, Nelver said sourly. Oh, I think of more than food, Nelver, Eriskin growled back. I ponder how in blazes we're going to go on paying for it all, and how we can't get work because you can't keep your clever tongue still for an instant and must needle this possible patron and deride that one, and... Nelver whirled around to deck Eriskin with one swift punch, but the large warrior had obviously been expecting such a response, and deftly caught hold of the swinging fist in one hand, pulled, and the off-balance Nelver went sprawling. He bobbed back up from among toppled chairs in an instant, cursing and clawing at his belt dagger only to shy back in astonished fright at a disembodied human skull that was suddenly floating nose to nose with him, hovering in midair as it whispered, Not in the boar. Oh, no. No, no, no. Not unless ye want thy manhood sliced off right this instant, friend Nelvor. Dumbfounded, Nelver staggered back as the skull pressed forward, empty eye sockets like two blackened bottomless pits scarcely a finger with the way, and slowly became aware of the startled curses of his fellow shadows as they stared at the floating thing. Who? he asked, shaken, and then his eyes lit upon Elminster, who had a goblet of wine raised in front of his face but wasn't drinking. Nelver's eyes narrowed. You, he said accusingly. The old white-bearded wizard smiled merrily. Me. I'll, Nelver began furiously, but the skull whispered lovingly in his ear. Ye will, sailor, ye will? Oh, I've waited so long. Eriskin barked out sudden laughter, and a moment later most of the rest of the boar was roaring in mirth. Nelver spluttered wordless anger and went for his dagger again, but Elminster put his smile away and shook his head. Not in the boar, Nelver of Shadowdale, or I'll stop playing with illusions of skulls and turn to stronger magic. As the lad said, you're in water deep now. Take heed and master thy temper. Your mother coupled with a snake and coin changed hands, Nelver hissed. Probably a half-bitten copper. Elminster lofted an eyebrow. That the best ye've got, Nelver? Ye've been away from Shadowdale too long, I deem. Nelver gave him a glare and then transferred it to Jalister and snapped, Jalus, get away from that man. Jalister blinked. And you became my mother when, Nelver? Come away from him, Nelver roared only to find his fellow shadows, Eriskin and Dunblade, stepping into his path, faces flat and unfriendly. That's enough, Nelver, Feral Dunblade snapped. More than enough, Eriskin growled. They stepped forward, slowly and menacingly, and Nelver was forced to give ground. 
He leaned out to peer past them and wag an accusatory finger at Elminster. You did this, old man. Did what? the old wizard asked mildly. What? the skull burbled in Nelver's ear, and he spun around with a snarl of pure fury that was almost a shriek and clawed at empty air. The skull was gone, and his wild clawings had him overbalanced. He crashed down into a luckily vacant chair, and more laughter rose on all sides. Face burning, Nelver got up glaring and tried to circle a table to stalk toward Elminster, but Eriskin intercepted him. The big warrior was stronger and faster than Nelver, and they both knew it. Nelver turned away with a hiss. Bring him, El said mildly. All of ye, come and sit. I'm buying late, son, for all of ye steel shadows. Thy coin is running out, and tis time to talk. Silence fell as every shadow turned to stare at him. And then, with one accord, they converged on the table and sat down. Nelver, Elminster said quietly, order anything ye'd like. Let us have peace. Dunblade shook his head at that, and El noticed and asked him, So now, have the steel shadows reached the end of thy road together? And at those words none of the adventurers wanted to look at him. As El looked around the table at one face after another, six faces in all, including the two silent holy folk, priestess of Timora and priest of Tempest, he'd not heard the names of yet. Likely I, Eriskin mumbled at last. I can probably find ye all work, Mel told them, hired by day end or on the morrow, but not as the shadows, all of ye together, in pairs or alone, or trios at most. I know some badly frightened folk in this city who want personal bodyguards right now. You? Nelver asked sullenly. Nay. Elminster replied, I have the skull. Nelver gave him a dark look, but no one laughed, and the moment passed. You do? Ariskin asked a moment later. That importer, Nelver said suddenly, who just wanted one of us. Run to him now, Elminster suggested, and if he doesn't want ye to start tonight, this table and my offer of food and drink will still be here when ye get back. Nelver stared at him for a moment, then nodded, and was up and hastening out of the room in a trice. So ends the steel shadows, Ariskin announced sadly. Ah, well, twas a good ride while it lasted. You mean none of us got killed, Jallister said ruefully. What coin have we made, really? What treasure gained? We have pleased Tempest, the priest of the war god declaimed, at the precise moment that the priestess of Timora sitting beside him said, Timora has been pleased by our bold foray into adventure. They traded glares, followed slowly by rueful smiles and shakes of their heads. I saw some devout of Tempest at the hiring fair today, the war priest added a moment later. I can cleave to them. The priestess looked down at the table at Elminster. And I'll take you up on your offer to find me employment, kind wizard. Thank you. And for the meal, Ariskin said, and Dunblade and Jallister echoed him. L grinned. Don't stint, he said. Eat like hungry boars while ye can. Heh, <laughs> there's an adventurer's lesson for ye. The Timoran's stomach rumbled so loudly that she clutched at her belly, winced, and said, I think we'd already started learning that one. By the lady, I'm hungry. There was a general roar of agreement at that, a din that brought table maids and a cook bustling over, and for a time everything but food and drink was forgotten. Steaming dishes were rushed to the table, decanters brought and emptied at astonishing rates and replenished as swiftly. In the midst of it all, Nelver returned, looking triumphant, and fell upon the nearest dish of roasted wild fowl like the proverbial starving wolf. And there was much merriment and belching and old tales retold, 
And in the hot and noisy heart of it all, Elminster leaned close to Jallister and asked, Which of the shadows would ye prefer at thy back in battle? Jallister looked back at the old man, suddenly sober, and murmured, You're looking to hire me, aren't you? Aye, for the palace. The palace? Elminster waved his fingers in a shushing gesture. Jallister nodded and quietly answered, Feral here. That's good, Dunblade piped up from beside him, because I wasn't planning on leaving your side, no matter what. Jallister shot him a look, and he returned it, and L forbore from rolling his eyes. He nodded instead and said to Feral Dunblade, Jallister has a talent for getting himself into trouble here in the deep. Watch his back, will ye? Oh, I shall, came the reply. Have no fears on that score, Prince Omar. That lifted both of Elminster's brows. Tis a long time since I've been called that. Student of history, are ye? Some of us, Lord, look back so we know where we stand now and can stride forward accordingly. L found himself smiling. Well said, lad. Well said. And so it was, not all that much later, that Jallister found himself hip to hip with Dunblade as they strolled, back and forth, back and forth, loitering along the edges of the open plaza in front of the palace, aside from their worn and travel-stained leather jackets unadorned with any blazon, they were unarmored, but both bore long swords and several daggers. They watched everyone approaching or passing the palace, and both the palace door guards, duty watch guards in full plate armor with the crescent moon of Waterdeep etched on chased plaques melded upon their gleaming breastplates, and passing watch patrols watched them, balefully and tirelessly. Nice to feel so wanted and popular. Dunblade muttered under the weight of one particularly hostile gaze. Jallister shrugged. Being disliked I can handle. I've grown so used to it. A few slow traverses of the arc they'd chosen to patrol later, the palace guards were relieved by a fresh shift, and the departing trustees didn't try to hide their pointing out of the suspicious armed couple to their replacements who got out their own best stony glares, dusted them off, and leveled them at Jallister and Dunblade, who traded rather mirthless smiles. This work, Dunblade complained, is going to become very boring very soon, and then stay that way for a good long stretch between now and forever. Jallister grinned. It's easy coin, fair, easy coin, so belt up and enjoy the entertainment. Notice the small things, what people do with their hands, for instance, and try to guess more than you can see, and it's all good fun. Until, of course, something bad happens, the sort of thing we're here to react to, and the real work begins. The real fun, Dunblade murmured. I'm treasuring the thought of it right now, Jess. Only he dared call Jallister that. To the rest of the shadows, he was Jalus, or worse things. What Elminster was paying them for was boringly simple. All they had to do during the hours of daylight was stay near the Lady Laryl Silverhand. Outside the palace or any building she visited while she was within, and close enough to keep her or her coach in view while she was in the streets. They were to look for nearby threats, like archers on balconies or rooftops, or someone who might hurl something from on high. They were to be disruptors, extra blades to rush to Laryl's aid if her bodyguards or the watch were taken down, thwarted, or not on the scene. And once engaged with any threat, they were to be loud so as to lure witnesses and perhaps nearby watch patrols, and try to get a good look at anyone who was part of an attack on Lady Silverhand, or seemed to be there by prearrangement to watch such an attack, but who then fled. Not pursue, but mark. Standing, waiting for trouble, Jallister commented. The life of a guard. Rushing about making trouble, his fellow former Steel Shadow gave him sardonic reply. The life of an adventurer. 
So what, O oh student of history, is the life of a king then, or a ruling lord? Sitting in one place, spouting orders and making trouble that way, Dunblade said. And history tells us again and again that some of them are oh so good at it. In accordance with the voted will of the lords of this city, Laryl told the warden of Waterdeep crisply, I sent for the Lord Defender of the Harbor to see to the reestablishment of our own navy and the building of proper inner harbor dry docks and provisioning slips for them where the ashes of Mistshore now are, only to discover that there was no Lord Defender of the Harbor any longer. When did this happen? After we came to rely on Mintarn for naval protection, the head of the watch replied rather stiffly, Someone at the palace decided it was no longer necessary to have such a post, or the office that reported to him. A substantial savings in coin, I believe. Laryl sighed. Well, Warden Draith, it seems the lords now deem spending from the city coffers to the tune of a dozen ships and skilled crews desirable. If we purchase and refit the first four... We can have them in the water by year-end, but training crews to the standard we'll need will take longer. Unless we have trusted watchguards who happen to have naval skills, do we? It has not been my business to know, Lady Silverhand, as Zender Draith said carefully. But as the refounding of our navy is hardly something that can be kept a secret, I see no reason why I can't summon each watchguard in turn and ask them. Privately, of course. Do so, Laryl nodded, but added a frown. In my day, when there was a city guard, they knew all about the lives, backgrounds, lovers, escapades, and ongoing suspicious behavior of every watch guard, and kept records, and the watch did the same for every guard sword. So, as warden, you would know naval backgrounds, if any. When did that change? Isender Draith said curtly, Before my time above civiler ranks, lady. He let out a sigh of exasperation or anger from under his close-clipped gray mustache and added, Times change, and the watch must needs change with them. Laryl nodded again. As it happens, I agree. Things have evidently changed much since I was last a daily resident of the city. So, Warden, pray enlighten me as if I were an ignorant child. With the guard gone and the Griffin cavalry with it, and no standing army any longer, what are the ranks of the watch? And do the watchful order still serve on every patrol as before? They do, lady. Low to high, we have blade, armor, sword to most citizens, sword captain, Rorden, Orsar, guard sword, commander, watchlord, of whom we have eight and then the high command. Who are? Five equal ranks. The Seneschal of Castle Waterdeep, who should not be confused with your own palace, Seneschal Lady. The Lord's Champion, Commander of the Watch who defend the palace. Then there are the Lord of the South Towers and the Lord of the North Towers. Now that we lack armies, they see to the gate guards, stabling and escort of prisoners to hearings, and the Lord Armorer, who is master of our armories and quartermaster. There was a sixth, the Lord Defender of the Harbor, and of course shall now be again. Above them, me, Warden of Waterdeep. And I should add that the watch includes members of most civilized races welcome in the city, and both genders. Laryl smiled. How many females, just out of curiosity? The Warden reddened, but had obviously anticipated this question. Just under two in every ten, lady, out of a total strength of twelve hundred sworn, and of that, eleven hundred full trained and serving. The trainees are confined to the castle except when on exercises out in the wards. Usual patrols these days are six strong plus a watchful order mage and a trainee to serve as a message runner only, save in dock ward where we patrol nine strong plus mage and trainee. Oh, and we still have two skulks, day duty and night. And in your personal and private opinion, Warden, knowing this will go no farther, are these dispositions acceptable to you? Lady? 
If I take into my head as a new and foolishly headstrong open lord to change the structure or strength or resources of the watch, or the size of patrols or any of that, what decisions would you like me to make? Draith blinked. Well, uh, none, lady. Beyond this, please let us have coin and time enough to properly hire and train naval personnel in addition to our current strength rather than leeching our ranks. Laryl nodded. And if the Griffin cavalry were to be restored, they too should be new hires rather than thinning your current standing strength. Indeed, lady. Thank you, Draith. I shall be guided by your counsel. Yet I must warn you that a possibly temporary reassignment of some duties is coming in a day or so that will take some patrols off their usual beats. Oh, it should come as no particular surprise to you that the murders of several lords have reminded the rest of their own mortality. They haven't yet openly demanded personal escorts and to be watched over, but they will, particularly if another lord should fall. Lady, if they vote in replacements promptly, that will mean twenty we must watch, plus yourself, of course. We'd have to almost strip the streets of patrols to watch them all, and Dock Ward for one is a smoldering fire that will flare up into ruination for all the south end of the city if our boots tread its cobbles too lightly. Then don't. Patrol where you must, but safeguard every lord. Lady, with our current strength, we can't run around guarding and keeping watch over every last hidden lord of the city. Oh? Why not? At the rate they're being slain, there'll soon be only a handful left. Full night had fallen, so they could begin. But they'd come this early and were now moving in such haste because the winds had changed and a storm was blowing in off the Sea of Swords, heralded by the familiar iron tang sort of salt reek every water Davian knew. Lashing rain would come soon, making climbing and rooftop work perilous. Yet Tashin and her co-conspirators took time enough for stealth as they clambered up an old and sturdily braced drainpipe toward a third-floor window at the back of the mural workshop. Drake was already at the window, and as they'd agreed beforehand, they all stopped at various heights along the drainpipe, where they could reach out, cling to, and transfer their weight to iron balcony railings, projecting window sills, and ornamental brickwork. Having the entire drain pipe peel off the building to crash down to the street below because it wasn't strong enough to bear all of them at once would be a fool's death, to be sure. Masked Lord Dathansa Mural, Tashin whispered to herself, one arm wrapped around a balcony railing. Here we come. Prepare, as the chapbooks say, to meet thy doom. Unless their quarry had made major changes inside her workshop for no good reason Tashin could think of, the window Drake was working on should open into a tapestry storage room on the floor above the workshop where the half-elf should be hard at work casting spells on her glass to make it flow into swirl-tinted sheets from which she'd later cut the shapes she needed. Except that there wouldn't be a later for Meryl. Not now. Not if they accomplished what they'd come here to do. Hard luck for the clients awaiting the beautiful stained glass windows they'd ordered, but necessary for a brighter future for Waterdeep. She was still sure of that, no matter what else Antler was up to. Drake was still working on the window, calmly and carefully using a short iron pry bar of his own making to crush the weathered wood of the sash enough so he could get the narrow end of the bar, the end that resembled a mortar trowel for the very good reason that it was a mortar trowel, in between two bits of the frame to the catch beyond and shove just so. And the window side open. Drake leaned back with the satisfied air of a master craftsman, just as a lantern blossomed around the corner and moved into Flint Street. Farouk, Zarela swore under her breath, peering at it as it bobbed nearer. Farouk indeed, Tashin whispered almost soundlessly. A watch patrol happening along at precisely the worst possible moment, 
what with the four of them clinging to the drain pipe at various heights in dark clothing, on obviously unlawful purposes bent, with nowhere to hide and no way to move to hiding in time, not to mention a killing fall to the cobbles far, far below. The patrol came on, not all that far from the mouth of Farrah's alley now, and the workshop was only four doors south of that moot. They couldn't fail to see Tashin and the others, who were for it now, unless they could surrender to the patrol without being recognized or trust in capture hoods, then somehow escape. And it was a full patrol, too, trotting along, looking fresh and enthusiastic and alert, not bored or sullen or half asleep and inclined to overlook anything, like some of those who drew dock ward duty in the chilly dead of winter nights. And then, with Tashine's heart in her mouth and despair worming its icy way up to take hold of the back of her throat from within, a miracle happened. Back behind the patrol from around the same corner with Ivory Street that the patrol had come, there was a sudden loud crash and flare of flame. The watch guards whirled around, taking their scrutiny and attention with them and beheld not just the flaming crate that someone had just hurled into the mouth of Flint Street, but the masked figures who burst past it and fled east along Ivory Street. The patrol gave chase, sprinting back the way they'd come, away from the workshop. And Tashin dared to breathe again, as a thought struck her. This was Antler's doing. Her mysterious employer had sent others to watch over them and provide certain aid, such as this distraction, if the need arose. Sensible? It was only after she'd accepted the window Drake had just cut out of its frame and let down to her on a cord and slid it carefully onto the balcony between the upright wrought iron baluster she was clinging to and the next one that a cold thought struck her. That aid might well include crossbow bolts to the throats of Tashin or her fellow conspirators if they were captured by the watch. Before serving the watch guards the same way so every last body could be whisked away beyond the reach of priests and any chance of speaking with the dead. Farouk, indeed. It gets cold out here at this time of night. Dunblade was stating the obvious, but Jallister wasn't irked. He was cold, too, and just as bored. Easy coin, he reminded, and he paid us half in advance. Huh, easy coin until the trouble starts, his closest friend in the world grunted, peering again at the palace door guards watching them, and at the newest watch patrol to stride through the plaza giving the two adventurers from Shadowdale hard and searching looks as they strode past. Jallister gave them a tight smile in return, but they seemed far less than impressed. Magnificent stars, he murmured, looking up above the great dark bulk of Mount Waterdeep that rose above the palace and made it seem small and toy-like. Their shine is perfect, Dunblade agreed. For what? Kissing you, he replied, and demonstrated. Fair, we're on duty, Jallister protested when he could breathe again. So we are, and I'm warmer and less bored and a whole lot more alert and attentive already. Give me your mouth again. Clever tongue, Jallister snorted, and did. Drake hadn't gone in with them. As arranged, he'd moved to a nearby rooftop to sit lookout while Tashin, Cuthbarrel, and Zarela had slipped into what had turned out to be a drapery storage room. Endless shrouds, still air, and dust. They found the stair at the end wall where the plans had shown it would be. It was faintly lit by an old and failing drift globe in a cage, and in that dimness they descended as stealthily as they could. Which was, Tashin judged, pretty slarning stealthy. The stair ended on the floor below in a room that was full, dark and silent, hung with scores and scores of tapestries.
hanging from bars depending from the ceiling on cords, ornate cloth filled the room in rows with passages barely the width of a person between them. Tashin had never seen so many ranks and ranks of tapestries in one place. To get to the workshop, they would have to cross this room. The stair to the next floor was along its far wall. She started forward, but Cuthbarrel dropped a hand onto her shoulder, shook his head, and stepped to the fore. The guildmaster stalked along slowly and warily, trying to make as little noise as possible. Somewhere ahead and below them was a sorceress. Tashin was right behind him, so she caught a glimpse of it. The slender blade that thrust out without warning between two tapestries and deep into Cuthbarrel. Chapter 12 We Touch Again at Last so now we're truly parted, with half the wide world between, past fury nigh forgotten, our fallen tears dried and passed, and my heart turns as I hunt, finding only where you've been, until that blessed moment, when we touch again at last. To Find You, a ballad by the minstrel Iron Hand Jack, published in the Year of the Ring. Cuthbarrel roared in pain and clawed at tapestries as he fell. In the next instant light flashed, so sudden and bright, that in its white, white wake, Tashin could see nothing at all. Behind her, Zarella gasped in pain. Back! Tashin hissed at her, and heard her turn and run. They sprinted, not trying for quiet, but just running blindly back along between the tapestries. Tashin thrust out her arms so her fingers trailed along cloth after cloth, keeping her from blundering into any of the hangings. Back to the stair, they had to get back to... Zarela let out a horrible gurgle ahead. A moment later, Tashin stumbled over her falling body and fell hard to hands and knees, but didn't stop. Clawing her way hastily over her unseen fellow conspirator, Tashin clambered back up to her feet and kept on running blindly. Drawing her longest and most slender dagger, she hacked high and to one side with it as she ran. Thrice it struck tapestries and rebounded, but her fourth slash caught on a cord, and she twisted and pulled all her grunting momentum into slicing. Severing the unseen cord and causing a heavy thudding of tapestries to the floor, a floor-juddering collapse of cloth that brought a startled marumph from someone Tashin couldn't see. The Sorceress. Tashin turned and stabbed blindly and repeatedly at where that exclamation had come from in a desperate panting frenzy. Until something covered under cloth went down in a heap, a heap she circled by feel, a hand planted on what was probably under the tapestry Mural's head, stabbing and stabbing as she went. Every thrust brought a muffled shriek or sob until she trod on what was probably a leg and fell hard to the floor, banging her elbow. Her fingers burned as her dagger cartwheeled and clattered, and the same slender sword that had killed Cuthbarrel burst out of the tapestry bundle and hissed at her, lancing past so close that it passed between Tashin's flank and her bicep, slicing open the leathers on both and drawing blood. She twisted away as that blade sought her life again, flung herself to where she could snatch up her dagger, then whirled on one knee and lunged, stabbing ruthlessly into the tapestry heap right beside the jutting slender sword, hurling her weight onto the bundle so as to win through it with her shorter blade and to prevent the sorceress beneath having room enough to draw back her blade to stab forth again. Snarling, Tashin bore down, kicking at the floor to shove her dagger farther in and in and in. There were horrid wet sounds from beneath her, and the tapestry sagged and what was beneath it stopped moving. Panting, Tashin staggered up from it, slipping in stickiness that must be blood leaking out from under it. She made certain by tugging tapestry aside until she'd exposed something she could stab. So she stabbed it again and again. 
By the time her arm was too tired to go on stabbing, she could see again, a little. She staggered back to Cuthbarrel's body, because the guildmaster was carrying a tiny, sturdy metal night lantern at his belt and a slender, stylish striker box. She could light a lantern that simple by feel. When its flame was hot, she left its shutter open, went back to the bloody tapestry she'd clawed off the sorceress, patiently set the cloth alight, then used the point of her dagger to drag the tapestry back over what was left of the sorceress. She watched the smoldering rise into little licking flames before lifting the lantern on her dagger point to set alight tapestry after tapestry hanging around her. By the time half a dozen were afire and smoke was beginning to billow, Tashin could see well enough by their light to make out the room. She found the stair down, stumbled down it to the workshop, crossed that maze of trestles and glass and tables strewn with glass to the nearest door, and let herself out. The night air was sweet and cool, and she left the door open so it could slide freely in and feed the blaze on the floor of tapestries. And then Tashin drew in a deep breath and slipped away, hurrying as swiftly as she could without running, hastening along expecting a crossbow bolt to thud through her between her shoulder blades before she got halfway home. She knew of two revels going on tonight, both nearby. The Heel Gauntlets were hosting at their city mansion, Heel Gauntlet House, barely a block west on Ivory Street and the other affair was being thrown by some wannabe noble called Iv Pike Warasper at his expensive new house at the Ivory Street end of Flint Street. Tashin looked down at herself and decided her dishevelment and blood would be too remarked upon to make a public appearance at either. But if she could get into the Hill Gauntlet Gardens, dive into the pond there to get some of the blood off and to explain her bedraggled state, she could wait for the rain to come and under cover of the downpour walk the rest of the way home with a ready reason for looking like a drowned rat. If she ran into a watch patrol, she could simply say she was attacked by ruffians but got away. As it happened, the rain got there first. It was falling in clinging sheets by the time she reached the tree-overhung and ivy-cloaked walls of the Hill Gauntlet grounds, where the tall, many-barred garden gates were standing open from earlier in the evening when the garden had been full of chattering, drinking revelers. All gone now, driven indoors or home by the quickening rain, Tashin made for the pool, only to stop and draw back as lights from inside the mansion reflecting back off a wet, burnished copper sculpture showed her movement amid the pillars of the open summer house. Two amorous silhouettes busily becoming one. Smiling mirthlessly, she circled around behind drenched shrubberies until she could get close enough to be sure. Yes, one amorous couple who were evidently quite happy to taste each other's charms in unwalled privacy, shielded from the wet by the summer house roof. They hadn't noticed her and were too lost in lust for that to change as Tashin approached to where she could stand right over them. Then she took a step back, doffed her soaked and clinging jerkin, and flung it down like a shroud over both their heads, following its arrival with hard and vicious punches. She rained down blows as hard as she could, to bounce those shrouded heads many times against the marble summerhouse bench they were lying together on. And when she had to stop for breath, the couple lay still and silent. The female had already disrobed or been disrobed, so Tashin only had to tug her natty gown from under the woman's hip and shrug it on. Too tight. Hmm. Would nothing go right tonight? Bundling up her jerkin to take with her, she departed the gardens, vanishing into the teeming night. The window of her bedchamber in Mel Shimber House would afford her a view of Dathanza Mural's workshop. By the time she reached her room and looked out the window, flames were leaping high from the uppermost windows of the building in Flint Street, and the air flashed with purple and orange radiances as watchful order mages hurled fire quench spells. They were in time to save the stone structure if Timora was with them 
but as for the bodies in with all those tapestries... The Seneschal had been insistent, but Laryl had dealt with insistent men a time or ten thousand before. Increase watch patrols, of course, she told him firmly, but we shall not be closing the doors and turning this place into a fortress. This palace belongs to the people of Waterdeep. I shall become neither a cower or a tyrant, nor let anyone turn this building into my cage. And now that interview was done and she was alone again and pacing. Not that it seemed to help all that much. No matter how many times she walked through her rooms in the palace and back again, the problems she was mulling over remained the same. She had her suspicions, but were a handful of masked lords merely the most visible members of a conspiracy? Or was she wronging them? And they were mere opportunists, not behind these killings at all. And just what were the killers, whoever they really were, trying to achieve? Lady, the voice greeted her, soft and low, from one of the darker corners of the bedchamber she didn't use. Ah, yes, the all-too-busy secret passage behind the bedhead one of several in that room which made one wonder about Pierre Guerin's saintly reputation. It was a voice she knew, but Laryl put a hand to her rings anyway, just in case. Her visitor came forward into the light, empty hands spread, palms out in a reassuring, I'm not ready armed signal, and murmured, We touch again at last. The current passphrase. Half the wide world between. Laryl answered, then greeted the dark-haired and graceful Harper less formally. Revelara, what news? The matter you asked us about, Revelara said gravely. Lady, so far as we can tell, and of course not including possible spell work, Lord Neverember has had no contact with anyone in Waterdeep this last ten day. Whoever's killing hidden lords, they're not conversing with him about it, at least during the time these slayings have unfolded. Laryl nodded. I think we must seek nearer at hand for our slayers, she said softly. Revelara nodded back, raised a hand in farewell, slipped back through the panel again, and was gone. Laryl had turned and paced halfway across the next room before another voice she knew said quietly from behind her, I think so, too. Vadra, the black staff. Laryl whirled around. How long have you been here? she asked softly, trying to conceal how alarmed she was. How was it that she'd felt no hint of Vadra's approach through the weave? And then she saw gems winking in awakened life behind Vadra's back and knew why. Those stones were mounted on the head of the black staff which was part of the fragment of the staff Vajra bore. Vajra did not reply, but merely gazed at Laryl, her face set and expressionless. Laryl studied her and reached for the weave as imperceptibly as she knew how, and then she saw Elminster coming silently up behind Vajra, looking grim, his gaze fixed on Vajra, ready to slay. Well, Laryl asked wearily, if you won't answer that, Vajra, how about giving me an answer to this? Why are you here? Still silent, Vajra stepped slowly closer. Elminster moved in unison with her, the weave rising to shine in his eyes. Laryl's hair began to stir around her shoulders involuntarily as she called on the weave, too. For so long she had been a creature of spells, spells and diplomacy, not raw weave work, and she hadn't Elminster's skill at keeping what she did subtle. Yet the alternative to warning a potential foe what she was up to was to leave herself standing undefended, and very likely die here and now if... Vajra's gaze went to Laryl's restlessly coiling hair and then back to meet Laryl's eyes. As she went slowly to her knees, whispering as she gazed up at Laryl and slowly extended the fragment of the black staff, holding its gem-adorned upper end to be grasped, 
I come not as any peril to you, Lady Laryl. I come to you on behalf of one who loves you very much. Her lips were trembling, and unshed tears were rising to glimmer in her eyes. Laryl cloaked herself in the weave, letting its rush of energy crackle and glow unhidden around her. She would need all she could summon if hostile spells had been cast into the black staff and held ready to discharge into her at a touch. Then she reached out, slowly but firmly, and took hold of the proffered head of the staff. Beloved, we touch again at last. That mind voice thundering into her out of the staff made her weak in the knees and drove her to the edge of tears in the briefest of instants. It was Kelvin, her Kelvin, as strong and confident as ever. And yet it was not. It was a cold, dead echo, a vestige of Kelvin enshrined in what was left of the staff. A remnant in a remnant yet strong enough to control Vadra, and trying now to seduce Laryl, playing on her yearning for him, for what they'd had together, playing to gain her vitality, her living energy. He, he is gone, and so is what we shared, she whispered aloud, voice quavering on the husky edge of grief, as Elminster stepped around Vajra and came up to stand with Laryl and put a comforting hand on her shoulder. Why? she asked him, almost pleading. Why so much hunger? The echo of Kelvin that remains in that stick yearns for life, El told her gravely, and thine is strong. It needs to feed on ye, as it has on this poor innocent here. Vadra stared up at the sage of Shadowdale, fear and dawning indignation at being called an innocent clear on her face. Sudden but silent tears burst forth and rained down from Laryl as she took what was left of the black staff, gazed into it for a moment that made its gems flash and wink into hopeful life, and then firmly handed it back to the woman kneeling at her feet. This is yours now, she said. What it holds is mine no longer, and has no hold over me. Vadra stared up at her, and then silently offered the staff again. Laryl bent down as if to take it, but instead shook her head and whispered fiercely into Vadra's face, Go, child, go, before I give in to my grief and anger, and you get hurt and the weave flared up around her and streamed out of her eyes like sudden cold and crackling flames, bright silver and terrible, as Laryl's hair stood out straight all around her in a great silver halo of spikes. And Vajra whimpered, fell back, and then sprang to her feet, turning and running all at once, and fled. Racing wildly, the black staff in her hand spitting forth fitful silver sparks. Laryl stared after her, tall and terrible in the silver-filled room, seeming to loom taller and taller, until she gave out a great sigh and shrank back down into herself again and started to cry in earnest, her racking sobs silent as she shuddered out great helpless tears and Elminster put his arms around her from behind and held her close, his head against hers as he rocked her gently back and forth, seeking to comfort her. There, there, lass. There, there. The old mage's crooning was interrupted by a loud and boar-like grunt from under the desk nearby. It was followed by another— and the thumping of someone banging a knee or elbow against heavy old wood as they started to move. Then the grunts became one long ursine growl, a bestial roar that brought Mert the moneylender rolling into view, drawn sword in hand. Will you stop crying, woman? he snapped. You're fair drowning me down here, you are, and after all that silver flame and so much power gathered that the air is full of silent thunder and my every last hair is standing on end, 
I think the ghosts of your sister's dub and Silene were wrong. I don't think you need a hidden helpful bodyguard at all. And Laryl stopped crying, stared down at him in astonishment, and burst into helpless laughter. Tashin came awake out of a nightmare of running naked through the streets of Waterdeep in a torrential night rainstorm with her skin of fire and the crackling flames roasting her like boar as she went, yet failing to ignite the blood-dripping severed heads of four, no five, no six masked lords she was clutching in one hand while laughing watch guards pursued her, and no matter which alley she dodged down, Antler always loomed up ahead of her, wearing a terrible smile that promised doom. Something had awakened her. Some sound. Small, but nearby. A sound that shouldn't have been there. A stealthy sound, something breaking, or rather being broken by someone taking great pains to keep what they were doing as quiet as possible. Tashin lay in her bed in the pitch darkness, straining to hear. It had come from that direction, at least a room away, but there, another sound, small, scarcely audible, but quite definite. Someone was quietly breaking into Mel Shimber House, two rooms over from hers. Stealthily. Tashin drew in one long, deep breath and slipped out of bed by the swiftest safe way, snatched up her best two poisoned daggers and padded naked in the pitch dark to the door, then out into the passage. No time to get dressed, no time to light lamps. If she was swift enough, she could get to where she could stab whoever came out of that door. It was slowly being drawn open as she got there, and took her stance against the wall beside it. She was in time. Just. Now, blades up. Even if they blocked her first fang, the second should get them right in the... Whoever it was emerged, and she struck... Her first dagger was parried, the second caught and held by a deft hand closing on her wrist. Then both her wrists were twisted ruthlessly and her dagger sent flying and her assailant kept on twisting and pulling and... She ended up on the passage floor, winded and pinned and staring up at the intruder who was holding her down. He thrust his face close to hers and she saw who it was. Darleth Drake. My apologies for awakening you, lady he hissed, and visiting alarm upon you. I'm very sorry I had to do this, but... He fell silent as he saw Tashin look past his shoulder at who was now lurching out of the room he'd emerged from. The brightest thing about Zarela Railentover was her glittering eyes. Much of her skin had burned away, leaving her face horribly disfigured. Nose almost gone, bone showing through one cheek, teeth visible through crisped gaps and all of her hair was gone, leaving a scorched and blackened skull. Her clothes were burned into her skin, and were tearing it away in places as she moved, trembling in pain. Oh, may Timora deliver you, Tashin gasped. Zarela regarded her bleakly before that ashen, lipless mouth moved. You did this to me. Get me some larand, if you have any, before I go mad from the pain. Drake rolled away, and the freed Tashin sprang up from the floor and ran to obey. So she never saw Drake pluck forth two daggers from sheaths in his boots, daggers identical to the poisoned pair he'd procured for her a month back, and quickly retrieve her daggers, picking them up carefully by the pommels and slip them into his sheaths. For her part, Zarela leaned against the wall and shuddered in helpless agony, until Tashin returned with a small flask and gingerly poured it into Zarela's lipless mouth. The burned woman reeled, spasmed, flung her head back against the wall and banged it there thrice as she whimpered in pain, and then relaxed with a gusty sigh, slid down the wall, and then, with a terrific effort, straightened herself and stood tall. Temple of Timora? Tashin asked urgently. 
The bright new house of Lady Luck Temple was a curving walled thing of beauty a mere three blocks away at the corner of the Street of Whispers and Diamond Street. Temple of Timora, Zarela confirmed flatly. You pay. We go now. After you dress and get me a cloak. Wait, Teshin said quickly. We need a fire to account for you, your injuries, that is. Not the workshop, something else, or the watch will have you in chains the moment you leave the temple. And so, Amasker Gwelt is hosting a party for his investors in the upper rooms of the Diamond Masks tonight. The Larend had done nothing to slow Zarela Railentauber's mind. The next masked lord on our list? Yes, and no one will successfully bring back from the dead someone whose ashes are so mingled with those of many others and the building they were all trapped in. After a moment, the ravaged face twisted in a grimace that was meant to be a smile. They'll be reeling drunk by now. They hired doxies, no doubt, so let the diamond masks burn. Tashin nodded and started to turn eagerly away, but one of Zarela's blackened hands closed on her shoulder like a claw. You, she said fiercely into Tashin's face, will go inside and make sure he's in there first. I'm not burning down buildings full of random water Davians. Tashin dressed and encloaked her blackened fellow conspirator in the space of a few hasty breaths. It took the three of them only a little longer to travel the two blocks from Mel Shimber House to the Diamond Masks. The club was a rebuilt villa that stood a door east of Gale Turrets, the city mansion of House Hustim. Zarela stood lookout, leaning against the carved and twined and leering gargoyles pillars some long ago Hustim had unaccountably favored, as Drake easily scaled the many balconied club wall on his way to set fires on the roof, and Tashin went inside in search of their next masked lord. The club was crowded, but obviously in the drunken and wanton declining hours of Gwelt's get-together. Tashin nodded brightly to the club door jack and went straight upstairs to an upper floor that reeked of spilled wine and spewed stomachs and strong perfume and arousal, where she picked her way through room after room of slurryingly chortling revelers and blearily amorous couples until she found a candlelit chamber dominated by a magnificent four-poster where Amasker Gwelt was abed with two play pretties. He recognized her and gave her a leer over the rounded curves of the two professionals entwined with him, but the women were less welcoming. Go find your own, one of them sneered. Tashin stared at the trio for a moment, a moment in which she could already smell heavier smoke than the reek of the candles and then smiled, strode to the sideboard, and took up the nearest of the pair of slender-lit candles in heavy metal candlesticks. She pinched out its flame between her fingertips, ignoring the pain. One of Gwelt's hired companions watching her exclaimed, Oh, a lover of pain, in tones of oh-so-astonished mockery. Tashin met the eyes of that play pretty, plucked the candle from its ornate metal holder, and rammed it into the woman's mouth. Before the startled doxy could spit it out, she reversed the candlestick to make of it an ornate little mace and dealt hearty blows to the heads of all three people in the bed. Gwelt and the two women slumped unconscious, and Tashin tossed the candlestick atop them and strode out of the room, leaving them to the flames. Once she was back out on the street, she turned and looked up at the club roof to see smoke billowing and tiles already beginning to crack. Some tiles had been pried up and shoved aside to create gaps in the roof, and flames were leaping up and dancing through those darkening clefts. Drake joined Tashin with a satisfied smile on his face, towing the encloaked Zarela. I think we'd best be gone, he observed airily before inquisitive watch guards get between us and Timora's healing. As they hastened away, the flames behind them reached for the starry night sky with a sudden roar. It was bright mid-morning in Sea Ward, 
and although the reek of smoke still hung strong in the walled grounds of gale turrets, the smoke itself was gone. Here in Lord Erland Hustim's front upper floor study, the sharp smell was thankfully fainter as two lords sat over wine alone. The house servants had been dismissed and told to stay out of earshot. The visiting noble made polite mention of his host's fortunate escape from the ravages of last night's regrettable and disastrous fire next door. Quite so, Lord Hustim said briskly. The gods are to be thanked. The blaze did no more than scorch the thick old stones of my outer wall. The diamond masks was gutted, however, its roof falling in through the floors below, so there'll no doubt be months of hammering and worse as they rebuild. He poured them both refills and added, But I asked you here for a reason of more import than a club fire, Lord Groland. I expected as much, Lord Hustim. I'd like to begin by asking a rather impertinent question, my only defense being that these are, it seems, increasingly impertinent times. So tell me now, was a certain Lord Orand Crawland asked to be a hidden Lord of Waterdeep? Crawland waved a deprecating hand. Well, well, uh, that's not the sort of thing a man of breathing— So was I, Hustim interrupted. I refused, and I'm sure you did, too. Only a fool is going to say yes when it's a death sentence, so they won't get too many highborn. The fools among us are those who'll never be asked. And so? And so they'll soon run out of lords, or nearly so, and get desperate, and start appointing just about anyone. We'll be ruled by a bunch of grasping commoners, bane blast all. If we push the right way, we can get quite a few guildmasters to accept, and guildmasters, you're mad. The moment they get their hands on, indeed. However, I've noticed, else any child would notice, they don't agree on much among themselves, and unless the murderers are only looking to slaughter nobles, they'll be targets themselves soon enough. Lord Grawland swallowed a good amount of wine and nodded slowly as he did so, but came up for air with a question. And what if they survive and we're ruled by frasting guildmasters? Lord Hustim smiled a cold and ruthless smile. Well, considering how easy murdering masked lords seems to be, and how ineffectual the watch obviously is, we simply eliminate every guildmaster we don't want breathing water Davian air any longer, and keep only the good ones. So nominate and push those we hate, and in this way we'll get rid of them. Lord Grawland stared at his host thoughtfully, then broke into a wide and wicked grin and raised his goblet in salute. Chapter 13 We All Do What We Can I see your somber and wary haste as you prepare for war, readying to defend these walls and seeking spies within them, for you are like to die soon a fighting for this city. But are you worried that we lowly shopkeepers shall not? Hear me and be assured, lords, that we all do what we can. Wrath held small cloaks in Chapter 5 of The Siege of the Doomed City, a Fantasy, by Amara Harholis of Athcatla, published in the Year of the Starving. Pray pardon, Lady Silverhand, the courtier said apologetically. But six lords of the city are here and asking to meet with you. And I know just which six, Laryl thought, as she gave the man a warm smile and replied, Thank you. They're in the lord's moot, I trust. They are. I shall attend them in all haste. Please tell them so. She dismissed him with a nod, and he bowed and withdrew. She knew the reason for this visitation— a haggard Azender Draith had just left her after a hurried visit during which he'd promised to try to set watch over every surviving hidden lord of the city. A ticklish business, lady, he said gloomily. 
I must manage to guard them all without tipping off everyone in the city as to their identities, so I've been forced to split up the skulks and assign one skulk member to heading up each guardian force. Our thinking is that these forces will bide near the lords they're guarding, but not directly accompany the lords. Functioning in addition to any private bodyguards a lord has or may wish to hire, Laryl interpreted. The warden had nodded. They're hiring like fury now, and so are guildmasters and nobles and most of the wealthier independent citizens, too, all over the city. Pay rates are soaring as the most fearful try to outbid each other, and we've seen at least two bloody clashes already over not much at all. Just rival bodyguards eager to demonstrate their dedication and all too apt to see threats in every person standing too near. That scramble had erupted thanks to the news and wilder rumors now raging across the city. Three more citizens revealed in death to have been masked lords had been murdered over the day and night before. The Sembian wine seller and collector Osber Melanker, the half-elf sorceress and artisan Dathansa Miral, and the moneylender landlord and investor Amisker Gwelt. So all Waterdeep now knew someone was killing the lords of Waterdeep one by one. Yet that was about where truth ended and speculation, however dressed up as truth wagging tongues could make it, began. The broadsheets were full of wild speculation. Who's behind this? The ousted Lord Neverember? The Gentarum, or Cult of the Dragon, or some other outland power? The Xanathar? Some cabal of guilds or nobles planning a coup? It would rage on, whatever she or anyone else did or didn't do. That was the trouble with rumors. Once loosed, they were like untamed beasts rushing everywhere, snarling with no good way of stopping them. And as she had that thought, one of the rear entrances to the Lord's Moot loomed in front of her. Laryl put a calm smile on her face, pushing open the door, and strode in. The same six masked lords that had met with her last time faced her again across the table. Vosker, Herimral, Halehand, Healer Post, Meremther, and Kazander. They did not look happy. You've heard the news? Healer Post said before she could utter a word, a statement, not a question. As Laryl started to nod, he swept on. We've hastened here to name more candidates for these new vacancies. Uh, wait, where are you going? For Laryl had turned on her heel and reopened the door she'd come in by. She stopped, looked back at them all over her shoulder, and said firmly, letting her gaze move calmly from one of them to the next as she did so, we have an agreement, lords. After a late even feast tonight, all the assembled lords will meet here in the palace, in a room all of you are unaccustomed to gathering in, a chamber I've selected because it can be isolated, with watch guards and watchful order mages ready for trouble in all the rooms and corridors around it, and your fellow lords of Waterdeep will then have their opportunities to nominate candidates. She took a step back into the doorway. But, Hearler Post sputtered, if the assembled lords can't agree and not every vacant lordship gets filled, what then? We need not have every mask worn, she reminded him. By tradition, just nine masked lords and the open lord are sufficient to rule. By tradition, not law, Braithen Kazander spoke up, his deep and deliberate voice as flat and emphatic as a king's. But Laryl met his gaze with a calm and steady lack of expression. There is no law as to the minimum who can rule, she replied, and by tradition in time of war or crisis, and is this not a time of crisis, lords? The open lord alone can command. She let those words hang in the air, and Islamic healer post swelled up for another outburst added crisply, I assure you all that I have no intention whatsoever of becoming some lone tyrant and will, if a majority vote of the surviving lords when the meeting commences tonight goes that way, step aside as open lord and depart this city. However, I believe this may be the very worst time to force me out. She gave them all a smile then and added, So go and get some sleep and eat heartily 
or if you'd prefer not to step outside these walls again until after our meeting tonight, or even tarry within the protection of the palace longer, we certainly have well-appointed apartments enough to house you in comfort. Stay here and dine and converse. We lords meet together, all of us, to dine and to decide matters tonight. But— Hirler Post began, and then Laryl shut the door on whatever else he went on to say and strode away. It takes patience to train stubborn beasts. She smiled. Even me. Oh, Drella said mockingly. Big coin. A private booth. Fancy, fancy. Tell me now, how much does a private booth cost at the hearty platter? Murd snorted. Better you not know. Tis not as if it'll be worth it. Is that a challenge? Waratra asked, leaning boldly forward across the table. The fat old man chuckled. Put those away. We're here for business, my ladies of the alleys. Business. Spill, Rava ordered flatly. I want all three of you to watch the slopes of Mount Waterdeep above and behind the palace and the streets immediately around for anyone suspicious who approaches the palace a little before, at, or after dusk tonight. Extra pay. And do what when this someone suspicious happens along? Report to me just as fast as you can without raising an alarm among all the guards and watch patrols. I'll be wandering around shopping and drinking and just happening to stroll past you from time to time. The three girls stared across the table at him until Mert growled, What? What have I asked that's so ill? Won't you do it? Oh, we'll do it all right, Rava said quickly. If you'll buy us all better clothes so we don't look like alley beggars and get moved along by the watch. Mert blinked. But before he could say anything, Drella added very quietly, We are not trying to take you, sir. These are pretty much our wardrobes, what we're wearing now. We know from trying to loiter in particular places in the city that these rags won't pass muster with the watch. Mert waved a dismissive hand. Fair enough, but you'll have to bathe. Elegant ladies don't. He waved his hand again. Stink like we stink? Waratra asked archly.